I left my house just as the Verge announcement commenced. I started my van up just as the female announcer said, Police, fire, and emergency medical services will be unavailable until tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. when the purge concludes. <laughs> I took a moment to laugh about that. Not all emergency medical services would be unavailable. Taking my Sig Sauer pistol out of my hip holster, I stuck it between my legs for easy access. Safety on, so there was no risk of shooting myself in the junk. As I pulled out of my driveway, I spotted one of my neighbors at his mailbox. I came to a stop next to him, rolling down the window and talking to him through the bars affixed to the outside of my door. Jacob, you better get your ass back inside. You know what time it is? Jacob, a grumpy old man who must have been pushing 90, sneered at me. <laughs> Any asshole wanna shoot me while I'm getting my mail? I welcome them. As he said this, he lifted his right hand out of the nasty brown robe he was always wearing, showing me a hand cannon of a revolver. Laughing, I put my hands up in surrender. Besides, Jacob said, you're the crazy son of a bitch is going out into the city tonight of all nights. You think you and your second-rate ambulance really make a difference out there? I don't think we do, I said. I know we do. Well, I hope you don't get your head blown off tonight. Good luck to you, Jamal. I'll be all right. It's an unspoken rule that you don't shoot the medics. Yeah. It is until it ain't, Jacob said, turning away and waving his mail at me dismissively. Stay inside, old man, I called after him, pulling away. He flipped me the bird, which got me laughing again. It took me a little over 10 minutes to get to Dylan's house, so it was about 7.15 by the time he got into the passenger seat of the van-turned-amateur ambulance. Sunset was around 6.45, so by the time I got to his place, it was full dark. Ready to do this? I said. Dylan looked at me sideways. Hell yeah, he said. Dylan had black hair cut close to the scalp and a big, bushy black beard. He had icy blue eyes and a big scar over his right eye. Plus, he was six foot four and about 225 pounds. The dude was intimidating as hell. So me asking him if he was ready was a kind of joke. I'm no slouch but I'm not nearly as intimidating as Dylan. If Dylan ever called and said he didn't want to go out on purge night, I'd probably stay home too. We were a team. We watched each other's backs. I pulled out of his neighborhood and headed toward downtown Phoenix, where the action usually started earlier in the night. As the night went on, the action would move out of the downtown area once everyone got tired of trying to break into the stores down there. By the time 3 a.m. rolled around, we'd be out in the suburbs more although we'd stick close to the central city and in Kanto village areas. You see anything going down as you drove to get me? Dylan asked. Not really, I said. Some people trying to break into a convenience store. I heard some gunshots, that's about it. As soon as I pulled onto I-10 to head downtown, I saw a roadblock in the middle of the wide freeway. There were 10 SUVs parked across the road and guys with skull masks and guns behind them. These guys again. Dylan said as I slowed down. Must have worked well last year, I said. You want to turn around? Nah, they should let us through. Plus, anything goes down? We both got our vests on. Dylan was right. We were both wearing bulletproof vests, and the van was armored. If we needed to, we could plow through. Two of the men with skull masks came around their SUVs as we approached, pointing their semi-automatic rifles at us. I pulled my Sig Sauer P320 pistol out from between my legs and held it at the ready, but out of sight. I flipped the safety off and rolled down the window. The f you think you're going? The guy said through his grinning skeleton mask. It was one of those that left the top half of the face uncovered, so I could see the guy's eyes under his hat brim. He didn't look happy. Downtown, I said. We're medics. See the big red cross on the van? Don't f with me, boy. The guy said, I could just kill you right here, right now. He brought his barrel up and pointed it between the bars at my face. Same, I said, raising my pistol so he could see that it was pointed at his neck. But I don't want to. I'd rather stay alive. So if one of your crew gets hit tonight, we can come help him out. Yeah? How would you do that? Here, Dylan said, holding up one of our cards. 
He rolled down his window and gave it to the guy on the side of the van, slipping it between the bars. Give us a call and we'll come running. That's what we do. The guy pointing his gun at me looked between the two of us, thinking. Finally, after several long seconds, he lowered his gun. All right, fine, he said. He turned and called to one of the guys behind the roadblock. Let them through. I nodded at him and then re-engaged the safety on my pistol and tucked it back between my legs. The SUV ahead moved out of the way and we drove slowly through. I hope that asshole calls tonight, all shot up, Dylan said. He'll have to wait and he'll keep waiting. Hey, that's bad for business, I said. We don't want to get that kind of reputation. We got a good thing going here. We'll have more work than we can handle tonight. I got a feeling. Yeah, maybe so, maybe so. I'll be happy with four or five good calls. If we get home safe after four good ones, I won't complain. Dylan grunted in agreement. I got off the 10 near the airport and headed east on Washington, each of us scanning our side of the road for purgers. Check it out, Dylan said as we were coming up on a dispensary. Muffled gunshots and the accompanying muzzle flashes erupted from inside the store. Here we go, I said, turning into the wide parking lot and stopping but leaving enough distance between us and the shop that I could drive away if needed. We stared out of the reinforced bulletproof windshield at the store. There was a lifted four-door Ford pickup truck idling outside. Sure enough, not a minute passed before three men came running out with backpacks that looked full to the brim. I knew that no dispensary would be stupid enough to leave cash in the store for the purge, but they surely had a lot of weed in there, or at least they did before those guys showed up. The pickup truck squealed out of the parking lot, passing us without incident. I pulled up quickly, taking the spot they just vacated. Dylan jumped out of the van, heading into the store to check it out. I could hear him calling out, Medic, anyone need help? Over and over again as he made his way to the smashed door. I kept my head on a swivel, checking my mirrors and monitoring the dispensary. Soon enough, Dylan ran out and signaled me inside. I jumped out, gun in hand, and opened the rear doors, reaching in to unlatch the gurney. I pulled the bed on wheels out and met Dylan at the door. He was carrying a middle-aged woman with a bullet hole in her upper chest. He plopped her down on the gurney, and we wheeled her to the back of the van, then pushed the bed inside. We both got inside, and I closed the back doors. Anyone else in there? I asked. Middle-aged male, shot several times in the abdomen. Well, at least we have one. I said. Dylan nodded as he started stabilizing the unconscious woman. I heard gunshots from outside. They weren't close, but I had to check them out. So I jumped up into the front seat and looked around. An SUV rolled past on Washington. A man with an AK-47 standing halfway out of the vehicle's moonroof fired randomly. I watched the SUV pass by, the man seemingly oblivious to our presence. But at the last moment, the man turned and looked right at our van. He banged on the roof and started yelling at the driver. Uh, we're about to have a problem, I said. You got this? Only if you don't drive like an asshole, Dylan said from the back. This takes precision. No s***, I said, putting the van in drive and heading out onto South 41st Street toward Madison. Behind us, the SUV turned around on Washington. I drove as fast as I could while trying not to shake the van. I took corners slowly, taking a right on Madison and then a left on 40th Street. I knew the SUV was following us, but I also knew the area. I pulled into a mostly vacant airport parking lot and stopped the van behind a semi-trailer parked there, hiding us from the road. How's it going back there? I said, watching for the flash of headlights that would tell me the SUV knew where we were. Me, I'm good, but this woman is dead, Dylan said in an emotionless voice. You can't save them all, I said. That got a rise out of Dylan. The SUV came into view, turning around at the intersection of Air Lane and 40th. They didn't know where we were. I smiled. Dylan and I waited until the SUV was long gone before we dumped the woman's body on the sidewalk next to 40th. The cleanup crews would find her in the morning. Where to next? I asked once we were back in the van. Before Dylan could answer, his cell phone chirped. He pulled it out of his pocket and answered it, speaking a few words, but mostly listening. After less than a minute, he took the phone away from his ear and ended the call. Guess who just called, he asked, 
that asshole from the barricade, I said. Where is he? Dylan told me, and I headed back up 40th, turning left back onto Washington and then getting on the freeway again. We drove out of Phoenix and into Tempe, pulling into the Arizona Mills parking lot near the movie theater. We immediately saw the signs of a massive fight. One SUV was flipped over on its hood. Smoke was coming out of the engine compartment. Another had smashed head on into a light bulb. Off in the distance, we saw a Jeep and an SUV tear around the far side of the mall. The SUV was chasing the Jeep. A masked man was hanging out one of the windows, firing a semi-auto rifle at the swerving Jeep. They bounced over a curb, rolling across the sidewalk and onto the road bordering the mall, heading away from us. Where do we start? I asked Dylan. The guy said his buddy's at the entrance to the movie theater. I nodded and directed the van that way. We spotted him pretty quick. He was lying against a light pole near an SUV riddled with bullet holes. Parking the van near the guy, I took a moment to look around. I saw no movement. No one else was around. Dylan and I jumped out of the van and approached the guy. His skull mask was askew, but I could tell by his clothes that it wasn't one of the two guys we'd talked to at the barricade. Not that it really mattered. The guy was still alive, but he'd been shot once in the leg and once in the lower right abdomen. He croaked the word help with half-slitted eyes, one hand weakly pressing on each wound. Where's the rest of your crew? I asked. Where's the guy that called us? The man shook his head and asked us to help him again. What do you think? I said to Dylan. My partner looked around, scanning the parking lot. Let's get him in the van, he said. We brought out the gurney, got the guy on it, and loaded him into the back of the van. I got in the driver's seat and kept my eyes peeled for trouble while Dylan worked in the back. Gunshots caught my attention, and I looked out the windshield to spot where they'd come from. A sedan rolled by on the street bordering the mall, a couple of kids whooping and hollering as they shot their pistols into the air. I shook my head. Teenagers. A sudden banging sound came from the back of the van, causing me to jump in my seat. At first, I thought it was Dylan doing something, but when I turned around to look, his wide eyes were staring back at me. I said, let me in. A man's voice called from outside the van. I want to see my brother. Where the hell did he come from? Dylan asked. I shrugged sheepishly. My attention had been fixed on the sedan and I'd let this guy come up on us from the back. I'll take care of it, I said, opening the door, pistol in hand. We're helping him just like we said. I called out before I could even see the guy. I'm coming back there. If you want to see him, I'll let you in. I stepped around the back of the van to see a man in a skull mask pointing a rifle at me. It was the same guy that had given me the barricade. You shoot me, my partner will let your brother die, I said. Let me see him. Is he gonna be okay? If you put your gun down, I'll open the back door for you so you can see him. After a moment of thinking, the man brought his gun down and nodded to me. Okay, I said, stepping around to the back doors. I banged on the door and told Dylan it was okay to open up. The back door swung out. The masked man opened the right door and I opened the left all the way so we could see inside. The man's eyes went wide at what he saw and he went to raise his gun up but I was ready. I put my sig to his head and pulled the trigger, aiming it so his brains wouldn't get all over the van. He crumpled to the ground, the gaping hole in the side of his head, leaking what little brains he had onto the asphalt. That was close, Dylan said. Nah, I know what I'm doing. Now if we hurry, we can harvest from this guy too. I gestured at the dead man on the ground. Inside the van, Dylan had the dead man's brother opened up and had been working on removing his liver. Dylan looked at the man he had opened up and then down at the guy I'd just shot. Okay, he said, but we need to load him up and take him elsewhere to harvest. I don't want to have someone sneak up on me again. I damn near ruined the liver when he banged on the door like that. Agreed, I said. So counting that guy's organs, provided they're all usable, how many more do we need tonight? Dylan thought for a second. I knew he was going over the space we had available in the van. We had plenty of space in the static cold storage lockers. Livers and kidneys could be kept for a long time in those. But for hearts and lungs, which spoiled faster even in cold storage, we had invested in a couple of perfusion systems. These systems stimulated the action of the human body by pumping nutrient-rich fluid and oxygen into the organ, keeping it viable until we handed them all off to our buyer at 6.30 a.m., half an hour before the end of the purge. We should be good with one more. Dylan said. I'll know more once I get that guy opened up. 
but we gotta work fast. Those organs are dying as we speak. I smiled as Dylan and I crouched to get the dead man off of the asphalt and into the van. It was going to be a productive purge. Then I had a thought that I'd had every year since Dylan and I had started our entrepreneurial enterprise. Too bad the purge is only once a year. Booming footsteps shook the ground like miniature earthquakes, growing more powerful as they approached. People were screaming and running all around me. The park was in chaos, but I couldn't help everyone. And the people I was trying to help weren't listening. Get out of the tunnel! I shouted for the fifth time. A couple of people nearby looked at me, the terror on their faces momentarily fading as they recognized my uniform. They seemed to realize that I knew what I was talking about, and they moved out of the tunnel quickly, taking their chances in the flow of running bodies down the avenue behind me. Move! Get out of the tunnel! You have to get out! I shouted again. Four more people heeded my advice, running out from the shade and into the bright sunlight. But there were still a good hundred people inside the concrete tunnel underneath a road that only employee vehicles used. I stepped back from the tunnel entrance and looked up to see the massive dread Nautis lumbering forward on its four legs, its head twisting around at the end of its long neck to look behind it. A pack of Maposaurus dinosaurs were chasing the large sauropod, clearly intent on taking the much larger creature down for lunch. The tunnel would never hold the massive dinosaur's weight, and it was getting closer. I had no idea how the security protocols and fail-safes had all failed, but there wasn't anything I could do about it anyway. I was a tour guide, and things like security protocols were above my pay grade. But as a park employee and a human being, I had an obligation to try to save as many of these people as I could. But they couldn't hear me, or they wouldn't. I screamed at the people hiding in the tunnel one more time and was happy to see that a group of about 10 heeded my call and ran out. I backed away, nearly getting knocked down by a man running past behind me. Then I stood there and watched as the skyscraper tall, 60-ton dreadnoughtus brought its elephant-like front legs down just above the tunnel, which collapsed under the weight of the massive creature, instantly killing those who had not escaped. The pack of five Maposaurus carnivores caught up to the huge herbivore as it tried to get its front legs out of the wreckage of the tunnel. The Maposauruses were similar to Tyrannosaurus rex dinosaurs, but significantly bigger, and some would say smarter, since they hunted in packs. Four of them began attacking the huge sauropod, taking car-sized chunks out of its neck and back with their powerful jaws. The fifth turned its attention off the raised and fenced-in roadway, looking down at the terrified people running around. I stared up at it as the dinosaur's eyes swept over me its cold intelligence startling me out of my shock. I turned to run in the general direction of the underground bunkers that had been built just in case any of the dinosaurs got loose in the park. These bunkers were a good mile away from where I was, on the other side of the large park. I heard a crunching sound and looked over my shoulder to see that the fifth Maposaurus had stepped down off the raised roadway, crushing a cotton candy cart with one foot. Andy, a voice called out. I whipped my head around and saw one of my coworkers, Robert, sitting on a wooden bench and holding his bloody left ankle. Bob, I said, helping him up from the bench. What happened? What do you think? He said, leaning on me so I could help him walk. I got attacked by a Utah Raptor. I had to resist the urge to stop right there in the middle of the walkway. Good God, those are loose too? Everything's loose, he said, or will be soon. I looked behind me and saw the Maposaurus chasing a woman down the path toward us. We need to move! Bob and I picked up the pace, but his injured ankle was slowing us down. Up ahead was the door to a burger restaurant. I figured we could make it in there and wait until the Maposaurus went past. The woman behind us screamed as she ran, and the dinosaur's feet made the ground shake as it ran after her. In here! I said, ducking away from Bob to open the door to the restaurant. The dinosaur was close, but I didn't dare look. I pulled the door open and stood aside to let Bob in, but it was too late. The Maposaurus lunged toward us. Bob tried to jump through the door, but the massive teeth caught hold of his arm. I reached out and grabbed Bob's other arm and found myself in a tug of war with a huge carnivorous dinosaur. My feet came off the ground as I held onto Bob's arm. He was screaming, looking down at me. 
Then the Maposaurus let go, and we both fell to the ground. The impact knocked my breath out, but I scrambled up, knowing it wasn't done with us. That was when I saw that the dinosaur hadn't dropped us. It had bitten through Bob's arm. His stump poured blood onto the concrete walkway. I sensed movement behind me and dove out of the way as the creature's huge jaws came down, crunching into Bob's body as it lifted him back into the air to finish the job. Screw seeking shelter in the burger joint, I needed to get to the bunkers. They were the only true safe place in the park now, so I ran as fast as I could get away as the Maposaurus chomped on my coworker. There were still people running in every direction, many of them looking for their loved ones. Still others were just trying to find the way out of the maze-like park. Even when there weren't bloodthirsty dinosaurs killing people, park guests had to consult a map to find the nearest bathroom, much less the main entrance and exit. Once the Maposaurus was out of sight behind me, I started gathering people to me, telling the ones that would listen that I was headed to the bunkers. By the time I'd gone a little over a quarter of a mile, I'd gathered seven people with me, four adults and three children. The main thoroughfare we were on was lined on either side with amusement park rides between gift shops, restaurants, arcades, and vendors of all types. All the rides were dinosaur themed, and some of them were even designed to go through certain of the more safe dinosaur habitats. But for the most part, these rides and shops were where people came after visiting the other side of the park, where the main dinosaur attractions were. So as we moved through the chaos, I prayed that the dinosaurs I'd seen so far were a fluke and that if the rest of them were loose, they would stay on the other side of the huge park. But soon enough, the rumbling vibrations I felt through my feet told me we weren't so lucky. I turned around and looked behind our group just in time to see a six-ton Triceratops galloping down the roadway toward us. I couldn't see what it was running from, but it didn't really matter. The beast was moving fast. Even as I watched, it trampled a young man who tripped, trying to get out of its way. Move! Go in there! I yelled, pointing into a nearby gift shop. My group shuffled into the shop as the Triceratops stomped past. It was running from something, I said to my group as I made my way through them, deeper into the store. Let's wait in here for a minute to see what- Don't come any closer, a man I'd never seen before said. He was standing behind a nearby teller counter, rummaging through the cash register with one hand. He had a knife in his other hand, pointing the tip of the blade at me. I put my hands up to show I wasn't a threat. We need to stay in here for a minute, I said. We won't interfere with you. I'm a park employee, sure, but some petty thievery is the least of my concerns. Petty? The man said, clearly scared and angry. You think I'm petty? No, that's not what- F*** you, he shouted. You charge $200 just to get into this place, then you overcharge for everything. I'm taking some of my money back from you rich bastards. Fine. I said, that's fine, just take it and go. I looked over to my left at the other side of the store. I thought I'd seen some movement from there. Another pair of open doors was over there, leading out onto a walkway parallel to the one we'd come in from. Maybe someone had ducked into the store from over there. If so, I couldn't see them now. The man momentarily returned his attention to the cash register, digging out for more money. I took the opportunity to signal my little group out of the store. I figured whatever had the Triceratops spooked would have already gone past by now, and this guy seemed a little unhinged. I saw him as the bigger immediate threat. They started moving back through the door, but this caught the man's attention. He snapped his head back and looked with wide, unfocused eyes at the group. What are you doing? He shouted. We're leaving, I said. You can stay here and do your thing, but we're leaving. You're going to get security, aren't you? He said coming around the counter toward me. I backed away from the knife right into a rack of t-shirts. He pressed the tip of the knife into the little divot at the base of my neck. I think security's a little busy right now, I said. This seemed only to make him angrier, and I felt the tip of the knife pierce my skin. Then one of the children in our group, a little girl, screamed. Movement flashed on my left, and both the robber and I turned to look just as the Utah Raptor pounced. The lightly feathered raptor slammed into the robber with its claws on his chest and its open jaw on his head. I stumbled back, knocking the shirt rack down in my shock, just as the Utah raptor used its powerful jaws to collapse the man's skull, the sound like a cracking walnut shell. My group ran out of the store, and I followed, sure that where there was one Utah raptor, there would be more. The one in the store looked to be a juvenile, only standing about six feet tall 
and probably weighing just under a thousand pounds. I reached up and felt my neck as we ran, but only found a little bit of blood. The knife hadn't cut me very badly. We ran hard toward the bunker entrance, picking up more people on the way. When we finally reached the entrance, there were two dozen of us. It was located amid the faculty buildings, and I figured many staff members were already inside. I swiped my employee keycard and entered the code. The metal door unlocked and swung open. I looked down the concrete steps and found them empty. Thinking it's safe, I held the door open, ushering everyone else inside to make sure there were no stragglers. When everyone was inside, I looked around and decided that I would recoup inside and then head back out to find more people. As soon as I stepped around the open door, screaming erupted from inside. I looked down the concrete steps, seeing three Utah Raptors tearing through many of the people I'd just saved. They used their teeth and claws to incapacitate them. Blood sprayed everywhere as I stood there, shocked. How had they gotten in? How long had they been down there? Was nowhere safe? A fourth Utah Raptor appeared and lunged over its companions toward the five uninjured people who were scrambling up the stairs. The Raptor was moving fast. The people would never make it. But if I left the door open, I would surely be killed and the Raptors would continue their killing spree. The people rushing up the stairs screamed at me as I swung the door shut. Their eyes didn't show anger, only shock and dismay at the betrayal. I shut the door just as the Raptor was leaping toward them, claws and teeth ready to grind flesh. I put in my code and listened as the door locked. The screams inside were muffled, but that didn't make them any easier to hear. Feeling sick to my stomach, I turned away from the door and came face to face with the Utah Raptor. It seemed to smile at me, showing its razor sharp teeth just before its jaws opened to crush my head. I'm a search and rescue operator. Last month, I responded to a distress signal originating from an uninhabited island. I discovered a journal whose contents are disturbing. Last month, my team responded to a SOS in the Southern Pacific. When we arrived, we were unable to locate any of the stricken individuals or indeed any evidence of their whereabouts. All I found was two curious items in a local cave system, a journal and an audio recorder, both of which were owned by a man named Albert Vess, an archeologist and one of the individuals who deployed the SOS. The contents of the journal are disturbing, but perhaps worse still is the audio recording. Since reading the journal and listening to the audio, I've been feeling strange, unwell. My mind feels like mush and my moods have been erratic. No medication has helped. My doctor thinks I just need some rest, but I'm not sure. It's just hard to describe. I don't know why, but I feel like the island has something to do with it. I feel like the journal does. I've transcribed it below in case anybody can help me better understand it, but be warned, it's an uncomfortable read. June 1st, 2021. The valley is steep. For an island in the middle of the Pacific, it feels almost unnatural, certainly uncommon. I've done plenty of these expeditions and I've rarely encountered geography such as this. The shoreline is sparse, thin. It gives way to a scatter of trees and a sharp drop off into a hollow of palms and brush. It's incredible, claustrophobic. It's where we're going, all four of us. Bernard, the research lead, Darian, the cave explorer, and Allison, one of the most accomplished archeologists I've ever met. And of course, myself. My stomach is still upside down, recovering from the sail it took to get here, but the worst is over. Once we finish our survey of the ruin below, we can set up camp and get some shut eye. It's not so bad, really, and we're so very close. This, I think, could be the discovery of a lifetime. The sun is setting in the sky. When we looked down into the valley this afternoon, we never anticipated it'd be this slow going or that the canopy of leaves would be this blinding. Allison recommends we make camp and get some rest. She says the ruins will be there to excavate in the morning and we'll be better off with more daylight to spare. Bernard disagrees. He says we've got lanterns and rations and that the scene survey won't take that long. Besides, he's not planning on doing any excavating until he knows the ruins are actually there. His remark catches us off guard. I remind him that there are already aerial photos of the site, that there's no need to prove it's actually there because we can see that it is. It takes Bernard a minute to answer. And when he does, he admits the aerial photos of the ruins were doctored. He admits 
that the research he submitted to secure this grant was false. The liar. All I have, he says, is what's written in here. He shows us a leather-bound book with yellowed pages. It belonged to his ancestor, apparently, a merchant captain who was shipwrecked on this island over a century ago. According to the journal, there really are ruins, but the thing is, they're underground. You'd never know they were there if you weren't looking for them, and it's why nobody's discovered them before. I can hardly believe it. I want to be furious at him, but Allison is angry enough for the both of us. She's fuming. Darian doesn't seem to mind terribly, maybe because it's her first expedition and she still has stars in her eyes. Trust me, Bernard says, this will be the discovery of our lives. I suppose we don't really have a choice. The boat that dropped us off won't be returning for another week, for better or worse. I and everybody else are stuck on this little spit of land. Allison heads into the trees to pee, and when she comes back, she's a nervous wreck. Her shoulders are quaking, her voice is uneven. I heard footsteps out there, she says. Footsteps and laughter out there in the jungle. I remind her that there's nobody out there, that this island is as empty as it's ever been. Then who's laughing at me, she snaps. The trees? The jungle ends in moonlight. It opens to a clearing, a dusty expanse of stone boulders and saplings. We made it to the bottom of the valley, to the site of the supposed underground ruins. Bernard tells us there should be an opening somewhere, a hole. It might be tiny, or it might be large enough to fall into if you aren't careful. The four of us split off, flashlights in tow. Allison in one direction, scowling, and Darian in another, beaming. She's young enough that I hope we really do find something. Otherwise, this might just sour her opinion on archeology span for good. Before I can step off, Bernard stops me. He asks me if I can hear that. Hear what? I ask. The laughter, he says. It's not 40 paces away that something catches my eye. It's small, difficult to make out in the dark, even with the light of my lantern and the moon above, but it's there. It's making my skin crawl. Between two squat boulders is a circle of small stones arranged in a spiral. They frame a recess into the earth that's filled with decaying wood, charred black by the heat of flames, a fire pit. I gaze at it, stunned. This island should be deserted. As my mind churns, I spot something sticking out of the dirt and the ash. It's broken, crumbling. It looks like mother nature has had its way with it, but it's unnatural enough to stick out to me. It isn't wood, it isn't stone, it's strange. I bend low, digging into the mess, hoping the debris above has managed to preserve what lay beneath. A moment later, and I know that it has. My hands pull something free, something that's decomposed into three pieces, something familiar, a fractured human skull. It's odd, but I stare at the skull for a long while. There's something about it that I can't quite put my finger on, but it's fascinating to me. I feel almost entranced by it. Before I can properly process my find, I hear screaming, shouting. I hear Bernard, Allison, and Darian all calling my name. They're shrieking for me into the night, telling me the good news. They have found the ruin. When I reach them, they surround a hole in the earth the size of a basketball. Bernard's lantern is sitting next to it. He's explaining in an excited tone how he nearly fell into the damn thing. He's explaining how he knew it would be here, about how he never once had any doubt. I'm trying to tell him, them, about the fire pit. I'm trying to tell them about the human skull split into three pieces. What does it matter? Darian asks. If somebody died here, that was probably a hundred years ago. She's already getting herself ready for her first big find. She's tying a length of rope to a nearby boulder to serve as an anchor point. Bernard strapping a headlamp to her helmet. Why it matters, I say, is that human skulls don't generally burn themselves on deserted islands. Why it matters is that whoever burned that skull was doing it very much on purpose, and there are very few reasons that would ever be okay. Bernard sides with Darian, but tells me that I'm probably right, that whoever burned that skull was up to no good. He tells me we can't do anything about it since it's ancient history. Before I can argue my point, Allison calls us over. She's on her belly at the entrance of the hole, with her flashlight angled down trying to get a look inside the ruin. She tells us she thinks she saw something move down there, Darian reasons that it's probably just water bouncing the light around, making shadows. She says she sees it all the time while exploring underground caves. I figure she's probably right about that. In a valley like this, it'll be a small miracle if these ruins aren't already flooded. Still, the skull looms in the back of my mind. It unnerves me. Darian rigs the rope to her carabiner and slips her legs into the hole. A moment later, 
and she shimmies the rest of her body through the opening until the white of her helmet disappears beneath the earth. As she lowers herself down into the ruins, Bernard asks her for details about what she's seeing. For the first while, she says it's just a long, tight drop, nothing to see, just stone pressing against her on all sides. Then she says it's opening up into a cavern. She says she's inside of them now, the ruins, or rather, a cave system. I don't see any ruins, she tells us. All I see are, her voice trails off. It sounds concerned. There's writing down here, she says. Lots of writing, all over the cave walls. It looks like it was scratched into the stone. Bernard looks ecstatic. He asks her what language it's in and whether or not she can read it. She responds by saying that yes, she can read it. It's English numerals, she says. There are numbers all over the cave. A pause, two breaths. Her voice echoes out of the dark hole. Are these dates? Nobody gets a chance to ask her about the dates or exactly how many there are because our attention is stolen. In the distance, from deep within the jungle, we hear the low sound of footsteps, heavy, desperate footsteps, footsteps that are coming our way. I call into the hole, ordering Darian to get out. I tell her something, somebody is coming. My heart is beating through my chest, my mind replaying images of the scorched skull. It feels insane, absurd. There's nobody on this island, we know that. We have the records, and yet, I feel that something is very wrong. Allison holds her only weapon, a brush whacking machete, and she's shrieking at Bernard, demanding whether he forgot to mention the existence of cannibal tribes on the island. Bernard's too shell-shocked to speak. I holler at him to help me heave on the rope, to bring Darian up faster. Thankfully, he does. It's exhausting, but we manage to pull her up to the top of the hole, just far enough to see the white of her helmet and her terrified features. She tells us that she's stuck, that she can't move any further. I hear the footfalls nearing, so close. Whatever's coming is running now, and the sound is like thunder in my ears. I watch as Bernard works at freeing Darian from the opening, and I realize it's taking too long, much too long. I drop the line and rush over to help, pressing my hands against Darian's shoulders. Then, all at once, the footfalls stop. They stop just outside the perimeter of the clearing. For a moment, the night is silent. None of us so much as steal a breath as we listen for whatever is out there, whatever is coming for us. Allison suggests that our shouting may have scared it off. It's a comforting thought that it might have been a large species of boar charging through the jungle or perhaps an earthquake. Bernard agrees. He adds that we're all running low on sleep and very on edge and that Allison was right. We should have just made camp and gotten some rest. Then Darian screams and her body slips, ribs snapping as she disappears back into the darkness of the room. A split second later, there's a grotesque cracking sound in the screaming stops. It's the sound of Darian's body striking the cavern floor. It is, I think, the sound of Darian dying. Something goes through us then. Allison, Bernard, myself. Something goes through us like a bullet, shutting us up as we wait, desperate to hear Darian call out and say she's okay, that she's just a little bruised up. I call out to her, desperate, horrified. Allison appears at my side and hushes me with a finger. She glares at me, narrowing her eyes at me like all of this. This entire disaster is somehow my fault. Then she lowers herself onto her hands and knees, machete by her side, ear toward the hole. She asks us if we can hear that. She tells us to listen. Bernard and I press ourselves closer to the opening. We strain our ears. There's a scraping sound coming from inside, a low, sustained sound, like something being slid across stone. There's something down there, Allison says. I knew there was something down there, and I told you, Bernard. I f***ing warned you. She erupts, plunging at Bernard like a maelstrom, scratching, punching, hurting him as much as she can. He curls up, but he doesn't try to fight back. He doesn't try to flee. He sits there, trembling, I think, because he hears the same thing that Allison and I do down there in the cavern. He hears the sound of Darian's body being dragged away. We put it to a vote. Out of the three of us, only Bernard wants to go back down into the hole looking for Darian. Only Bernard wants to face the nightmare he dragged us into. Allison and I, we have no idea what we're dealing with. Bernard's convinced that it's an animal. A family of bears, perhaps, that are using the cavern as a sort of den. There's no other alternative, he says. What I don't say is that there's always an alternative. In this case, the alternative is we're not alone on this island. In this case, the alternative is that whatever's out there doesn't want to be found. The hike back up to our base camp is long, and by the time we arrive, it's raining and half past noon. A wall of dark gray descends toward us from across the ocean. Storm clouds, lightning flashes on the horizon, followed by rolling cracks of thunder. The sea laps and churns. All any of us want to do is go to sleep, to rest, and process our grief over losing Darian. 
but we have work to do. Bernard fires up the HF amplifier and attempts to contact rescue services. Static greets him over the receiver. He tells us he doesn't think it's working. He tells us the radio is f***. Allison tries her hand at it, and thank God she does, because she gets the thing running again. Over the other end, like the voice of an angel, we hear the operator crackle out of the speaker. Everything all right out there, folks? No, we say in near-perfect unison. God, no. The conversation doesn't go as planned. According to the operator, it could be hours or even days before we're picked up. The storm front in our area is a bad one, they explain, and it's likely to impede any rescue efforts. Local authorities aren't keen on risking their lives for tourists. At the moment, they're attempting to contact military vessels nearby for a potential extraction, but we shouldn't count on that. Their advice? Hunker down, batten the hatches, stay safe, avoid becoming separated. What if there's somebody out there? Allison asks them. Trying to f***ing kill us? Didn't you say you had a machete? They ask. Feel free to use it. The night passes for me as a string of nightmares. I toss and turn for much of it. It's not clear why, but my stomach is in knots. I feel ill, nauseous, and unwell. I wonder if it's the rations I ate. Maybe Bernard didn't prepare them properly. Maybe they'd gone bad. It doesn't matter. My body and mind are exhausted enough that the pain in my stomach is an afterthought. I awake to silhouettes arguing, Allison and Bernard. My head feels like I just drank a bottle of whiskey and hit it with a hammer. My mouth is dry. I'm sweating and shivering at the same time. Do I have a fever? Pieces of their argument reach my ears. They're not far from me, but they sound so distant, so faint. Give me a break, Allison. Darian's a grown woman who made her own choices. You think we knew she'd slip? She didn't slip, you know damn well. I stumble from the tent and warm, tropical rain is pouring overhead. Wind whistles painfully in my ears. Allison and Bernard are standing beneath the awning nearby, looking at me, but their faces are a blur. I can't make out their expressions. What are you doing up? Allison asks. Eavesdropping? She's holding the machete, pointing it at me. Hands grab me by my arm, roughly. Go to sleep, Bernard orders. He guides me back into the tent, back into my sleeping bag. You're not well. Tomorrow the storm breaks and the rescue team should arrive. I mumble in response, but my words are slurred, barely there. It's okay, he says. Nothing about this is okay, I thought to myself. I spend the night in and out of sleep, my mind swimming. My body feels feverish, alternating between flashes of panting heat and frigid chills. My dreams are of Allison. In them, she's calling out to me, begging me for help. She's trapped inside a pit filled with snakes, covered head to toe in red and blue serpents. They're slithering about her, and I'm holding her machete and chopping at them, trying to save her. Please, she says, please. The next morning, my head is pounding. There's an awful pressure near my temples, like my brain is expanding outward and trying to split my skull in three. I need water, I need aspirin. Why is it so quiet? I open my eyes to an empty tent. Strangely, there's no sign of Allison or Bernard. It's just me and the remains of our HF radio. Red and blue wires lay strewn about the floor like electrical snakes. Its faceplate is split in two, the circuit board with it. What happened? Wandering outside, I find the storm is cleared. A sprinkle of rain is all that's left. Did the rescue team arrive already? Perhaps Allison and Bernard have taken them down to the ruins to search for Darian. I abandon the tent and take to the shoreline, calling out their names. It's a short while later that Bernard finds me, emerging from the jungle looking disheveled, manic. His eyes are wild, framed with heavy bags, and in his hand is Allison's machete. It's flecked in crimson. Can't find Allison. His voice is stuttering, moving too fast for his lips. She's gone. I tell him to slow down. My head is in rough shape, and it's difficult to follow what he's saying. Bernard, I ask, is there blood on that machete? He shakes his head. He tells me to go back to the tent, to lie down. He says he'll keep looking for her. He says she has to be around here somewhere. She has to. As he stalks off, I think I hear him mumble a prayer, but I'm so very tired. My dreams are once more of Allison, of Darian. This time, they're beckoning me to return to the ruin. They're weeping that Bernard has done this to us, that he's lost his mind. They're saying that he's trying to kill us off so that the discovery can be his and his alone. He pushed me into the hole, Darian whimpers. He drowned me on the beach, Allison cries. He's drugging you, they say in unison. Don't trust him, don't follow him. Go back to the ruins and you'll see the truth. Do it before he cuts you into little pieces and eats you, burns your skull and splits it in three. I open my eyes and Bernard is fast asleep. The machete is tucked securely in his arms. As quietly as I can, I leave the tent and make for the ruins. It's part way through the jungle that the footsteps sound behind me. 
They're pounding the dirt, moving through the brush like a hurricane. Is it Bernard? I can't tell. My head is aching and my body is exhausted. But despite it all, I press forward at a sprint. I press forward toward the valley below, toward the ruins. I hear laughter in the jungle, manic, maddening, laughter. It's following me, closing in. Whatever is happening on this island, I realize begins and ends with those ruins. I must reach them. It's a small relief to see the rope still anchored to the stone. I quickly toss Darian's line into the entrance of the cavern and squeeze myself through the opening. My palms burn, splitting open in warm blood as they halt my descent. Before I can make it to the bottom, something snaps from above and my rope gives way. I fall a short and painful distance, with the rest of my rope tumbling down around me. Looking up, I expect to see Bernard standing at the small moonlit entrance. Instead, it's just the empty sky. Bernard? I shout. There's no response. Flicking on my headlamp, I take a look around the cavern. The light reveals a tight cave structure, one splitting off into three separate tunnels. Carved into the walls, just like Darian said, are numerals, dates. What's odd though, what's borderline impossible, is the date the numerals list. October 20th, 1972. It's my birthday. It's everywhere. I'm alone down here. There's no sign of Darian. There's no sign of Bernard. The cavern is empty and feels endless. I've made small attempts to scout the three tunnels, but each presents its own share of impassable obstacles, whether growing too tight to traverse, dropping off into abysmal black water, or twisting steeply upward. I've chosen instead to remain beneath the entrance to the ruins. It is my hope I can shout and gain the attention of the rescue team when they arrive. Until then, I take this time to update my journal. I filled the entries of my flight from the tent, of my return to the ruins. I filled in other details as best I can while their memory is still fresh in my mind. Because even now I feel my stomach roll with hunger and my mouth thirsty for water. I feel myself slipping. These details may prove important to me at a later date. I just need to hang on and hope that somebody will come. But I'm so, so thirsty. Perhaps just a sip from the lake, only a taste, just to wet my lips. I am unwell. I feel broken, aching all over. I'm aching in my mind and it hurts so, so much. It hurts. There are sounds around me, sounds in the cave. I've recorded them to study later, but it is so difficult to think, so difficult to write. Are they talking to me? The sounds are so close. Close. They're surrounding me from every corner of the cavern now, and memories are playing in my head like videos or movies. Ah, I don't feel good. I feel really bad. I see. I see my hands pushing Darian into the hole, down into the ruins. Oh God, I see her eyes as she falls, looking at me. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Had to. The radio. It was just so loud, and the rescue team would come so fast that I had to call it off. I had to tell them we were just peachy, and that there was no need to rush because Darian showed up right as rain. Of course I needed to destroy the radio, snapped the faceplate on my knee. I had to. What if Allison called them back and told them I was fibbing? Allison, Allison, always with her machete. She never let the damn thing go. What the f was it? Her child? I needed to wait forever for her to step off into the jungle for a potty break, but when she did, I gutted her, cause she was gonna ruin it all. I swear, Scout's honor, she knew something was up with me. Bernard, oh Bernie, 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 you knew the journal was trouble. You knew it was no good. You brought us anyway because you wanted answers for the dreams you were having since you read the thing. But don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. People are so easy to strangle when they're sleeping. Oh Lord, the voices, the skull, it told me it needed them. It needed us all down here, and we were so close to being part of this beautiful place, but nobody wanted to come, and Darian didn't land on her feet, so now it's just me. It's just me. Soon though, it'll be me and you. That's it. That's the final entry. Note that for Albert's less lucid entries, I attempted to transcribe them as accurately as I could from his writing. The bizarre capitalizations, the sudden misspellings, all of it is authentic to his journal, if that helps at all. Without access to the remains of any of the individuals, it's difficult to say if Albert was simply losing his mind or really did end their lives. The part about him canceling the SOS signal, however, is accurate. Somebody sent out a call indicating that Darian had reunited with the group and was not seriously injured, and that rescue at the time was no longer needed. We arrived three days later after their transportation returned to recover them and found their tent cut into pieces, equipment destroyed, and no sign of any members of the expedition. At that point, a search team scoured the island. I was the one who located the cave system, entered it, 
and recovered Albert Vess's journal and audio recorder, though there was no trace of him, body or otherwise. Here are the audio files I mentioned earlier. One is a sample of the laughter, and the other is a sample of the voice in the cave. In addition, I visually cited the writing on the cavern walls. The weird thing is that it doesn't match up to what was recorded in Mr. Vess's journal. The numerals I saw were all different. The date they listed was not October 20th, 1972, but instead April 4th, 1991, my birthday. If you grew up during the 90s, it's pretty much guaranteed that you spent a significant time browsing the shelves at Blockbuster. It was the ultimate method of watching movies comfortably at home. All you had to do was just drive over to one of their thousands of locations, pick out a couple of movies and some snacks, and head home with a bag full of VHS tapes for a night of movies. But with the rise of the internet and the dozens of streaming services that arose in the last decade, it's no wonder that Blockbuster inevitably closed their doors, fading into the non-stopping tides of time itself. This often happens when big franchises close down. Blockbuster left behind several buildings not bothering to properly close them down. Instead, some of the shops were just abandoned, turning them into ideal places for urban explorers like myself. Researching and visiting old abandoned buildings was one of my favorite pastimes as I grew up. And though I wasn't particularly brave, I frequently visited locked down places, accompanied only by my best friend, Eric. Together, we visited abandoned asylums, hospitals, malls, houses, you name it. And though it had always been exciting and scary, We'd never been in any true danger. That was until last year, when we decided to visit a recently discovered blockbuster, situated in the middle of nowhere. The peculiar location actually made strategic sense when thinking about business. We lived in a small town where the vast majority of the population traveled to a bigger city, all using the same highway to get to and from work. So on the way home, plenty of people stopped by the blockbuster to find their entertainment for the evening. Sadly, the place was rendered obsolete, and due to road construction, the place had been pushed back away from civilization. It was perfect. We planned the adventure for a Saturday evening. A lot of these places, though seemingly abandoned, had security guards and cameras, which could leave us with hefty fines if we ignored the keep out signs. But as we arrived just before midnight, we knew for sure that no one had set foot in there in years. There were no fences blocking the building off, no lights, no power lines, no cameras. It was dead, just a building with a half decaying sign reading, Blockbuster. Told you it would be awesome, Eric said gleefully as we approached the place. He'd already scouted it out, but he hadn't set foot inside. That was a privilege he had saved for a time we could do it together. He had a knack for finding these places, as if he had some sort of sixth sense allowing him to sniff abandoned buildings out. The door was locked, but being mostly rotten and covered in glass, we could practically crawl through one of the holes to get inside. A rush of adrenaline surged through my body as I took my first step inside. The feeling of visiting a forgotten place so full of history is mesmerizing. That mixed with a feeling of heavy nostalgia from my own childhood made me almost emotional. Holy shit, I heard Eric call out as he walked ahead of me. What is it? I asked, but as I placed myself beside him, I immediately realized what had excited him so much. There were rows upon rows of shelves, and each and every one of them was stocked to the brink with old VHS tapes. The place hadn't been just abandoned, but everything inside had been left behind as well. In the back there were more shelves filled with snacks that had all expired years ago. And though everything was covered in a thick layer of dust, the items seemed weirdly well-preserved. I went from shelf to shelf, studying the movies, but it wasn't until I brushed the dust away before a disappointing realization hit me, that all the covers were blank. Of course, it could have been washed away by time, meaning the original pictures were just faded, but it didn't feel right. I took some of the VHS tapes out from their respective boxes to look for titles. This is weird, I said out loud. What is? Eric asked. I showed him the tape. Instead of a printed title displaying the name of the movie, all it had was a letter and a number, crudely handwritten onto the spine of the tape. D1024, it read. Should we check it out? Eric asked. How? There must be an old VHS player laying around here somewhere. I mean, they left everything else behind, right? He explained. Well, even if we found one, they cut power ages ago. Yeah, but we'll take it home with us. It's not like they'll miss it. So we went on a search for a VHS player. Though the blockbuster had clearly closed down before streaming services took over, 
Most of the shelves were marked with signs reading DVD player, but they were empty. My theory was that they'd taken the DVDs and modern products with them as they closed down, leaving the outdated equipment behind. Found one, I heard Eric yell from somewhere behind the counter. He'd found a door leading into one of the offices, which had a table, a television, and a VHS player already connected. The cables were all zip tied along their paths, making it hard to remove without a knife or scissors. You didn't bring anything sharp? I asked. No, but maybe a lighter would work. Just be careful not to melt the cable, I said. Don't worry, I got the- Before Eric could finish that sentence, a loud static buzz filled the room alongside a bright light emerging from the television. We stumbled back in shock, staring at the TV in disbelief. Despite the power being cut off, it had seemingly come to life all on its own. What did you do? I asked. Nothing, it just turned on. How was that even possible? As the adrenaline wore off, I tried to more logically assess the situation. I tried the various light switches, in addition to attempting to turn on anything in the vicinity, but apart from the player, nothing would come to life. It's probably connected to a separate circuit or something. I don't know, I know nothing about these things, Eric said. It's weird, kind of creepy. Still, now that we have a functioning player, should we check out some of the tapes? He asked. A part of me just wanted to turn around and leave the building. My lizard brain was on high alert, but logically, there couldn't be anything dangerous about an old TV. So I ignored my gut instinct and handed Eric one of the tapes. Here we go, he said, still excited. The static image faded ever so slightly, partially getting replaced by a blurry image. We were expecting some kind of logo, followed by a movie, but instead the silhouette just lingered there in the middle of the screen. We stared at it for a few moments, trying to figure out just what we were looking at. Is that a man? I asked. I think so, but he's just standing there, Eric said. No, look at his head, I said as I pointed out the mild rocking movement. He seemed to be shaking his head, each movement a tiny snap, too fast and jerky for any real human to reproduce, almost as if each move was breaking his neck. Then a picture appeared on screen. It only stayed there for a split second, immediately reverting back to the staticky man. Did you see that? Eric asked. Yeah, it's a picture of a room, I think. You saw it too? Sort of, I mean, I couldn't tell exactly what it was, but it somehow felt familiar. Then another picture flashed on my screen. Isn't that, I began. It's my bedroom, Eric said in shock. That time it lingered half a second, giving us a clear view. By the next time the screen flashed, we even noticed Eric himself sitting on the bed, getting ready for our trip. It was filmed this morning, but the film didn't end there. The image turned back to static, with the barely visible man hidden among the snow. He seemed to be just a bit closer then, still jerking his head in unnatural ways. Let's just leave, I suggest. No, I need to see this, Eric said, still in shock. Then another scene appeared on the screen, an empty road we both instantly recognized. It was the old turnoff that led to this place. A car came into view, with Eric driving it. The footage was taken from the street, as if someone had filmed it personally with shaky hands. But the area was rid of any plant life, completely flat. Had a person been standing there, we'd easily have seen them. Then a second of static with the man standing even closer, before the tape showed a view from inside the blockbuster looking out. We could see Eric park his car and look over the area as he waited for me. Oh, fuck. He's here, Eric said. We let the tape keep playing as we looked around the room. Once we ensured the building was empty, we retreated to the office and shut the door. The film we were met with froze us both in place. It was the two of us standing in the office, watching the tape real time, and the footage was taken from directly behind us. We spun around in fear, and I let out a relieved sigh when I realized there was nothing there. But as I turned to Eric, I noticed the look of utter horror plastered upon his face. He was staring straight ahead, as if transfixed by something. What's wrong? I asked. Don't, don't let him get me, he let out meekly. Who? But Eric never got a chance to respond as he suddenly threw his arms up in a defensive pose. Only a split second later, I could see large gashes appear on his forearms before his flesh was torn from bone. He fell to the ground and screamed in agony as more and more of his muscle, fat, and skin got stripped away. I stood frozen by his side, not able to see the invisible attacker. Then I did something I will regret to the day I die. 
I started to run. I opened the door, giving a final glimpse behind me to see the truth of what was happening. That would be the only time I got a glimpse of the monster, as a picture on the TV screen, a grotesque, massive creature hunched over, slashing at Eric with overly long arms looking more akin to knives than actual limbs. Even had I tried, there was nothing I could do to help him. I ran out from the store, got in my car and drove away as I called the police. But being distracted by the phone and adrenaline pumping through my veins, I swerved off the road and crashed into a ditch. As the airbag emerged and hit me in the face, the world just turned black around me. It wouldn't be until I heard the sirens that I awoke from my slumber. As the paramedics pulled me out of the car, I kept repeating Eric's name, telling them to help him. The police went to check out the location, but all they could find was an old, abandoned blockbuster with broken shelves rid of all merchandise. The office was little more than a dust-covered room with a plain table and nothing more. The tapes, the VHS player, it was all gone. Even Eric's body was missing, leaving no trace of his existence behind. I spent some time in a psychiatric institution after that. Eric was listed as missing, and I was put on the list of suspects for a while. But due to the lack of evidence, I was quickly cleared. No one believes what happened that day, but I saw it, and I saw hundreds of other tapes. Eric was just the first of many victims, with the rest just waiting to find their tapes. Maybe mine is hidden somewhere inside as well. Are you seeing this? Wilson asked as he pressed his headphones closer to his ears. We were sitting in the claustrophobic, damp sonar room searching for any signs of movement out in the deep oceans surrounding us. A blip had appeared on our sonar, notifying us of a rapidly moving object approaching from 15 nautical miles away. It was large, and based solely on its size alone, I doubted it could be a living organism. On the other hand, its speed was far too quick to be an enemy or allied submarine. Silence fell upon the rest of the crew as the mysterious object closed in on our location. We were working on identifying it, trying to figure out if it was worth waking our captain from his well-earned slumber. The audio signature doesn't match anything I've ever heard before. It's bizarre, Wilson said. Even though our hydrophones marked the very peak of military hardware, able to detect feeding shrimp off the bottom of the ocean miles away, they couldn't recognize this noise. Wilson sat frozen in his chair, desperately trying to put his three decades worth of experience to the test. But it was to no avail. And if Wilson couldn't figure it out, then no one could. It's getting closer, I mumbled before reading out the object's constantly changing location. How is this possible? It has to be another submarine, Russian, maybe Japanese, Wilson suggested. Better hope for the latter. We're not supposed to be in this region, I responded. Our executive officer, Henderson, had already assessed the situation and was worried enough to alert Captain Banks. We needed his permission to initiate stealth protocols, given that we hadn't the faintest idea what we were facing. Best case scenario, it was a system malfunction. Worst case, an enemy vessel. Even though full out combat was unlikely, our presence in hostile territory just might be enough to start an international incident. Something's not right here. It's too large, I repeated. Though the scans weren't always accurate, we estimated the object to be 300 meters in length, almost twice as long as our largest submarines. Can't be, Wilson insisted. Even the Typhoon-class vessels aren't that big. But its size wasn't what worried me the most, but rather the impossible depth and speed it traveled at. We were pushing the boundaries at almost 500 meters, but the detected object was moving at twice our depth and three times our cruising speed. If I didn't know better, I would have called it an impossible feat. The sound it produced was far too loud for a stealth vessel, but obscure enough to avoid automatic detection. It was akin to a whale's mating call, but produced a far deeper pitch, pulsating with a repeating rhythm. Paradoxically, the sound appeared natural, yet all too foreign. Only when I listened to it for a good 15 minutes did I realize that it looped. Almost like a song played on repeat, 
as if someone was sending a message desperate to be read. I don't like this, Wilson said. We need to leave. Though his impulse to escape resonated with the rest of us, it was a decision that could only be made by Captain Banks himself. But for such a decision to even be considered, we'd need the support of an executive officer. Our officer without authority still seemed unfazed by the approaching threat. I almost let out a sigh of relief as I felt the submarine decelerate. The engines fell silent and the lights dimmed. It was clear that we'd been ordered to stop, if only to remain undetectable from whatever was heading our way. Captain Banks entered the sonar room shortly after, taking the XO to the side to get briefed on the situation. Due to the uncertain nature of the situation, the captain had decided to stay put as we waited for the object to pass beneath us. Regardless of what exactly it was, we couldn't afford to take any risk, and at the depth it was traveling, we should have been in the clear. All the while, I kept calling out the object's position, trying to hide the fear building up within me. 2,000 meters, I called out. The thing was moving closer, ascending from the depths as it approached us. As it got closer, the same bizarre rhythm increased in intensity. 1,500, I continued. The thing was moving faster than any underwater vessel known to man, surpassing the quickest animals on the planet despite its terrifying size. 1,000. While it had moved to shallower waters, it was still a couple of hundred meters below us. There was still hope, albeit with a dangerously narrow margin. 500. That's when I noticed its speed changing. To our collective horror, it started slowing down, still moving at impressive speeds, but seemingly affected by our presence. 300. Whatever we were about to face, it knew where we were. 200. Pearls of sweat formed on my forehead. In a few seconds, it would be straight under us. The captain ordered all personnel to report to their designated stations and to prepare for a possible battle. 100. Then it halted directly beneath us, just a hundred meters deeper than our position. The crew fell silent and the audio we'd picked up suddenly ceased. If not for our sonar readings confirming its location, it might as well not have existed. A minute passed as we waited for something to happen. I wondered if a preemptive attack might have been our best shot at survival, but short of dropping a ton of mines on the thing, we had few means with which to fight something more than twice our size. Then I wondered what it looked like, but even with cameras on the underbelly of our vessel, there wouldn't have been enough light to penetrate the darkness at our current depth. We were essentially blind, except for a dot on our radar showing little more than the size of our stalker. Five uncontrollable minutes passed, which felt like an eternity. And there was nothing we could do except to wait for something, anything to happen. Then, as abruptly as silence had fallen upon us, it was shattered with an ungodly shriek originating from directly below us. With the ungodly sound, we also detected sudden, rapid movement, shooting up towards us at impossible speeds. Brace for impact! Captain Banks let out, far too late for anyone to get to safety. Loud alarms howled through our ship as it violently shook from the impact. Those not firmly locked to their seats were flung around like clothes inside a dryer. With that single crash, half a dozen men had their backs and necks broken. We detected another horrific shriek, breaking its prior rhythm with constantly lowering pitch. With it, loud clunks resonated through the room. A pressure wave shot through our sector, popping our ears as it passed. Home breach in the control room! Wilson yelled. Before rushing to repair the damage, we attempted to reach the crew further back via radio. But with power intermittently cutting out and possible fatalities, we had no way of assessing the situation. In a state of shock, I could do little but wait for orders and pray that my training kicked in. But orders would not come, as the captain was lying unconscious in a corner. Captain! Wilson called as he rushed to his aid. Just from his awkward position, we could tell that the captain had died on impact. Without Banks in charge, the role fell to the executive officer. Wilson, Peterson, with me to the control room. Henderson commanded with as much confidence as he could muster. 
The control room was on the same floor, a bit further back on the submarine. The door was kept closed, but luckily it hadn't been locked due to the crash. Wilson entered first, letting me follow behind him. Henderson came in last only to assess the damage before taking control of the rest of the ship. While calling for backup was essential, stabilizing the vessel was our main priority before making a swift escape to the surface. Before us lay five crewmen, dead in three feet of water. Several beams shot into the room at high pressures, leaving us with limited time to seal them off. Still, if we were able to at least patch the damage up, the control room would be left semi-functional. We stepped over our dead friends, hurrying to fix the damage. Only then did my training kick in, allowing us to quickly stop the heavy flow of water. Peterson, you hearing this? Wilson asked once the last drop of water had entered the ship. I readied my ears, and just beneath the howling alarm, we could hear the faint sound of metal settling under pressure. Since we hadn't yet reached critical depths, I could only assume that whatever had attacked us was holding on in an attempt to crush us. How is it doing that? I asked, not really expecting a response. I don't know, but we better not stick around for an answer. Wilson shot back as he tried to get the comms working. Hello, do you copy? He asked as the radio came to life in a static mess. This is leading petty officer Ian Wilson, reporting from the control room. Please respond. He was trying to contact the crew at the torpedo room, but none responded. Either they had perished during the first attack, or the station had flooded beyond the point of usefulness. Either way, with a monstrosity outside trying to crush the sub, we had to fight back with any means possible. We rushed back to the sonar room where Henderson had gathered the remaining survivors. He had shared our train of thought and had sent a team to assess and repair any damage done to the torpedo tubes. What remained in the rest of the submarine was a skeleton crew ready to fix any hull breaches. As long as the creature is latched onto us, we can't launch any torpedoes without risking irreparable damage to the submarine, Wilson argued. Do you have any other suggestions? Either we fight back or this monstrosity pulls us down to the abyss, Henderson said. Do we even know what the thing is or what it looks like? I asked while simultaneously trying to come up with an escape plan. We got some photos, can't tell you much, except for the fact that it's biological, Henderson explained. Good, Wilson chimed in. That means it can bleed. Wait a minute, what if we don't arm the torpedoes? I suggested. The impact might be enough to hurt the bastard. Probably won't kill it, but might force it to let go. Given that it's hanging directly onto our torpedo ports, Henderson said. It's the only chance we have. He nodded in agreement telling us to personally relay the information to the attack crew in lieu of functioning comms. Wilson already stood ready by the ladder, prepared to dive down into the bowels of our submarine and fight whatever threat we faced. Help isn't coming, Henderson explained, which means we have the luxury of firing at will without being questioned by high command. With that, we headed downstairs towards the torpedo bay. The bow was filled with water that went waist high. Half a dozen bodies littered the way. Most had been killed by the creature's first impact, while others had been pinned to the floor under various pieces of debris, forced to drown in a few feet of water with no help in sight. A handful of crewmen had gathered by the torpedoes. They'd already sealed any leaks, but the water pumps would need more attention before being functional. Still, the torpedo tubes were above water, remaining operational. Disarm the torpedoes, I ordered. Disarm them? We want to kill the bastard, one of them responded. The torpedoes shoot out at 100 knots. While it won't kill the creature, it might cause it to let go instead of killing us all in the process, I explained. The men glanced at each other, relieved that their suicide mission had turned to one with a faint glimmer of hope. They redirected their attention back at me, nodded in agreement, before proceeding to disarm the torpedoes it would only take a minute, rendering them little more than metal chunks to be shot at a creature strong enough to crush us underneath its own weight. It was a futile plan, but the only one we had. We rapidly loaded up the six functioning torpedo tubes and prepared to fire. We just had to pray that some of them would hit the attacker at a reasonable speed, hopefully hard enough to make it let go. Fire! Wilson demanded with a raised hand. As demanded, 
the torpedo operators initiated a barrage of non-explosive warheads. From the six loaded, only four word to life, launching their content out into the dark ocean before us. Most seemed to miss the mark, floating harmlessly into the open waters. But a couple hit, each causing the monstrosity to slip slightly off the submarine, letting out agonized yells. It worked! Wilson let out. Again! At unparalleled speeds, the crew mounted the torpedo tubes once more, even doing most of the work manually. It was an impressive sight. Wilson ordered another barrage, this time only loading up the functional tubes. Four torpedoes were shot at the creature. It winced in pain, finally letting go of our submarine. It shook as we fell free from its grasp, but we weren't yet free from danger. We had to deter the monster from attacking for a second time, but that time with proper firepower. Prepare to fire live torpedoes, Wilson ordered. Another barrage of four torpedoes were loaded, that time filled with actual explosives. I called Henderson over the radio to ask for exact locations, praying that the comms were back up and running. With our own computers barely functional, we had to rely on our fresh captain's instructions for a successful hit. LOD James Peterson here. We've armed the torpedoes. We need the thing's exact location to get a hit. Do you copy? It's retreating into the deep, 50 meters directly below our position. Fire at will. Henderson said on the other end. I relayed the instructions, and Wilson gave permission to fire the load. A few seconds passed between the torpedoes leaving the tubes before we had two confirmed impacts only noticed by shockwaves reverberating through the ship. It had been a successful attack, and our ship was finally free of the monster's grasp. The crew let out a few tired cheers, relieved to be alive, but horrified by the loss of so many crewmen. Exhausted, we took the majority of the crew back to Henderson, who'd moved his team further back to the control room. But what greeted us were not relieved faces, but ones filled with utter panic People were scrambling around, desperately trying to fix damage I couldn't see. The nuclear reactor is severely damaged, Henderson said meekly. If we don't fix it, we're going to suffer a meltdown within the next few hours. With the nuclear reactor located in the dead center of the submarine, we had several access points. But with the reactor suffering a meltdown, we couldn't safely enter from any of them. Running the backup engine would keep the submarine running, but it wouldn't buy us enough time to return to shore for emergency repairs. We would have to deal with it ourselves or risk the agonizing death of every man on board. Under normal circumstances, its thick walls protected the crew from catastrophic radiation poisoning. But during a meltdown, the released radiation would reach one quarter of that measured after the incident at the Fukushima power plant. How much time do we have? I asked. Two hours, maybe less, Henderson said. So, we fixed the damn thing, Wilson suggested. His statement froze us in place for a moment. It was the most reasonable solution, but it came at catastrophic sacrifice for the poor bastard who took the task upon himself. Whoever goes inside the reactor is going to die. You do realize this, Henderson asked. And if no one goes, we all die. I'll do it then, Henderson said his face pale as a sheet. No, you won't. This ship needs a captain. You're not allowed to sacrifice yourself. Besides, I'm probably the only sucker left on this boat alive that has actually dealt with nuclear reactors up close, Wilson explained. There were no words needed. We all knew Wilson had provided the only plausible solution. Like the Marine he was, he was willing to give his life if it meant the rest of us could live. Either way, if nothing was done, we'd be killed by radiation or by the monstrosity from the depths returning for seconds. I escorted Wilson towards the nuclear reactor, ready to do whatever I could as he attempted to repair the damage. There were radiation shields aboard the sub, but they do little to negate the massive dosage of radiation Wilson would absorb as soon as he entered the reactor. It doesn't have to be you, I argued as we got close, knowing full well that no one else could repair the damage before we suffered a total meltdown. He ignored me and got suited up for the mission. While it wouldn't save him, it might buy him a few extra minutes to work on the reactor. I ain't got nothing to say. I'm just doing my duty. No family to say goodbye to. 
Nothing back on the mainland waiting for me. This was always where I'd end up, kid. Just let me do this one thing. Without further hesitation, Wilson entered the reactor room. I stood outside, watching him through cameras placed on the inside. They were meant to give a safe view of the reactor to determine the damage before entering. But most of the time, the disruption wasn't visible to the naked eye. Yet, Wilson headed straight for the problem and set to work. It would take about 10 minutes for the symptoms to set in, at which point death would follow shortly after. Just the act of opening the door had exposed me to an unhealthy dose of radiation, but the sickness I'd experience would pass within days, while Wilson would decay within the next couple of hours. Not a single word was spoken as I watched Wilson slowly die. I just stared as he worked, listening to the shrieking creature preparing for its next attack. It was a race against time, one Wilson would lose, but in the act, we might stand a chance. 20 minutes passed, at which point Wilson's hands were visibly shaking. Our crew had shot out a few more torpedoes, but they were running out, at which point the creature would certainly attack again. Then without speaking a word, Wilson took a step back from the reactor to observe it. He stood there for a few seconds, making sure the thing was working before collapsing on the ground. The systems were stabilizing, a fact noticed by Henderson, who gave the order to start an emergency ascent. I wanted nothing more than to rush to Wilson's aid and drag him out of the reactor room, but even had I gotten him out, he was already a dead man. Alas, my sorrow would be interrupted by another violent shake of the submarine, undoubtedly caused by our last torpedo. Alarms sounded throughout the vessel once more, calling each crew member to their station for our ascent. Without pause, I rushed to the control room, where I found Henderson and his team scrambling to reach the surface. We're getting the hell out of here, he said as he saw me. Get to your station. In the state our vessel was in, the rapid ascent might just have killed every single crewman on board. Still, it was a risk we had to take with the monster still chasing us. With no torpedoes left, we had to rely on speed we didn't have and pray we could outmaneuver the thing. 400 meters, one of the men called out. It's getting closer, another yelled. 300. The hole creaked from the rapidly dropping pressure, causing my ears to pop once more. 200. Something hit the submarine, causing another hole breach. It's here. Keep going, Anderson ordered. It hadn't been able to grab a hold of us, but the damage it caused with each hit was catastrophic. 100. The rapid change in pressure wasn't only harmful to us, but it affected the creature as well. It let out a horrific, soul-shattering yell of agony, still crashing into the submarine. It ripped another hole in the hull, causing the turbines to flood. If we didn't reach the surface immediately, we'd sink back to the abyss. Then I saw sunlight, just a few rays shining in from some of the newly formed holes in the hull. We closed off the damaged sections as best we could, hoping to remain buoyant until help could arrive. The creature let out one final shriek, but never surfaced alongside us. The damage it had sustained was too much, causing it to flee back to the depths. With the realization that we'd made it up alive, a few of us ventured up to the top side to inspect the true extent of the damage. Long holes had been torn along the sides with massive gray teeth left behind around the torpedo tubes. It dawned on me then that we'd been stuck in the jaw of the ancient being. It had tried to consume us, biting down on the hard metal. The torpedoes had been just enough to rip through the beast's flesh, tearing its teeth out. I do not know what attacked us on that day, nor am I planning a return to the ocean anytime in the future. Our submarine was quickly decommissioned following the attack, with false claims that it had failed its sea trials, a cover-up claiming no crew was lost that day. So, I'm here to share the story in respect of those who were lost and out of respect to Wilson, one of many heroes who perished at sea. Hey everyone, if you enjoy these stories, be sure to check out the Dr. No Sleep podcast by clicking the Spotify link in the description below. There you will find more nightmarish horror stories not yet featured on my channel. For iPhone users, just search Dr. No Sleep in the search bar on Apple Podcasts. Now back to the story. 
we entered the hospital, I looked around and saw several families with young children in the waiting area. A few of them glanced my way and the light caught their eyes, revealing Iris's tainted a crimson hue. They glowed red like old photos that hadn't developed quite right. There were so many children experiencing the same symptoms as my daughter, Juliana, and yet I hadn't seen anything on the local news. Still, word was beginning to spread around town that there was a contagion going around, only amongst the children, at least for now. The triage nurse looked us up and down, scribbling something on a piece of paper. I handed her the necessary identification, including my Proteon company ID badge, then took a step back and waited for her questions. Symptoms? Red eyes, poorly timed laughter, odd statements. No suspicious cravings? I gulped down a dry lump in my throat, thinking about what my daughter had said that morning at the breakfast table. Nope, I lied. The nurse gave me a hard, cold stare for a few moments, then scribbled something and continued her questions. And how long has this been going on for? Just today. The red eye started about 20 minutes ago. That's when I brought her here. Okay, have her put on this wristband and wait over there to be called in. Don't touch anything. It shouldn't be long. My daughter snapped the band onto her wrist and it made an electric chiming sound. Two green lights lit up on either side, next to the Proteon Company logo, the mega corporation which ran the high-tech corporate town where we lived. When I first took the job in Pleasant Hills, I thought it was an idyllic, perfect place to raise a family. When the recruiter told me about the salary and benefits, I nearly jumped for joy. But now, I was coming to realize that this quaint little town was not entirely perfect. There was something spreading amongst the population, something unlike anything I'd seen or heard of before. The two of us sat down in the waiting room and my daughter began to eye the toys and books in the corner. Without asking, she stood up and wandered over to the table piled high with reading material. Juliana, I called out, but she didn't stop. A woman sitting near the book stood up quickly and moved away as if someone with leprosy were approaching. I felt a pang of anger, but realized I couldn't blame her. None of us knew what we were dealing with yet. My daughter picked up a colorful kid's book and began to leaf through the pages, scanning the print quickly with her red eyes darting back and forth. She seemed to realize the woman next to her was staring and turned her head to glare at her. Then she made a loud hissing sound like a territorial street cat. She snapped her teeth and lunged at the woman, and I jumped up and pulled her back. Juliana, no, what are you doing? She went back to looking at the book as the woman ran out of the waiting room, screaming. She's got it too. I looked over to see a man with his daughter and son. The three of them were dressed as if coming from church, but there was something wrong in his children's expressions, something unsettling. They were staring at me with wide, vacant grins. Their eyes were glazed over and their teeth looked too sharp, as if being drawn out by some invisible force being stretched into fangs. The changes were subtle, but noticeable. Yes, just today I began to see the changes. Lord help us. How long have your children? Winters, Juliana. A woman's voice called from the door to the ER interrupting our conversation. Winters, Juliana? I stood up quickly and grabbed her hand. She brought the book with her. I'm sorry, she grabbed it before I could stop her, I said to the nurse, gesturing at the book. The woman looked unconcerned. Keep it. She was wearing a respirator mask, gloves, goggles, and a bright blue full body protective suit as she led us into a room. A sign on the door read, negative pressure room. Should I be wearing a mask? I asked her as she left. Probably, but you'd be exposed by now anyway. The doctor will be with you shortly. Exposed to what? I yelled. The door sealed shut with a hiss and a bang. The woman stood outside for a few moments, taking off her gear, 
but made no effort to communicate with us or answer my question. A huge window at the front of the room allowed us a view into the ER, and we watched as she disappeared into the crowds of nurses, doctors, and patients. The two of us were left in eerie silence. Juliana opened the book again and sat down cross-legged on the floor. Part of me wanted to tell her to get off the ground, since who knew what had happened in there. But she looked so innocent for those few moments, I couldn't bring myself to do it. She looked like herself again, like a normal kid, except for the red eyes glowing as she glanced up at me. The PA came on suddenly. A woman's frantic voice began to speak. Code crimson in effect, code crimson in effect. All security personnel to the emergency waiting area now. The message repeated two more times. Then the speaker cut out again. What's a code crimson, daddy? Juliana asked, looking up from her book. Is it a fire? I don't think so, honey. I think this is something different. Just keep reading your story. A shrill scream came from outside the room, and I looked out through the large window into the ER. For a few seconds, there was nothing. My heart pounded dully in my ears, and I could feel it in my throat as I gulped down a dry lump. A woman in pale green scrubs raced past, blood shooting from a fresh wound on her arm, spraying the wall red as she ran by. She was screaming and looking over her shoulder, sprinting like her life depended on it. Gunfire could be heard from down the hall, in the waiting area where we had just been. Get down! I yelled at Juliana, running over to her. Someone's shooting! I ran over to my daughter and pulled her behind a chair which was up against the wall. The two of us hid behind it, and I heard people running past outside, but was too afraid to look. The gunfire was constant now and getting closer. I could hear things breaking outside the room from stray bullets and just hoped one wouldn't find its way to us. Daddy, I'm hungry, Juliana said quietly. Not now, honey, please. How could she be thinking of food at a time like this? I wondered to myself. More gunshots rang out, sounding very close now. I ventured a glance out from behind the chair we were using as cover. Through the glass, I saw men in black body armor with machine guns in their hands. They were firing rapidly and backing up, moving away from the waiting area. Security enforcement officer was written on each of their uniforms with their name beneath that. I recoiled in surprise as something leapt through the air like a wild animal, tackling one of the security guards and sending him flying backwards, his gun firing as he fell. His repeated screams were heard muffled through the door a few seconds later. It was the children with red eyes. Dozens of them from the waiting room were now rampaging throughout the ER, chasing nurses and doctors, running around on all fours like animals. A few people were on the ground, and the children appeared to be feeding on them, ripping out their throats and feasting on their bloody flesh. The power suddenly shut off with a dull click, and the ER was cast into total darkness for several long moments. I'm so hungry, Daddy, Juliana said from behind me moving closer. The emergency lighting switched on and everything was cast in a dim glow from above. I spun around to see my daughter moving towards me, a hungry look in her eyes. She was smiling like a hungry piranha and I could see her teeth growing insidiously longer, drawing into needle sharp points. What are you doing, Juliana? Stop, don't get any closer. I felt as if I shouldn't let her know how scared I was. If she could sense my fear, I worried she would lunge at me like a wild animal. Something slammed into the glass behind me, and I spun around to see a teenage boy smashing his forehead repeatedly against the window, his eyes ablazing, burning red. The glass began to spiderweb and slowly crack from its center, and I heard it crunching and breaking from each impact as he bashed his skull against the window again and again. I was so caught up in the sight of it that I almost missed the reflection of my daughter lunging at me from behind. But I saw it at the last second and ducked out of the way, surprised at my own quick instincts. The glass shattered as she crashed into it and went flying through, landing hard against the boy on the other side. Something was wrong with them, something very, very wrong, and my fight or flight instinct suddenly took over. More specifically, my flight instinct. 
I leapt through the broken window, broken glass piercing my palms, and began to run back towards the waiting room. When I looked back, I saw my daughter and the teenage boy were scrambling to their feet, racing towards me on all fours like jungle cats, their eyes blazing red. The horrible sight of them chasing me distracted me from my route, and I found myself slipping in fresh blood, sliding, and wrenching my back as I fell in the middle of the sticky red puddle. I hit the ground hard and bit my tongue, tasting coppery blood a second later. Stay down! Someone screamed behind them and began to fire. Thankfully, I saw they weren't shooting bullets. Small syringes full of green fluid impacted nearby, missing them. But a few found their targets, and the two of them turned around, racing back towards their attacker. Their movements weren't even slowed by the heavy dose of tranquilizer. The man screamed as the two of them took him down, tearing off his black body armor and feeding on his flesh a second later. He screamed in pain and yelled at me to run. After a moment's hesitation, I began to sprint back towards the entrance where we'd come in. A pair of sliding steel doors separating the waiting area from the ER. I raced towards them and began to hammer my fists against them, screaming to be let out. Looking up to my left, I saw a security camera pointed at me. I haven't been bit! I screamed, thinking for some reason that might be important. Maybe I'd just seen one too many zombie movies. Please, let me out! Maybe that was the right thing to say, because the doors opened and I burst through them a second later. Two security guards in heavy armor were on the other side. They were closing the door as I looked back through and saw my daughter racing towards us, blood smeared around her mouth like strawberry jam. Then the steel doors slammed shut. My daughter's in there! I screamed. We've gotta help her! Something impacted the steel door on the other side, deforming the metal and bending it into the shape of a child's skull. It's us you should be worried about! The security guard said. I looked around and saw the hospital was being sealed. Thick steel shutters were closing slowly, blocking out the sun, casting the waiting room into semi-darkness. Gold crimson lockdown protocols in effect, a robotic voice said from overhead. Shelter in place and do not approach the infected. Do not attempt to reason with the infected or to speak with them. Do not make eye contact. Assistance is on the way. Do not panic. Another loud bang came from the steel door separating the waiting room from the ER, and I saw a gap was forming, big enough to see through. And I peered through, looking familiar, except for the color of it, crimson like a sunset. Peekaboo, Daddy, my daughter said, giggling. (laughs) I see you. The feeling of the knife piercing my skin and scraping against the bottom of my rib cage was a symphony of sickening pain. The man who was trying to kill me leaned down, pressing his forearm deeper into my neck, choking me. My left arm was stuck behind my back. I was lying on it. The man's knee was digging into my right hand, keeping it pinned to the ground. His minty breath held undertones of a sour stomach smell. I realized he was chewing gum as the hilt of his knife pressed up against my skin, the blade sending waves of pain through my body as he wiggled it around, doing untold damage to my insides with the blade. How does it feel, baby? He said to me, smiling. I turned my head away and looked over at my wife, who lay face down on our living room floor, another man on top of her, working at pulling off her pajama bottoms without taking his weight off her back. I wanted to feel rage at that moment as my wife stared back at me, the look on her face one I'd never seen before. It was one of immense sadness, of disappointment, but mostly it was a look of fear. I wanted to experience a surge of adrenaline that would give me superhuman strength. I wanted to be a man from one of those action movies who, despite his wounds, jumps up and dispatches the criminals with ruthless efficiency. I wanted to make my wife proud, but I couldn't. The energy was already draining from me, along with the blood pouring out from around the knife blade embedded in my left side. I looked beyond my wife to Seth, our nine-year-old son. He stood in the dining room entryway, looking with large, uncomprehending eyes at his parents, pressed against the floor by two strange men. A third man stood behind Seth, 
his hands placed on my son's shoulders, smiling down at the scene before him. None of the men wore masks. I was lucid enough to know what that meant for my wife and me. I just prayed they would leave my son alone. He didn't deserve this. We didn't deserve this. None of us did. The two assaulting me and my wife were white, whereas the one holding my shocked son still was Hispanic. All three of them looked to be in their 20s. They all wore dark winter coats and jeans that were tucked into their boots. Jennifer, my wife, had warned me, but I hadn't listened. She'd come home hours earlier, around 5.40 that evening, scared out of her wits. I'd seen it on her face when she came into the living room, where Seth and I were watching a nature documentary. What's wrong? I asked. What happened? She dumped her purse down just inside the living room threshold and marched to the front window, parting the curtains. They're out there, she said. They followed me home. Ooh, I said, getting up from the couch. These men, they were in the Whole Foods on 9th, three of them. They must have been drunk or something, I don't know. What happened? Jennifer took a deep breath and stepped away from the window. They were wandering around inside the store, throwing stuff around, harassing people, and just being a general nuisance. I tried to keep my distance, but I wasn't about to let them keep me from shopping. So when I was getting some strawberries, they came up to me and started saying disgusting things, lewd remarks. Jenny's face twisted up into a sneer at the memory. After I don't know how long of this, I couldn't take it anymore, she continued. I yelled at them, I just lost it. I can't even remember what I called them now, but it wasn't nice. I felt a fury ignite in my veins. The same fury that men around the world surely experience when someone harasses their woman. I wanted to turn back time, to change the past, to be there in the store with her when this happened. Anyway, Jenny said, a couple of Whole Foods employees came up and escorted these three guys out. They didn't go easily. I thought for a moment they were going to start a fight with the employees, but they didn't. Instead, they kept calling out to me, threatening me. Then they were gone. I thought it was over. But when I came out of the store, I noticed a dirty black Mustang sitting there one row over. I couldn't see in the windows, but something about the car just told me it was them. So I loaded up quickly and came home. But they followed me, David. They followed me here. I stepped up to the window and parted the shades, looking out to the dark street. There was a black Mustang idling at the curb across the street. Driven by that fury still rolling inside me, I rushed to the entryway closet and groped around inside until I found the baseball bat we kept there. I ran out the front door of the house, hearing, but not really hearing Jenny's protests. The cold January evening enveloped me, but the rage kept me warm as I stormed across our small front yard, gripping the baseball bat in one white knuckled hand. I wasn't sure whether I would knock on the window and tell the men to get out or just go straight to bashing their car. It probably would have been the former, but I never had a chance. The black Mustang roared off down the street before I could reach it to do anything. I stood in the road, watching the taillights fade off in the distance and then disappear from view as the vehicle turned right on Pollard Avenue. I headed back inside, feeling good that I'd scared them off. I made sure to lock the front door behind me. We had dinner and put Seth to bed, but I could tell that Jenny was still worried. Maybe we should call the police, she said to me as we were getting ready for bed. They wouldn't do anything, I said. They'd just tell us to call if they came back. When it came to matters of the police, Jenny usually took my word as bond. Over my years as a journalist, I'd come to know police operations pretty well. Well, she said, maybe we can stay at a hotel tonight. Just pack a few things and go. Jenny, I said looking at her over my toothbrush, newly adorned with toothpaste. I have the alarm set. All the doors and windows are locked. We'll be fine. I just, I have a bad feeling. You're scared. It was a scary thing, that's normal. But you're safe now. We're safe now. The words replayed through my mind as I lay on my living room floor with a gum-chewing murderer on top of me, my blood soaking the carpet beneath me. 
They had come just after midnight, and they had knocked, or at least one of them had. While I stood at the front door in my robe, asking who it was and what they wanted, one of them was at the back door. I only knew this when they broke one of the small square window panes and opened the back door, causing the alarm to beep for a code. I swiped up the baseball bat from next to the front door and ran to the back of the house, but I wasn't careful. I was stupid. One of them was just inside the doorway to the kitchen, pressed up against the wall, waiting for me. He took advantage of my momentum, sticking a foot out as I went by. I didn't fall, but I stumbled forward, which gave him enough time to come up behind me and press a knife blade to my throat. The Hispanic man came in through the back door and rushed off into the house, smiling as he passed me. He had a large knife of his own. I heard him open the front door, letting the third man into the house. Put the code in, the man with a knife to my throat said, pointing me at the alarm keypad by the back door. No, I said. He snickered. If you ain't, I'm gonna hurt you if you don't do it. My friends just went up to find your hot ass bitch wife. She'll get God if you don't put the f- code in. And if you put in any distress code bullshit, you'll all die when we hear the sirens. You got any kids? Judging by the groceries your bitch wife bought, I bet you do. You want your kids to die too? I put in the code. I wish I hadn't. I wish I had let the alarm go off. It would have sped up the process. It would have turned a torture murder session into just murder. Better yet, I wish I had called the police right when they started knocking at the door. I knew who it was, and I knew it was trouble, but I thought I could handle it. I was wrong. The man forced me to the living room and held me there while the other two men brought Jenny and Seth down from upstairs. I tried to make a move, but the man holding me brought the knife down and sliced a deep groove in my right pectoral. He hit me in the side of the head, and I went down hard on the carpet, landing on my back, my left arm under me. Jenny screamed, which got her a hit in the head from her captor. She fell to the floor, face down. Seth cried out, but the Hispanic man slapped a hand over his mouth. The world went fuzzy with pain for a few long moments, but it came back into sharp focus as the man pierced the skin under my rib cage with his knife. You should really get yourself a gun, the gum-chewing murderer said as he pulled the knife out of my side. Baseball bats only work on punks. I turned my head to see that the man on top of my wife had managed to get her pajama bottoms and underwear off. Her eyes were wrenched shut. Nobody talks to me like you did, the man on top of her said. This is what you get, you uppity Beyond this terrible sight, the Hispanic man led Seth out of the room, saying, You don't want to see this, little man. Time to go to sleep. I wrenched my right hand back as hard as I could, trying to free it from under my captor's knee. It moved, shifting the ball of his knee from the back of my palm to the back of my fingers. I bucked, trying to throw him off of me, and then yanked my right hand again, pulling it free. I swung it up in a clumsy punch, which landed just under the gum chewer's jaw. It wasn't much, but it was enough to knock him off balance, which allowed me some movement. I pulled my left arm out from under me, but it was near useless thanks to the lack of circulation. Taking another shot, I punched for the middle of the man's throat, but missed the mark, causing my fist to glance off his neck. He went back again and I sat up, moving as fast as I could to stand up. The guy was faster. He swung his knife down and stabbed me just above my left collarbone. He pulled the knife out and hit me with a hard left, knocking me back down again. You good, Mason? I heard the man on my wife ask. I'm good. Mason, the gum chewer, said. He's done. Let's get started on the That name hung in my mind as consciousness seeped away from me like blood from a gaping wound. Mason. His name is Mason, I thought. And that darkness was all. I awoke in a hospital room, dull winter sunshine streaming through the window. Jenny, I said to the empty room as understanding came to me. Seth? My heart was suddenly racing the last waking memories running through my head. The machine next to me started beeping, adding an auditory facet to my delirium, causing my heart to beat even faster. Jenny, I called. Seth? I threw aside the hospital bed covers and moved to get out, pausing as pain in my head, my left side, and my upper chest screamed at me to stop. The door to my room opened, and a nurse rushed in. 
It's okay, Mr. Vance, she said. You're okay now. Please, lie back down. You've been in surgery, but you're okay now. Where are they? I screamed at her. Where are my wife and son? I... I don't know, Mr. Vance. I don't know. You'll have to talk to the police when they come back. They should be here soon. Until then, I need you to lie back and try to relax. I gritted my teeth as the nurse guided me back down onto the bed with a firm hand. She was an older woman, streaks of gray in her fading brown hair. Is Seth okay? I said softly. The nurse just shook her head and shrugged her shoulders. Oh God, they killed him. I said, crying. (laughs) They killed him. I descended into a place deep inside, going so far down that I didn't even notice when the nurse left. It was a place surrounded by the scenes that, to me, had only happened moments before. It was a place no man should ever have to go. A dark, swirling, chaotic place full of fear, regret, and hate. So much hate. But like a man freezing to death feels warm just before he dies, I found solace in that dark place. And I knew I couldn't survive without its relative protection. I only came back to the surface when the police showed up to tell me what I already knew. Those men had killed my wife and son. They'd left me for dead. Is there anything you can tell us about these guys other than their descriptions? One of the detectives, a short, stocky man with curly hair asked. Did you hear a name by chance? No, I said. His name is Mason, I thought. I didn't hear any names. That wasn't the first time the police came to talk to me. The same two homicide detectives came back again when I was in the physical therapy portion of my recovery. They asked the same questions and got the same answers. The thing about going to that deep, dark place inside is that it's full of misery, but it's also a place of freedom in a sense. The freedom from the bounds of morality. If you stay in that place long enough, you start to forget what morality even is and I never left that place. I stayed there throughout the weeks of recovery, through the funeral arrangements, the meetings with lawyers, and the excruciating experience of coming home for the first time since the murders. I couldn't stay in the house, it was too much. So I got an extended stay suite and got to work on my plan to find Mason and his pals. My editor, Jerry Fans, was surprised to see me when I came in on a Tuesday, four weeks after the assault. David, he said, standing up from his desk as I walked into his office. What are you doing here? I sent you two emails, Jerry, I said, requesting information about those three stories I did last year. I didn't get a response, so here I am. Well, Jerry said defensively, I just didn't think that was the kind of stuff you should be focusing on right now. What do you want them for anyway? I've been thinking about them, Jerry. It's giving me something to do. I always wanted to do a follow-up. You remember that. Besides, they're my stories, my notes. I just need access to the archives. All right, you got it. If you think it'll help, it's no problem. I do think it will help, Jerry, I said. Fine, good. I'll send you a link now. Take whatever you want. Thank you, I said and stood there waiting while Jerry sat down at his computer and sent me the link in an email. I verified the access on my phone and then walked out of his office without another word. The notes I was looking for were from a three-part series about supposed paranormal happenings surrounding a strange cult in the city. It wasn't the first time I'd cover things of that nature. In fact, in recent years, there had been an uptick in unexplainable phenomena involving people that had direct and peripheral ties to the cult. I covered crime and, when the stories came up, things like exorcisms, hauntings, and other supernatural happenings. Most of them had reasonable explanations, but not all of them. On my way out of the building, I scanned the notes, picking out the names and factoids that I needed. With that done, it was time to find Mason. Given my connections in the police department, The combination of the black Mustang, the name, and the fact that the guy likely had a record, I didn't think it would be a problem. And it wasn't. But finding out where he lived 
was only the beginning of my plan. Let's go out tonight, Mason. Have some fun, Petey said. I'm so f- bored. No, I said. How many times do I have to tell you? We gotta lay low for a while. Come on, man, Gabriel said. It's been two months already. If the guy had anything on us, we would be in jail by now. Too f- bad, I said. We're not doing anything illegal until things cool down some more. Besides selling dope, Petey muttered. The f*** you say? Nothing. Yeah, that's what I thought. Selling dope is different. It's how we put food on the table. It's what keeps us in this nice house, I said, gesturing around at the living room. I was lounging in a recliner while Petey and Gabriel were sitting on the leather couch. The big screen TV was turned to some movie channel, the volume on low. Well, that's what we're saying, Mason, Gabriel said. Food is important. But so is getting some snatch. I'm about to go crazy if I don't get me some. Besides, Petey said, you're the one that didn't make sure the guy was dead. Well, how about this? I said, how about I take my connect and do my own thing, leaving you to find your own supply of dope to sell. Damn, man, we're just bored is all, Petey said. No need to get all crazy on us. I'm so sick of your I said, that's all you been doing lately. You sound like f***ing women. Neither man had anything to say about that, but I was still fuming. Go get me a beer, Gabriel, I said. Gabriel scoffed, but got up off the couch and headed to the kitchen. In preparation for the beer, I took the piece of gum out of my mouth and put it in the ashtray on the table next to my recliner. A crash sounded from the kitchen. What the f*** you doing in there? Petey called, laughing. You fall down? There was no answer aside from a grunt. After a moment, a soft scuffling noise came to my ears. I looked over at Petey, seeing immediately that he was thinking the same thing I was. We both got up quickly, moving hesitantly toward the hallway leading to the kitchen. Wait, I whispered to Petey. Grab your gun. He nodded and headed over to his bedroom just off the living room while I tracked back to the table next to my chair swiping my knife up. We reconvened in the hallway and made our way down it quietly. We stopped at the closed kitchen door and listened. The scuffling sound that had been so loud earlier was fading away. Someone exhaled on the other side of the door and then there was nothing. I held three fingers up. Petey nodded. I dropped one finger, then another, and then the last. We burst through the door to find Gabriel sprawled on the floor in the kitchen. His neck sliced open so wide, his head was barely attached to his body. A pool of blood crept out along the linoleum floor around my friend's body. A man stood a few feet away from Petey, knife in hand. He wore a long sleeve plaid shirt buttoned up to his neck. His dark jeans had blood stains at the knees from where he'd been kneeling, working to kill Gabriel. He raised his head and looked at us as we came in. Petey fired, hitting the man high in his chest. He dropped the knife in his hand and went down to his knees putting one hand up to the bullet hole. Holy sh! it's you, I said. You really thought you could come in here and kill us all? You mother Petey yelled, stepping up to the man and jabbing the pistol against his head. You killed Gabriel. Wait, I said, trying to calm Petey down. Just wait a minute. Don't you recognize this Petey looked up at me. I know who the he is and I don't care. He killed Gabe. This is the guy whose wife thought she could put us in our place. This is the guy who thought he could threaten us with a baseball bat. So f***ing what? Petey said. So what? So what? This is the one that got away, my friend. And here he is, like a bird set free, only to come back, looking for something he'll never find. So we're going to take our time with this f- for Gabriel. I stepped around to Gabriel, avoiding the blood, and knelt next to the man, noticing that his lips were moving. I could barely hear the whispered words, and what I heard didn't sound like English. You think praying is gonna help you now? I asked, smiling. The man jerked out at me, growling. I shot my right hand out, hitting him with the butt of the knife. Then I shoved him to the floor on his back. Well, this is familiar, isn't it? I said, straddling him, putting my knees on his hands and my left hand to his neck. He glared up at me, his eyes shining with something I couldn't quite place. 
I don't know how you survived the last time, but you sure as f won't this time, I said, pressing the point of my knife to a spot under his ribs. This is where I did it last time, right? I asked, looking down at the knife, poking into his plaid shirt. Let's see how you do the second time around. I plunged the knife up under his ribs, reveling in the pain I was causing and the convulsing that shook his body. I moved the knife around inside him a little, smiling as he grunted in agony. What the f man? Edie said from behind me. He's smiling. I brought my eyes up from the knife to look at the man's face. Sure enough, he was smiling. He was looking me right in the eyes and smiling, and his lips were still moving. I pulled the knife out and then plunged it in again at a spot a few inches to the left, still looking at his face as I did it. The man was still smiling, still whispering. I squeezed his throat with my left hand, willing him to show me pain and fear, but he still smiled. Before I knew what he was doing, Petey stepped around, pointed his pistol down at the guy's head and pulled the trigger. So close to my head, the sound was deafening. The cartridge ejected and bounced off the cabinet, hitting me in the arm. What the f man? I shouted up at him, my ears ringing. He wouldn't stop smiling, Petey said, looking down at the still smiling dead man. I don't like that. Well, now we have his brains to clean up in a f bullet hole in the floor. Yeah, Petey said. Sorry. I got up and grabbed a stained kitchen towel, then placed it over his face. I wasn't about to admit it, but I was relieved that Petey killed the man. The towel now hiding his face, I went through his pockets, finding nothing but car keys. He hadn't even come with a gun, just a knife, a knife to kill all three of us. I shook my head. Let's get this cleaned up, I said. It's gonna be a long night. Luckily, our neighbors know how to mind their own business. We got the guy and Gabriel into large black trash bags, one down over the head and another coming up to meet it from the feet. We duct taped the trash bags together, using nearly half a roll to ensure that blood didn't leak out of the bags. Then Petey and I moved the bodies out to the backyard, setting them next to the house until we could get rid of them properly. We headed back inside to clean up the considerable amount of blood left behind by the two men. Ah, what the hell, man? I said to Petey as we walked inside. You walked through the guy's blood? No, I didn't, Petey said, stepping through the back door. Well, it sure as hell wasn't me, I said, gesturing at the puddle of blood left by the man I'd killed. There were bloody footsteps leading away from it, back toward the living room. Do I look like I'm barefoot to you? Petey said. He was wearing his boots, and the footprints had been made by someone with bare feet. Maybe the guy had a friend with him? I said, whispering now. Get your gun out and follow the footprints. I'll go the other way through the dining room and meet you at the stairs. Petey was staring at the footprints on the floor, not moving. Hey, I said, hitting him in the arm. You hear me? Yeah, yeah, he said, pulling out his pistol. I picked up my knife from the floor and wiped the blood off it with a paper towel. Then I headed out of the kitchen and into the dark dining room, moving slowly. We never used the dining room for eating or for much of anything but storage. There were boxes stacked against the walls, an old punching bag that Petey had bought but never set up, and a number of other odds and ends that were put there and forgotten about. It was dark in the room, the only light coming from the kitchen behind me. I decided not to turn on the light, knowing that it would give me away to whoever was in the house. As I was about halfway through the dining room, something moved in the darkness opposite me. I turned my head quickly, seeing the dark silhouette of a giant spider racing toward me. I cried out and slashed at it, my blade touching nothing but air. One of the thing's legs struck out at me, throwing me two feet back into the wall. I fell down to my knees and scrambled toward the doorway to the entryway, where Petey was supposed to meet me. I rounded the corner and saw Petey's feet near the stairs. Where is he? Petey asked, looking down at me. Did he attack you? In there? I gasped. It's in there. Petey leveled his gun and stepped over to the doorway, then pivoted into the room. After a moment, he turned on the light. There's nothing here, man. I'll check the kitchen. No, I said, standing up. I still had the knife in my right hand. It wasn't a person, I said. It was a spider or something. A spider? Are you kidding me? Get it together, Mason. You check upstairs. 
I'll check the kitchen. Petey walked over into the living room and headed toward the kitchen. I stood at the foot of the stairs, convincing myself that my imagination was to blame for the spider, even though I could still feel the pain from the hit. I started up the stairs toward the dark second floor, moving slowly. A large and deformed figure with shiny black skin scurried across the top of the stairs and out of sight. I froze. What the f is going on here? I whispered, backing down the stairs. Moving through the living room, I rushed down the hallway toward the kitchen, opening the door to see Petey standing just inside the doorway, his back to me. His arms and head were slumped forward, as if he'd fallen asleep standing up. The puddles of blood on the kitchen floor were still there, but now there were footprints tracked all around the kitchen. Many of them were human prints, but there were also hoof prints, paw prints, and some strange triangular prints that I didn't recognize. Petey, I said. Petey's head came up slightly and he turned around. His eyes were pure white and his lips had been cut through the cheeks, giving him a terrifying <laughs> bloody grin. I cried out as he stepped toward me, bringing my knife up and stabbing him in the chest three times in quick succession. Petey shouted and suddenly his face was normal again. What the f He said, looking down at the shallow wounds in his chest. He brought his gun up and I knew he meant to shoot me with it. So I stepped in close and jammed the knife into his throat with my right hand, grabbing his gun with my left. I pulled the blade out. Blood spewed out of the wound and onto my shirt. Petey looked at me with wide eyes, betrayal written all over his face. He stumbled and fell, adding his own blood to the mess on the kitchen floor. Sensing movement behind me, I dropped the knife and transferred Petey's gun to my right hand. I spun around and saw a man standing behind me, the same man Petey had shot in the head barely 15 minutes earlier. He smiled at me, not a wound visible on him. His shirt was intact and he wasn't bleeding where I'd stabbed him. I raised the gun and fired at him, blinking my eyes at the shot. In the split second it took me to blink, the man had disappeared. No, I said, you're dead. I just saw you die. Laughter echoed through the house, sending chills up my spine. I turned around and ran for the back door tripping over Petey's body and falling into the puddle of Gabriel's drying blood. I scrambled up and outside. Sure enough, both tightly wrapped bodies were there where we'd set them. But I still had to see, I had to. So I ripped open the black plastic bag over the smaller body's face, revealing the dead man whose wife thought she could f with us and get away with it. He was still there, still dead, and still smiling, although his eyes were closed but the plaid shirt collar had come down past his collarbone, revealing the top of a strange tattoo. My brows furrowed at the strange symbols. He didn't seem like the type, so I ripped down the length of the bag, tearing the duct tape around his abdomen and waist. I unfastened the top few buttons of his shirt, revealing black tattoos covering his upper chest. I ripped his shirt, popping the rest of the buttons off. His whole abdomen was covered with black tattoos of strange symbols, pictures, and words. They all looked fresh too, no more than a couple of weeks old. The strangest ones were around the two stab wounds I'd inflicted. There was a large black oval tattooed under the man's ribs there, running at a diagonal from just below his solar plexus down to his side. The inside of the oval was blank, aside from the two stab wounds. The outside had a bunch of tiny symbols etched around the border. It was like he'd either had the first stab wound commemorated with the tattoos, or he'd known that I was going to stab him there again, just like I did the first time in his house. What the f I said, standing up from his body. I looked around the yard, sensing that something wasn't right, but seeing nothing out of the ordinary. When I turned back around, the man's body was gone, the empty trash bags lying there next to Gabriel's body. Sucking in a breath, I spun around to run back inside and came face to face with the man. His cold hands grabbed my shirt and pulled me close to his smiling face and his still closed eyes. I fought to get away, pushing and hitting him, but he was as immovable as a statue. When our faces were only inches apart, his eyelids shot open, a sickly light spilling out of the sockets. I screamed at what I saw there because I saw myself. I tried to look away, but I couldn't. The images pulled me in until I felt like my very essence was being robbed, ripped from me, raped and abused. And the longer I watched the images shooting out of the dead man's eyes, the more I realized that they weren't just images. They were real, 
and they were happening to me. My limbs were broken and chopped off, but I couldn't experience the relief of losing consciousness. I couldn't go into shock and die. I couldn't escape the pain and the fear. Tiny knife blades were shoved into my eyes again and again while my skin was torn off in strips, salt, and acid poured into the wounds. My genitals were ripped off my body by massive black hounds, only to reappear and have it done all over again. When one form of torture stopped, another one started. The only breaks were to allow me to experience some fleeting relief, to get my hopes up, only to have them dashed again. And the whole time, through everything, the smiling man was there with me. He was snapping my limbs, stabbing my eyes, and commanding the dogs to attack. And he was laughing the whole time, somehow laughing without moving his lips. He would laugh while he reminded me why I was here and why I would experience nothing but pain for eternity. He reminded me as if I could ever forget. And somewhere in the back of my mind, I knew this man figured out how to bring me to a place I'd never believed in. He managed to drag me to hell and there was no escape. We weren't supposed to take the boat out after dark, and we really weren't supposed to take the boat out joyriding after sundown with a cooler full of beer. It's a shame that Jody and I didn't follow the rules. If we hadn't gone out last night, a lot of people would still be alive, myself included. I don't have a lot of time to post this, I can already hear them trying to get in the door. If anybody receives this, if anyone believes me, share my story. Don't let this die with me. This all started when Jody spotted that damned black box floating on the ocean. Move the spotlight a little to port, Jim. Jody called out. I think I see something in the water. Jody was leaning over the side of our little speedboat. Well, it was technically the oil rig's speedboat used mainly for scouting sites. But that night, we were taking it for a spin off the clock. I sighed, plopped my half-finished beer into a cup holder, and complied with Jody's request. The spotlight skipped across the black water. It was a calm, clear night, all stars and barely any waves. Before the light caught up to where Jody was pointing, I noticed what must have caught his eye. There was a small red flash. Then the area was illuminated and I saw the box. It was an orange container, a little larger than a cinder block. Jody began hunting around our small boat for one of the fishing nets. He found one and stretched it out to snag the box as we passed by. He set the object on the deck and I came over for a closer look. Flight recorder do not open was written on the side of the box in big white letters. Under that was a series of symbols I didn't recognize. They were like hieroglyphics, more pictures than words, but appeared to be nonsense. A row of unreadable scratches and lines, and under that, a phone number. Do you think there's a reward? Jody asked. We tried to pilot the boat back into the dock at the rig quietly. It didn't matter. Sawyer was waiting for us. Before he could start chewing us out and assigning extra night watches as punishment for borrowing company property, Jody held up our find. Sawyer stopped mid-rant. It looks like a black box, you know, like from a plane, he said. But it's not black, it's orange, I pointed out. Yeah, they're orange so you can find them floating, dumbass, Sawyer said. The black box part is, uh, figurative and whatnot. There's a phone number, Jody cut in. Do you think there's a reward? After some debate, the three of us decided to wake up Patrick. Pat was a former Navy guy, a burly, quiet fellow who never talked about his service, but gave all of us the impression he'd seen some crazy shit. Sawyer and I went to grab Patrick, while Jody guarded the box. I shouldn't have left him alone, but I didn't realize how dangerous the situation was at the time. Like Jody, I had visions of big government reward checks bouncing around my mind. I should have known better. Sawyer and I snuck into the crew quarters, moving carefully past rows of bunks with sleeping drillers and rig support staff. I shook Pat awake gently, but he shot up so fast that, for a moment, I thought he was about to hit me. Before that could happen, he seemed to recognize me and calm down. Please don't startle me like that, he asked in a way that made it clear he wasn't making a request. For a second, I was terrified of Patrick. 
I could imagine all of the rumors about him serving in the special forces as being completely true. Then his big goofy grin split his beard and I relaxed. It was just Pat. We have something to show you, Sawyer whispered. Come with us. Jody had moved the box to one of the storage rooms. The four of us huddled around a small table surrounded by cleaning supplies while Patrick looked over the flight recorder. As he read the writing on the box and the strange symbols, something changed in his face. His usual friendly smile dried up like a lake in a drought. He had a weird look in his eyes and his whole complexion seemed to almost shrink. He was terrified. Where did you find this? Pat whispered. He ran one shaking hand over the indecipherable markings. Do you have any idea what this is? Jody grinned. Our winning lottery ticket, that's what it is. This is something top secret, isn't it? More than top secret, Pat said, slumping back into his chair. I've, I've heard rumors but didn't think it was real. Those markings, there, it's better not even to talk about it. Did you find this in the ocean? Yeah, I said, trying not to catch Pat's panic. Floating about half a mile from the rig, Pat pushed the box towards me. You should ride back out and throw this into the sea. Get it far away from all of us and hope they're not able to track it. Who would be tracking it? Sawyer asked. Pat just shook his head. Jody was fidgeting in his seat. I recognized that behavior from him. There was something Jody wasn't telling us. Hear that, Jody? I asked. Pat advises we dump the box. If you get the boat ready to... I already called the number, Jody said. I'm sorry, I just, well... I didn't see any harm. I thought we'd all get a reward. I thought... Jody looked around the table. Sawyer and I shared a glance. Patrick looked like somebody just told him he had cancer. What did they say when you called? Pat asked. That they're on their way. Patrick stood up without a word and walked out of the room. Jody pulled the flight recorder close. Maybe things will work out, Sawyer said. With nothing else to do but wait, we all left the storage room. I wandered back to the crew quarters and slipped into my bunk. I woke up to the wild screech of our alarms. Every siren on the rig seemed to be going off at once, a wailing hurricane of shrill whistles and bells. Somebody threw open the door to the crew quarters. The lights came on, then immediately died. They were replaced with the red glow of our emergency backup system. What's going on? A voice shouted. Another raised voice asked, is there a fire? A new word swept through the room like a fever. Pirates. People were getting dressed, bumping into one another. The whole room calm, but walking that tight rope right above an animal panic. I was pulling on my boots when I heard the first gunshot. The soft pop caused the entire room to freeze. It sounded like it was coming from above us, probably from the deck. I held my breath in the silence that followed. It didn't last long. Muffled gunshots began going off rapidly. I don't have any military experience, but years of action movies and video games led me to guess somebody was firing an automatic weapon with a silencer. That was enough to send a few people into a panic. First one, then a handful, then a dozen members of the crew ran out of our quarters, knocking over bunks and coworkers in their flight. Most of the folks around me stayed calm though. Patrick was standing on his bunk, trying to direct everyone towards the exits without starting a stampede. I heard that pop, pop, pop noise again, but louder, closer. Patrick went flying from his bed like he'd been slapped by an invisible hand. More crew fell around me. That's when the panic finally took hold and we ran, me included. A great herd of terrified men and women were trying desperately to get out of that red room. I managed to squeeze through one of the exits just as I felt something whoosh past my ear. There was a numbness, followed by a strange burn. I touched my cheek and felt blood. The lower tip of my earlobe was gone. Someone grabbed my shoulder from the crew quarter side of the door. I turned to see Sawyer reaching for me, a small red blossom visible on his throat. More gunshots rang out and Sawyer spun then fell. I ran. I got a good look into the crew quarters before I fled. Several figures dressed in black wetsuits with ballistic masks were fanning out across the room. They would stop now and then to fire a few rounds into crawling bodies on the floor. In the brief glimpse I got of the invaders, I saw high-tech goggles, vests, and assault weapons outfitted with silencers and lasers. 
The killers didn't look like any pirates I've ever heard of. These men usually had rusty boats and Soviet-era rifles. No, the people attacking us looked fresh out of a military recruitment ad for the special forces. The next hour is a blur. It was chaos below decks as I ran through the rig's narrow hallways, dodging metal beams and slumped bodies. The muffled thump of gunfire was never far away. It echoed around me, seeming to come from every blind corner and shadow. The red emergency lights failed half an hour after the slaughter in the crew quarters. I managed to pull a flashlight from one of the emergency cabinets outside of the medical bay, but I was too terrified to use it for more than a few seconds at a time. My worst moment came when I heard gunshots from just around the corner. I ducked into a nearby open door, turning on my flashlight for a split second, just long enough to see that I was in a staff break room. There was a couch in the corner. I ran for it, then wedged myself into the gap between the couch and the wall. I held my breath. It was pitch black in the room. Footsteps began to fall nearby. There were several people very, very close. I've sworn I saw a flash of light, a voice muttered. It was a man, American. Anybody got eyes on a tango? Another voice replied. Negative, room appears clear, all tangos uniform. I squeezed myself closer into the wall, wishing I could disappear. I think we're good to go, Oscar Mike, the first voice said. But honestly, I can't see shit through these new NODs. I miss the old model. Take it up with command, an authoritative voice cut in. Now cut the chatter in Charlie Mike. I heard footsteps head towards the door, then fade down the hallway. These weren't pirates. These were our own guys wiping us out. It took me another 20 minutes to make my way in the dark towards the communications room. I had to get a message out, a call for help, something. There was no real plan driving me forward, only an impulse. I didn't want to die alone in the dark without anyone back home knowing what happened. When I finally made it to communications, the heavy metal door was locked. I slumped in the doorway, exhausted and out of ideas. Every now and then, I'd hear another gunshot or worse, a scream. They'd find me soon enough. There was nothing left but waiting. I looked at the locked door. I was so close. Feeling half delusional, I leaned over and knocked against the metal. A moment later, something knocked back. I sat stunned for a breath, then began to tap out a message in Morse code. It's Jim, in danger. Hall clear, open, please open. I repeated the message just in case, then I waited. It was the longest minute of my life. Just as I was about to start pounding on the door, I heard the locks click. The door swung open and strong arms pulled me into the dark room before slamming and sealing us in again. Who is in here? I whispered. I heard cursing and then the click of a flashlight. It was Jody. I thought you were dead, he whispered back. Have you tried calling for help? Jody shook his head. They're jamming us, can't seem to get a connection. We need to try the satellite. Even if we can't get a direct line, maybe we can send the message out there for someone to find. If we do that, Jim, I don't think anyone will hear us in time to send help. I took a deep breath. I know. I wish we'd never found that damn box, Jody spat. He shined the light in the corner and revealed that he'd brought the flight recorder with him. So much for a reward, why do you still have that? I don't know, I was thinking maybe if worst came to worst, we could try to use it to negotiate our way out of here. These guys don't seem like the negotiating type, Jody. Yeah, he sighed, moving the light away from the box. I'm sorry I called the number. You couldn't have known what would happen. Jody whistled. Whatever is in that box, whatever they've got on that flight recorder, they sure are killing a lot of folks to keep it secret. I thought about the weird symbols, almost like runes, and the way Patrick reacted when he saw the object. What do you think is on that recorder? I asked. Aliens, Jody guessed. Or maybe proof of an ancient civilization? Or maybe just something about illegal government experiments? Or specs for some new super weapon? Who knows, who cares? They'll kill us no matter what the secret is. We sat in silence together for a few minutes. Something began slamming into the door. Oh God, oh God, oh God, I said, scrambling for the communication controls. 
Jody was right. We were being jammed. But every now and then, the satellite feed almost gets a connection. They've been working on the door for half an hour. I'm amazed it's held this long. Maybe they're too afraid of the oil to risk explosives, but sooner or later, I know they'll get in. Jody is curled up in the corner, clutching the black box like a teddy bear. I've got this message ready to go. The next time I get even the thinnest sliver of signal, I'm going to fire this off on multiple frequencies in every direction. All I can do is pray that somebody gets this, that someone knows the truth. Goodbye, Mom. If you ever hear about this, just please just know I did my best. These guys are professionals. I'm sure it won't hurt. The black truck's grill filled my rearview mirror as it surged toward me, its headlights nearly blinding me as I looked back. It felt like my heart was beating as fast as the pistons in my motor as I pressed the gas pedal to the floor of my little sporty SUV. I risked a glance up at the rearview mirror again, seeing the truck falling back a few feet. Come on, come on, please, I said to my SUV. Deidre, I called her. My voice cracked, and hearing the fear there served to complete a sort of feedback loop, making me even more scared. The truck surged forward again, closing the gap. Please, I cried. What did I do to you? Of course, whoever was in the truck couldn't hear me. My pedal was to the floor, and I looked down at my speedometer to see the needle creeping up on 120 miles per hour. Oh shit, oh fuck, God damn it! just leave me alone. Warm liquid dribbled down my cheeks, and I took one hand away from the steering wheel to wipe the tears away. I was ashamed of crying. A man like me isn't supposed to cry. I knew I couldn't keep up this speed for long. Deidre was an older model, and I was afraid I'd blow a gasket or something. I had to make a move if I wanted to get away from this psycho. I saw no other cars on our side of the highway, and only a few had passed on the other side since the truck had started chasing me. It was just after two in the morning. I'm just a guy on a road trip. I said to myself, <laughs> sobbing. What do you want from me? I saw an exit coming up, the green sign flashing by before I had a chance to read the whole thing. It didn't matter. I had to get off the highway if I wanted to lose this creep. Only then could I make my next move. I could call the police if I could just lose the guy. If I could just get some privacy and a few minutes without him chasing me. I looked back to the cooler sitting on my back seat. The exit ramp came up on my right, and I waited until the last second to jerk my wheel right. I drove over the thick white lines of the hazard zone and made it onto the ramp without losing much speed. I looked into my mirrors to see that the truck hadn't reacted quickly enough. It slammed to a stop half in the grass, just past the hazard zone. I saw it reverse quickly before I lost it from view. Okay, I've got some time, I said to myself. Some time to lose this creep. There was a sign for a gas station to the right, and not much else. I could see the gas station down the road about a quarter mile but it looked dark. It clearly wasn't a 24-hour place. I turned left and gunned it over the highway I'd just exited. The road stabbed into a thick grove of trees, which flashed by in a blur as I gained speed. I looked in the rearview mirror, but didn't see the truck yet. The road was curved, so I had to slow down to around 60 miles an hour. Before I cleared the first curve into the woods, headlights splashed the back of my vehicle. No, not yet, I cried. The tears had stopped, but I felt on the verge of losing control again. I drove as fast as I could, nearly going off the winding road twice before it straightened out and came to the outskirts of a tiny town. As I gunned it down the straightaway, I looked in my rearview mirror again, searching for headlights cutting through the trees behind me. There were no lights. It was so dark behind me that I couldn't see anything but the formless night. Had the truck stopped following me? As I came into the small town, I started looking for a place to turn off, a building to hide behind. I slowed down to look when a revving sound erupted from behind me. On reflex, I hit the gas pedal and looked up into the rearview mirror again. The truck's grill was there. I could just see it, thanks to the illumination from a street light coming up on my left. He turned his lights off. Of course he had. How could I be so stupid? 
I cried out as the truck rammed Deidre, sending me lurching and then spinning and then crashing into a small brick building that looked like a post office. The impact slammed my head against the steering wheel, busting my nose open. The cooler I had in the back came open, spilling its contents into the footwells of the back seat. Deidre came to a hissing, ticking stop. I cried out, the tears starting again, scrambling to put the items back in the cooler. But before I could get my seatbelt off to turn around, my door was wrenched open. A large man in a camouflage trucker's hat, a plaid work shirt, and work boots punched me in the face, causing my head to whip sideways. He reached over me and unbuckled my seatbelt, then grabbed me by the collar and threw me out onto the sidewalk next to the brick building. No, I said, pleading. I'm just a guy on a road trip, leave me alone. The man was big, much bigger than me. He had a black beard and crazy eyes. You motherfucker, he said in a growl, bending over and punching me in the mouth. My teeth folded back in an explosion of pain. His big, rough hands gripped my neck and squeezed. Blood poured out of my nose and my lacerated lips. Tears poured out of my eyes. Flashing blue and red lights suffused my surroundings. The sound of tires screeching sliced through my ringing ears. Let him go, a voice said, right now. The big man's grip relaxed on my throat. I'm the one that's been on the phone with you people for the last 20 minutes, the big man said from over me. I don't give a good goddamn who you are. Stop choking that man right now. The big man's hand slid from my throat and I sucked in a breath through my deformed mouth. It's not me, I gasped. I'm just on a road trip. He's the one. He tried to kill me. You saw it, officer. Shut up and turn onto your stomach, the cop said as he came into view, pointing his gun at me. You, step back and keep your hands up, he said to the big man. Oh, Christ, big man said. Look into the back, officer. Look into the back now, and you'll see that I'm right. It's him. I recognized him at a rest stop. It's him. The disgust in the big man's voice was so apparent and vehement that the cop did what he asked. He stepped over to Deidre and looked into the back seat at what had spilled out of my cooler when I hit the building. Oh shit, the cop said. Oh, Mother Mary, you son of a bitch. Put your hands behind your back right now. I loved her, I said, putting my hands behind my back. I loved the cop's knee coming down hard on my back stopped the words, but it didn't stop the tears. He put the cuffs on and yanked me up to my feet. I loved her, officer. I said as he perp walked me past poor Deidre. I looked in the back window at the young woman's head, which had come to rest propped against the back of the driver's seat amid spilled ice and sodas. She was looking up at me with her dull eyes. I love you, I said to her. She didn't answer. I bet you loved all six of them, didn't you? The cop said. You sick son of a bitch. Six? I said and smiled. The tears suddenly stopped. You think there's only six? The bright Mexico sun beams down on my shoulders, warming me and melting my memories of the frigid northeastern landscape I've left behind. It's winter, but it feels like summer here in Cancun. The aquamarine pool water sparkles as Kimberly slips in. There are a few people around the pool, but it's nowhere near crowded not on this Monday afternoon. Kim looks up at me from the water, smiling and squinting behind her glasses. You coming in, silly? She asks. The water's perfect. Yes, I say, smiling down at her. I turn to see that she's put her stuff on one of the lounge chairs behind me. I dump my bag, towel, and book down on the chair next to hers. I don't have my phone. It's back up in the room which feels both weird and awesome at the same time. I slip into the water and release a sigh as it cradles me. The near weightlessness putting ever more mental distance between me and the troubles I've left behind to come on this vacation. I've got water, sun, a good book, and no work for the next week. Not to mention Kim looking amazing in her pink bikini. What could be better? Nothing. That's what. Yeah, it's gonna be a great vacation. There's a swim up bar on the other side of the pool and I'm tempted to head over there now, but it's a little early for me to start drinking. 
even if I am on vacation. Soon enough, though, the choice is taken out of my hands. A couple who had been lounging on the other side of the pool walk up, smiling and carrying four drinks. Hey, the guy says, you're Americans, right? I can tell by his accent that he's American, or maybe Canadian. Yeah, I say, we're from Buffalo. You? Cincinnati, the guy says, kneeling. Here, have a drink with us. He extends one hand to me with a blue tropical drink in it, and the woman does the same to Kim. Kim and I look at each other. She shrugs. Let the vacation begin, she says, taking the drink. I take one from the man and raise it in salute. Salute, the man says. He takes a drink and then sits down, dipping his legs into the pool. Thanks, I say. I'm Andre, and this is Kim. I'm Devin, and this is Claire, the guy says. Hi, Claire says with a smile and a wave. She slips into the pool and starts chatting away with Kim like they're old friends. I'll never understand how women do that. Devin and I talk, mostly about what to do in Cancun. He and Claire come down every year, he tells me. I tell him it's our first time, and he gives me the lowdown on all the best spots. By the time I finish that first drink, my head is swimming. I suddenly realize that I've lost track of Kim. I look around, scanning the pool for her. What's wrong, bud? Devin asks. Kim? I say. Where'd she go? (laughs) Devin chuckles. You're not much of a drinker, are you? He says. She and Claire went inside to order some food from the restaurant. They came by and said so about 10 minutes ago. You really don't remember? Oh, yeah, I say. But the truth is, I don't remember. I'm just trying to hide the embarrassing fact that I can't handle my alcohol. Those drinks were doubles, Devin says. The world is fuzzy, and every time I move my head, my vision has to work to catch up. What was in those drinks? I ask, struggling to pull myself out of the pool. The sun is setting, but that can't be right. Kim and I came out here just after two. I don't know, man, Devin says. It's a blue Hawaiian or something like that. Not sure what's in them. Are you okay? No, I say, finally getting out of the pool. I try to stand up, but the world tilts and my legs don't seem to work. I crawl over to my lounge chair and lie down. Water, I say. Please. Yeah, Devin says. I got it. While Devin's gone getting me water, Kimberly comes back out to the pool with Claire. As soon as she sees me, she knows something is wrong. Are you okay, babe? She says. I try to focus my eyes on Claire behind her to see how far away she is. I think he drugged me, I whisper to Kim. What? Who, Devin? What did he say? Claire says, just a hint of indignation in her voice. I guess I wasn't quiet enough. He doesn't drink much, Kim says, apologetically. What happened, Devin? Claire says, looking up at Devin, who approaches with a glass of water in his hand. I don't know. I think that drink was too much for him, he says. Here you go, buddy. He hands me the glass of water and I take a sip then immediately spit it out. What the hell is this? I ask, slurring my words. That's not water. What? I asked the bartender to give me filtered water. Devin takes a sip and spits it out. You're right, he says, then dumps it out on the ground. That must be tap water. I want to go back to the room, I say to Kim. Let's go back to the room. Okay, Kim says. Can you walk? I sit up and pause, waiting for my vision to catch up with the movement. I stand up and then immediately sit back down hard on the chair. I'll help you, Devin says. No, I say, not you. Andre, Kim says to me. I'm so sorry, she continues, talking to Devin and Claire. This is so embarrassing. I would, we would greatly appreciate your help. You've been nothing but good to us. I can barely keep my eyes open now, so I let Devin help me up to our suite. Kim unlocks the door, and Devin guides me over to the couch, setting me down. He grabs a bottle of water from our mini fridge and sets it next to me. Sorry about this, bud, 
he says. I wish I could do something for you. I'll be sure to talk to the front desk about this. Oh, don't worry about that, Kim says. We'll take care of it when he's feeling better. I hope he feels better soon, Claire says as she and Devin leave. I'm able to keep my eyes open long enough to watch Kim shut the door. I want to tell her to swing out the little metal plate that will stop anyone from opening the door more than two inches. But consciousness falls away from me as soon as I see we're both safely in the room. Whimpering sounds scratch at my unconscious mind, pulling me from sleep little by little. I open my eyes and all they want is to close again. I force them open and pick up my head, seeing that I'm still on the couch. That whimpering noise sounds every few seconds. And do I hear someone whispering? I sit up, rubbing my eyes, trying to dislodge the terrible headache from behind them. I notice that it's still night out because the shades for the sliding glass door to our third floor balcony are open. Whimpering and more whispering reach my ears. What the hell is that? I stand up, happy to find that my legs are working much better than they were whenever we left the pool. The noises are coming from the bedroom. There are double doors there, and one of them is open about halfway. I stumble up to the open door and look inside to see Devin kneeling on the floor, leaning over a bloody and beaten Kimberly. It looks like someone has taken a baseball bat to her. She's still wearing her bikini, and I can see bloody cuts all over her body. Both her eyes are swollen shut, and her lip is split. The scene seems so unbelievable that, for a moment, I think I'm dreaming. Kim whimpers, and Devin whispers something in her ear. My suspicions rush back at me, the memories of my near blackout at the pool clicking into place. And along with those memories comes a wave of anger that seems to swell me to twice my size. I don't say anything. I don't ask questions. I just rush into the room and grab Devin by the neck, pulling him up with a strength I never knew I possessed. He fights back, and we stumble through the door into the living room of the suite, bumping into the coffee table in front of the couch. I redouble my efforts, choking and shoving him at the same time. His eyes are wide with disbelief and terror. He probably thought the drugs he slipped me should have kept me out for longer. He swings his right fist up, hitting a glancing blow off my left temple, which only serves to make me angrier. I dig my heels into the ground, straighten my arms, and push with all I have. Devin backpedals, losing his footing, which simply makes us go faster. We're practically running when his back smashes through the sliding glass door leading to the balcony. Glass rains down on my shoulders, but I pay it no mind. I keep pushing until Devin's back hits the balcony railing. And I keep pushing, only letting go with my left arm to hook it under his legs, flipping him up over the railing and watching him fall to the concrete walkway three stories below. The wet crunch his body makes on impact is immensely satisfying. So is how he comes to rest, folded in ways the human body isn't supposed to go. I rush back into the room, noticing for the first time that the door to our suite is open. I hear running from the hall, then the door is shoved open and a couple of paramedics run in. Donde esta ella? Where is she? One of them says, translating his own words for my sake. I bring them into the bedroom and they immediately begin working on Kim, who is, thankfully, still alive. I'm here, baby, I say to Kim. I love you. Please, step back, sir, the same paramedic says. We'll handle this. Is she going to be okay? I ask. Is she? Most of the wounds look superficial, so I think so. We'll know more in a few minutes. Please, step back. My room phone starts ringing, and I walk over to pick it up, thankful for something to do. Hello, sir. This is the front desk, the man on the line says. Yes, I say. What is it? Is this Andre Burton? Yes, what is it? There's been an assault here. Yes, I know, sir. That's why I'm calling. The man, we have him. He's in police custody. I just wanted to let you know. Your property will be returned to you as soon as possible. What? What man? What are you talking about? I ask, growing nauseous. I'm sorry to say that it was one of our employees, sir. A bartender. But we've caught him. Your friend, Devin? He caught him coming out of your room. I thought you knew this. The two men fought, but the bartender got away. Devin, he called us from your room. Told me to get an ambulance. They should be up there now. Are they? The phone slips out of my hands as I recall the look on Devin's face as we struggled. The surprise there. The terror. 
I sit down on the bed. My hands grab fistfuls of my hair, seemingly of their own accord. He was trying to help her, to keep her company until the paramedics arrive. That's all. And I killed him for it. Dear God, I killed him. Also, it turns out that most of you guys who watch me aren't actually subscribed. So if you like the content and want to support the channel, go ahead and hit the bell. It's free and you can always change your mind later. We can't leave the house. They've boarded up our doors and windows, started shooting people trying to break free. There are things in the streets, tall things. I see their shadows sometimes as they run past the wooden boards. I hear the rumble of their feet. I don't know what they are. None of us do. They cut our access to television and the internet when the lockdown began. They even took out the cell tower. Anne says they don't want us communicating with the outside world, telling them about what's going on out here. I think she's right. It's been two weeks since the men in suits came by. They said they worked for government intelligence and that they were looking for a terrorist. They didn't strike me as government types, personally. They looked distracted, spaced out, more like Scientologists than CIA agents. But then again, I've never met a Scientologist or a CIA agent, so who was I to tell the difference? Either way, they said it would be over soon, and they sounded official. We'll need to search every household, they explained. We can't have anybody leaving before we've cleared their property, so we'll have to board you in. It made sense, I guess, in a twisted, dystopian nightmare sort of way. It made sense all the way up until the end of the fourth night when the tall things started roaming the streets. They were dressed in long, red raincoats, hooded. The way they moved gave me the chills, all jerky and spastic, so I stayed away from the windows. Anne didn't mind, though. She was fascinated by them. Her and our gun-nut veteran of a neighbor, Old Ty, exchanged theories written on pieces of cardboard, holding them up to the glass of the windows. Government experiment, she wrote on hers. Alien invasion, he wrote on his. At first, it seemed to just be a bit of innocent, morbid fun, finding some humor in a bizarre situation. Then Anne watched one of the tall things kill somebody, and everything changed. It was an elderly man in our cul-de-sac, Mr. Douglas. Anne watched him open his door and hammer down the boards as one of the tall things walked by. He shouted at it, told it to get over here, so he could see just what kind of unholy bullshit his tax dollars were being used to fund. Next thing you know, there's sirens in the streets, soldiers rushing his home. There's a megaphone shouting at him to get back inside. All of it is useless. All of it happens far too late. Because the moment Douglas starts yelling at the tall thing, it starts to twitch and jerk like it can't control its own behavior, like a predator hungry for a meal. It snaps its head toward Douglas, then tears across his lawn and snaps him up in its long, spider-like hands. It lifts him off the ground. Then he screams. He screams and he screams until the tall thing lowers the hood of its rain jacket, and then Douglas goes pale as a ghost silent. According to Anne, that's when the skin of his face started to bubble and pop. That's when he started hissing out steam, smoking as his flesh sizzled beneath his clothes, as if he were boiling alive from the inside out. Next thing you know, he's dripping onto the pavement, dripping and dripping until there's nothing left of him but a puddle of flesh and clothes. Nobody tries to step in. Not any of the government suits, not Anne, not even old Ty and all his guns. Everybody watches in stunned silence as the tall thing finishes its execution and saunters away. Soldiers roam with them, soldiers and people in long white clothes. Anne says they're lab coats and the people are researchers studying the tall things as experiments. But I think they look more like robes like clergymen. All of them wear helmets with tinted visors, 
It's as though they don't want to get a good look at the things. After Mr. Douglas, more people on the block decided to make a break for it. Maybe they realized this was worse than they thought. Maybe they started wondering what the point of keeping us locked away like this was. Were we food for these creatures? Were they trying to turn us into them? None of us knew. All we could say for certain is the killing didn't stop with Mr. Douglas. I woke up one morning to see several of my neighbors shot dead in their yards, their lifeless eyes gazing back at me from the grass. Nobody came to pick them up. They were left there to rot, picked apart by birds and stray dogs. Soon, gunshots were ringing out at all hours of the day. People wanted out, but the soldiers wouldn't let them leave. And so the bodies began to pile up. Eventually, I think Anne and I were the only two left alive in our cul-de-sac. Even old Ty had seemed to vanish, probably shot dead in his backyard. It was awful. I'd rarely known death in my life, and the sheer volume of it now seemed to numb me. I couldn't process it. I didn't know how. But then, almost out of the blue, the government had a change of heart. Or maybe they just shifted tactics. Suddenly, they began letting people leave. I saw it first with a house at the very end of the road. I watched the woman who lived there break out with a baby tucked in her arm and a grade schooler holding her hand. The three of them darted across their lawn, jumped over their father's corpse, and piled into their minivan on the street. The entire time, a soldier and white coat stood only meters away, quietly observing. It didn't take long for the rumbling to begin. That telltale sound of approaching death, of one of the tall things coming to claim its prize. The van started up, backfiring a plume of exhaust into the air. I listened as the woman shrieked for joy, but I knew the joy would be short-lived. See, from my vantage point at the end of the lane, I saw something that she never could. The boot locked around her rear tire. The van rode forward as she pressed the gas and then clunked to a stop. My heart broke. The look on her face, the desperation wasn't for her. It was for her children in the back. The rumble reached a crescendo, and in the blink of an eye, a tall thing crashed into the van and knocked it over like a die-cast toy. I couldn't make out much beyond that. Nothing but the sound of the monster tearing into the roof of the van and pulling the crying children out one by one while their mother begged for mercy. If I were a better, stupider man, I may have kicked down my door and tried to save them, but I wasn't. I was a coward. Instead, I fell to my living room carpet and cried. I laid there and listened as their flesh popped and sizzled, as their skin fell to the pavement in long, heavy drips. It's a sound I'll never forget. The next day, things got worse. The soldiers no longer cared about enforcing the lockdown or even keeping people safely indoors. Now they were breaking them out. Like hungry wolves, they tore down boarded up doors and kicked in living room windows, then dragged families out onto their lawns and held them there for slaughter. If the screams were horrible before, now they were unbearable. You couldn't ignore them. Anne and I cranked our sound system to the max, but it only served as background static. The dying cut through everything. That night, we barely slept. Anne tossed and turned beside me while I stared blankly at the ceiling fan rotating in lazy circles. There was an understanding between us. We had been abandoned. There was nobody coming to help us. Nobody coming to arrest these monsters and save the day. We were alone. How long until her and I were dragged out of our home? How long until we became the next experiment, chained to our fence, waiting to be attacked by one of those creatures? Maybe tomorrow, maybe next week. Neither of us knew, and somehow that made it all the worse. I woke up to the sunlight peeking through our boarded up bedroom window. Anne was missing. I looked all over the house for her before I found her note on the kitchen counter, scribbled quickly. I know you're afraid, the note read, but I have to leave. You might think we'll make it through this, 
that once they've had their fill of guinea pigs, they'll let the rest of us go free. But I promise you they'll come for us soon. This might be my last chance. Since you won't come with me, I'm going alone. I wish I could have said a proper goodbye, but I know you'd try to stop me. Love always, Annie Bear. She left through the basement hatch. I know this because I spotted her corpse some five feet away through our kitchen window. She gazed back at me, a look of shock painted across her pale face, except for the small red dot where the bullet pierced her skull. I couldn't even muster the courage to step out and bury her. Instead, the raccoons and dogs took care of her, one piece at a time. She was right though. Eventually, they did come for me. It was over a week later. By then, I didn't have the will to resist. I waited patiently at the kitchen table, drunk with a glass of whiskey, as soldiers in white coats dragged me from the house. When I'd seen it happen to other people, it seemed to occur so quickly. Now, it happened in slow motion. I heard every word from the soldier's mouth, every command. First, he patted me down and ensured I was disarmed. Then he told me this was all routine and nothing to worry about. Together, they took me out to my yard. The white coat asked me if I had lived a good life, if I had been a man of faith, I didn't know what to say. Maybe I was simply too drunk, or maybe I truly didn't care anymore. It's not as bad as it looks, the white coat assured me. You'll be at peace once it's over, brother. In the distance came the growing rumble of the monster's feet, of the tall thing coming to claim its bounty. How many more after this? The soldier asked the white coat, his hand painfully gripping my shoulder. Sixteen. Then us, sister. Then us. The rumbling deepened. The tall thing was getting closer, and soon my heart was beating in sync with its stampeding footfalls. Memories flashed in my mind. Memories of Anne, and my dead neighbors, and the mother who lived at the end of the road, of her children that ended up as sizzling puddles of flesh and clothes on the pavement. My hands became fists. Indignation and fury grew inside of me, stoked by whiskey fumes. Why do this? I growled. Why not just put a bullet in my head? Because we love you, brother, said the white coat. You waited patiently. You had faith. And for that, you will be rewarded with salvation. The tall thing rounded the corner, its legs slapping against the ground in great strides. Its frame eclipsed the moon casting a shadow across me and stealing the breath from my lungs. It slowed down as it reached my lawn. Then it sauntered over to me, swaying this way and that. What are they? I whispered. The ones that made us, the white coat replied. Those that gave us life. I shrank away as the tall thing neared, but the soldier shoved me forward. Be strong, brother. Show it your conviction. We were brought to this planet long ago as an experiment, but now our time is served and we're finally going home. Don't you want to go home? The tall thing reached up to its hood. As it did, the soldier's grip loosened and both he and the white coat stepped to the side, away from the creature's view. I would not scream. I told myself, no matter what, I wouldn't give these monsters the satisfaction of my terror. It pulled back on its hood and something grotesque looked down on me. It was as if a hundred different faces had been stitched together, fused into an abomination that seemed to smile from 15 mouths. We are peace, it said softly. My teeth bit into my cheeks, clenching them closed. A whimper escaped me, a whimper and a groan as my stomach filled with a soup of boiling horror. I would not scream, I would not scream. No matter the pain, I would not scream. Its long, spindly hands gripped my face. It cocked its head to the side, a hundred different eyes blinking back at me. Then it tugged at the bottom of my mouth. No, I wasn't going to let it have its way. My mouth stayed clenched. It repositioned its grip and then snapped my jaw in half, letting it hang limp from my face. I roared in agony, tears streaming down my cheeks in a torrent. 
It whispered, slipping a finger down my throat. I choked and gagged as it fished its finger around as a hundred different eyes rolled back and 15 mouths began muttering an alien language. I choked and gagged until a gunshot rang out. Then another. The tall thing wheeled around, dropping me onto my lawn as the soldier began shouting into his radio. The next second, a bullet found the soldier in the head. The white coat shrieked, fleeing around my fence as a round caught her in the shoulder. The tall thing shot up to its full height, standing level with the street lamps and then sprinted toward the shooter. Toward old Ty. He'd set up a kill zone on his roof, surrounded by rifles and ammo. He'd waited for a moonless night to do his business, and now he was raining lead onto the creature like a blizzard of death. What are you waiting for? He bellowed. Get moving, dipsh**. I did. I stole away, hiding in shrubs and behind sheds, watching as tall things came roaring down streets, jumping over houses and knocking over cars as they tried to reach old Ty. He only lasted a few minutes. That's when the shooting stopped, but it was enough time for me to get away. Maybe enough time for others too. It took me three hours to hike through Debbie Forest and make it to the next town. And once I did, I breathed a sigh of relief. There weren't any soldiers, no white coats. Most importantly, there weren't any tall things melting people in their clothes. Just quiet stillness, the thing early mornings were meant for. I made my way to the sheriff's department to blow the whistle on what was going on, to explain that people were being shot, that tall things were melting people on the street, and that we needed to get our ass in gear and call in the National Guard. No, scratch that. We needed to call in f***ing NATO. But as I got to the door to the precinct, I stopped. Something gleamed in the corner of my eye, catching my attention. It was there, at the edge of the curb, a puddle. Strange thing is, it hadn't rained in weeks. The warehouse sits in the middle of the old industrial district, an ugly block of concrete. It sprawls across the land, casting its weary gaze out onto its dilapidated surroundings. There was a time when it was the shining jewel of this town, a time when it would bustle with the optimistic energy of the workers who lived identical lives in identical houses just over the hill when large boxes of electronics would pass through it on their way to different corners of the country and sometimes even across the sea. But all that is ancient history, of course. For now, it is nothing but an eyesore battered with age, a sad and decrepit reminder of this town's once great potential. Wind whistles through its shattered windows like the mournful howl of an abandoned dog Weeds and ivy crawl up its sides as if trying to make it sink into the ground while a chain of grimy, flickering tube lights adorning its crumbling boundary wall desperately try to sweep aside the gloom that has settled into its very bones. Definitely not a place a fledgling like me would choose to spend his Friday night at. But sometimes things are so far beyond our control that we can do nothing but be swept by the tides of causality. As I climb out of my car, I adjust the buttons of my suit and let my eyes drift over the warehouse, not because it holds my interest in any way, but because I would rather look at anything but at the man. No, the creature standing outside the rusted front gate. I fix my gaze on the walls. I focus on the paint that peels off them, making the building look like a dying snake trying to shed its skin one last time. I imagine myself wriggling into the cracks of the warehouse, hiding until all the shit that's about to go down tonight is over. But I know I will not be afforded that luxury. Already I can feel the man growing restless. Immense pressure emanates from his body, presses up against me like a knife scraping against the very bone of my throat. I sigh, shake my head, and begin walking towards him. The air grows colder and thicker the closer I get to him. Gently swirls around him, shimmering like a soft white mist under the dull street light. I loosen my tie to try and make it easier to breathe. It doesn't work. I really should have drank more blood before coming here. You are late, the man remarks, his silky voice gliding effortlessly out of his mouth. Apologies, your excellency, I reply, my head bowed. The preparations took a little longer than expected. I risk a glance at him. He's staring at me, ageless, poreless skin stretched across a youthful face studded with ancient eyes. 
Large, gold-rimmed black pupils like twin solar eclipses. I feel a shudder run through me. Let's dispense with the formalities, shall we? Call me Julius. I may be young, but I wasn't a total novice at the dance. I knew a trap when I saw one. I, I couldn't possibly do that, sire. He smirks, his fangs glinting silver under the pale light. It would be so easy for him to rip my throat out. You're a quick learner, aren't you? I can see why Jacob thinks so highly of you. I say nothing. I just give a reverent nod in response. Pity he couldn't be here. The king requested my master's presence at the royal lodge, sire. Ah, yes, of course. When his most venerable majesty calls, you sure damn well answer. A lesson Michael here seems to have forgotten. He reaches into the jacket of his sleek gray suit, pulls out a cigar from a small metal case, and jams it between his teeth. So, are your men ready? They are at your command, I reply as I give him a light. Praetorians, all of them, finest troops on the East Coast. But of course he knows that. Who, how many, where? An elder like him would have known the answers to those questions the minute those soldiers stepped foot inside the town. I wish I could sense them as well. My inability to do so reminds me of my own weakness, makes me feel uneasy, exposed. Elder Julius takes a long drag from his cigar. I'm impressed you managed to convince the Prime Council to hand over the Praetorians. I give him a humble smile. It was all Master Jacob's doing. It was he who convinced them that it was necessary to bring this war to an end. And of course, a phone call from the Royal Lodge sealed the deal. The powerful vampire shakes his head with a <laughs> chuckle. All that for little old Michael. Overkill if you ask me. That little cockroach doesn't deserve all the attention. The eponymous cockroach here, of course, is the little brother of the vampire king of this great nation. And also the seventh most powerful blood-sucking creature on the continent. I curse him under my breath, yet again, for setting up his base on what has just recently become our turf, forcing us to participate in this civil war. Elder Julius sniffs the air, like a bloodhound. I can smell them in there, Michael and his men. It's faint, but it's there. The stale stench of fear, like rust on an old metal pipe. He smiles, bares his fangs. Oh, how I've looked forward to this night. I finally caught you, you slippery little bastard. My throat feels like sandpaper. The very thought of standing in the same room as these monsters sets my nerves on edge. But to go to war with them? I can feel the beast within me lashing out, trying to rip my sanity to shreds for daring to go along with this foolishness. I grit my teeth and steady myself. All right, let's get started, shall we? Elder Julius says as he tosses his mostly intact cigar aside. It bounces off the asphalt, sends sparks flying into the air. The old vampire proceeds to untie his ponytail, his long silver hair spilling across his shoulders like a lion's mane. He then closes his eyes, cracks his knuckles, and unleashes himself. Terror ripples through me as I'm hit with the full extent of his power. It feels like my head is being crushed in a vice while I'm drowning in acid. My brain pounds in my skull. My lungs burn. My knees wobble. Heat sears every pore in my skin. It takes everything I have just to keep standing. Dear God, just how powerful is he? And then, just as quickly as it had started, the insane pressure is gone. The power that burned hot enough to scorch my soul itself is once again ensconced within Elder Julius's body. I lean against the wall, trying to catch my breath. You all right there? He asks, amused, twirling a small knife in his hands. I cough. <coughs> you certainly know how to make an entrance, sire. He glides over to the wall, eases himself against it, and waits for the chaos to start. That little display of power is intended to hit two birds with a single stone to throw Michael and his men into complete disarray, and to signal to the Praetorians to take advantage of the resultant confusion and begin their assault. Cold air licks at the back of my neck as I strain my ears for any signs that the enemy has taken notice of Elder Julius's performance. Frantic pattering of booted feet, angry, panicked whispers, metallic clicks of guns being loaded. But there's nothing. The warehouse is shrouded in a nervous silence. Something's wrong, I say my tense shoulders turning in knots. He doesn't say anything. Did they know that he was here? Is that why they haven't broken the silence? Couldn't be. I'm sure they must have sensed my presence when I arrived here. I'm too young, too weak to fully meld with the shadows. But Elder Julius? No, you only see him if he lets you. 
Something is terribly wrong here. Muttering something under his breath, Elder Julius whips his knife in the air and begins marching towards the front door of the warehouse. I pull my Glock out of its holster and start to follow. I spot the Praetorians as soon as we turn the corner and walk through the gate. They have fanned out, surrounded the warehouse from all sides, guns aimed at the numerous shattered windows that dot its walls. Two of them break off and begin jogging towards us, their boots clicking on the cracked and overgrown asphalt. Elder Julius stops as they approach, lower their rifles, and greet him with a bow. Sire, the one on the right says, fangs and blood-red lips peeking through the balaclava. We've taken a look inside. It's strange. Explain, he demands. They exchange a look. It's best if you see for yourself. He nods and they draw their guns up and begin leading us towards the broad front door of the warehouse. Faded white paint, rusted hinges that creak with the cold wind. The door is on its last legs and the Praetorian puts it out of its misery by kicking it down, sending it slamming onto the ground with a resounding boom. The Praetorian switch on the flashlights mounted on their guns, swing it around the dark interior of the warehouse, and we see why none of our enemies had reacted earlier. Because they're all dead. The warehouse had been turned into a fortress. Sandbag defenses, machine guns mounted at key positions. They had a death trap waiting for us. But the only carnage that greets us is one that seems to have taken place hours ago. I see walls and floors splattered with dried, corrupted blood, corpses slumped against sandbags and machine guns, sometimes whole, often in unrecognizable pieces. Shriveled up innards litter the dusty floor and hang from broken light fixtures like bunting. And the smell, dear God, the smell. Vile stench of vampire gore and refuse stabs at my brain through my nostrils. And something else, old rot, like things decaying under a hot desert sun. I clamp my hand on my mouth to stop myself from retching. Seems like Michael's group had a bit of a falling out. The Praetorian who led us here remarks, that's not what this is. Elder Julius replies, his voice now muted, serious. The boisterousness in his demeanor is completely gone. I force my pupils to dilate and stare at him. The worry that creases his forehead is more terrifying than the macabre sight in front of me. I feel saliva drying up in my mouth. Is something wrong, sire? Praetorian asks. Yeah, the smell, it's strong here, overpowers the senses, but it's far too faint outside. I had to concentrate just to get a slight whiff. He takes a pause, almost as if the stench is being suppressed, contained within these walls. Cold shivers rack my spine. He turns to look at me. You had people watching this place, did you not? I nod. Yes, sire. Two men positioned on the hill overlooking this warehouse, around the clock, and I'm assuming they didn't hear our friends here being torn apart. I shake my head. What could be powerful enough to hide something like this? Just the thought makes my head swim. Hmm, intriguing. He places a foot on a mutilated corpse lying face down on the ground, kicks it onto its side. And there's the matter of the bite marks on these bodies. I narrow my eyes as they wander over the corpse, but my vision isn't strong enough to make out the wounds. Thankfully, the white glow of a flashlight passes over it, revealing the injuries, small bites, single puncture wounds, Elder Julius says, all over the body, like he was bitten by some sort of a critter. What do you think happened here? I whisper in disbelief. That's exactly what I intend to find out, he replies, before jabbing his thumb at the Praetorian. Get your men inside, search all the bodies, find Michael. I'm going to find out what happened here, even if I have to drag that bastard right out of hell. The rest of the Praetorians swiftly pour into the warehouse, their flashlights bobbing and weaving across every inch of the structure. The very air inside brims with power oozing out of the powerful vampires. But there's an undercurrent of something else in here, a faint presence of something long gone that still lingers in the air. Even I can sense it, a trace of immense power that makes everyone inside uncomfortable and fearful. The Praetorians, clad in black body armor, sift through the tattered remains splattered everywhere. Some faces are too brutally smashed to be recognized, and for that, they rely on Elder Julius and the Praetorians who've interacted with Michael in the past and are familiar with the stench of his blood. We don't find Michael, and Elder Julius begins to grow restless until we do find something tucked away in a damp and dark corner of the warehouse behind a sandbag wall beneath about a dozen bloody and broken limbs. There's a trap door here. We rush towards the voice, wading through the bloody muck on the floor and find two soldiers hunched over the dusty, grimy trap door. It's large, about the length of a man. I didn't know this place even had a basement, I say. Yeah, maybe this is why old Michael chose this place, Elder Julius says. 
Open it. There's a shrieking groan as the two Praetorians force the hatch open, revealing a steep flight of stone stairs that leads into the darkness below. Elder Julius bends over, squints, and then frowns. Give me a flashlight, he says, and for a moment, there's a pause. All of us around him are taken aback, for there is no reason a creature as old as him would need a light to see in the dark, a natural darkness, that is. He grabs a flashlight from one of the soldiers and begins descending down the stairs. I follow, and so do two of the Praetorians. The steps are too small, and I'm afraid of tripping and crashing into the elder, sending us both hurtling downstairs. What would he do if that happened, I wonder? Cut my head off midair, simply for my stupidity? It's damp down here, smells of wet clothes forgotten in dark, unheated rooms, or water leaking from cracked pipes and rotting in the walls. And there's another scent, somewhat masked by the former, yet not quite blending in. It reeks like moist ashes of a dead fire. I crinkle my nose and keep moving downwards. The stairs drops us off at a small landing, hemmed in by the walls. A sleek wooden door is set into the wall directly in front of us. Faint yellow light seeps out from the gap beneath the door, suggesting that the room beyond might be illuminated. Elder Julius steps forward, places his hand on the gilded doorknob, turns it, and pushes the door open. My mouth drops at the sight beyond the door. The room is cramped, with a mud roof that hangs so low I have to bend my neck just to stand here. Dozens of shadows dance across the room as candles, at various stages of their life burn from their perches on earthen flooring, on shelves carved into the mud walls, and most importantly, on the altar placed next to the far wall, bathing the tiny space in a dull, shimmering yellow glow. And slumped against the small table that serves as the altar, rests the corpse of our quarry, Michael. His jaw has been ripped clean off, his tongue hangs limply on his neck, even his eyes have been gouged out. Blood from his wounds has drenched his white dress shirt, turning it dark red. I have never seen such terrifying violence. Who would inflict such hatred on someone else and be powerful enough to inflict it on a vampire like Michael? Oh, Michael, Elder Julius whispers. You reckless fool. What the f have you done? I sense pure, unadulterated terror in the Elder's voice, and that terror gets magnified in my heart. My eyes get drawn once again to the altar. In the middle of it sits an eight-pointed star made of some strange black metal that I don't recognize. It is ringed by half a dozen tiny, underdeveloped skulls like those of aborted fetuses. Their white bones have been splashed with blood, human blood. He opened a door that should not have been opened. My heart skips a beat as the strange feminine whisper drifts through the stale, smoky air in the room, reverberates through the walls, it echoes in my bones, makes me feel violated, like a wet tongue forcibly thrust down my ear. Those of us in the room whirl around frantically, weapons waving in the air, trying to locate the source of that voice. It sounded like it had been spoken by someone standing with us, but of course that voice was totally alien. My sanity begins to fray. The voice once again fills the air, but this time it's even lower and completely incomprehensible. But I can feel the power in it, makes my bones rattle, shakes the blood in my insides. And then another sound joins in, squeaks. At first, it's barely audible, like a fly buzzing in my ear, but it continues to get louder and louder till it becomes deafening, starts to scrape at my very eardrums. What the f is that? One of the Praetorians shouts. Stand back to back! Elder Julius screams. No one listens. For the next second, something digs through the ground beneath us. The dirt in the center of the room is pushed aside. A small hole is opened up and a mass of brown fur pours out of it. Rats, hundreds of them start to swarm us, all squeaky with glowing red eyes and serrated smiles. The flood of moving fur and flesh crashes into us, biting, gnawing, picking the flesh from our bones. We try to fight back, but it's useless. I get two shots off before the pain from the bites makes me drop the gun and I stumble backwards. Little rat paws scratching my flesh. They crawl up inside of my thighs and all I can do is scream. The Praetorians don't fare any better. Even Elder Julius, old and powerful as he is, meets an inglorious end at the hands and claws and teeth of the rats. He waves his knife around, slicing dozens of them into pieces with each swing, smashes apart hundreds of them with his telekinetic powers. But thousands instantly replace them, tumbling and trampling over another. They wriggle out of holes in dark, unseen corners and blanket the room, a moving carpet of brown fur that snuffs out all traces of light. It isn't long before the pain numbs my mind, knocks me unconscious. Pain, 
It's the last thing I felt before fading away. It is the first thing that greets me when I wake up. It feels like my entire body is on fire. Every muscle, however many the rats left behind, throbs and aches. I would scream if I had any strength left to do so. I'm lying face down on the ground. Where? I can't tell. It hurts too much to move my head, but my cheek feels wet. Blood, slowly and very carefully, I sniff it. It's not my own, not even human. It's clotted and has a vile, corrupt stench to it, but it's blood nonetheless. My tongue darts out of my mouth, takes a quick lick. It's utterly disgusting, yet in my weakened state, feels heavenly. I move my head, bite my cheek to fight through the pain that explodes in my skull, and begin lapping at the pool of clotted blood on the dusty ground beneath my head. Strength begins to seep into my body once again. Oh, looks like you're finally awake. My body trembles in surprise. It's that voice again, the one that unleashed the nightmare on us. I crane my neck and look up and see a naked woman staring down at me. She's holding a rat in her hand, a long and sharp fingernail digging into its throat. Need more? She asks, amused, and slices the rat's neck open before I can answer. I hungrily drink the blood that streams down on my face, grateful for the sustenance. I can feel some of my wounds stitching themselves back up. The woman reaches down towards me, lifts me up by the arm, and helps me sit up against something cool and smooth. I cough <coughs> and notice it's the door of a car. My car. How are you feeling, child? I look up again and notice the blazing scenery behind her. It's the warehouse. It's on fire. Dazzling orange flames burst out of the windows, crackling and licking the air. What? I croak. What happened? To your friends? She asks. I killed them all, just like the ones who summoned me. I stare at her. She has no presence, unlike Elder Julius who would make your heart tremble by just standing next to you. This woman feels like nothing, like a dark, empty void. It makes my soul shiver. What? What are you? I ask, terrified. A friend, if you would let me be one, she answers, smiling. It doesn't reach her eyes. Oh God, those eyes. Large yellow irises and narrow black slits for pupils, like a cat. You can call me Inanna. Please, I beg. For what? My life, I think. Let me go. I'm afraid I can't quite do that. My heart sinks. Why? What do you want from me? She caresses my cheek with her hand, looks at me with pity. I'm going to make this world burn, child. And you're going to help me, are you not? My mouth begins to move on its own. Yes, mistress. Of course I am. These personal entries recorded by Anonymous are intended for research purposes only. Entries unrelated to the event have been removed. All materials found here are the sole property of Eventide Petroleum and are not authorized for reproduction. If any unauthorized person or persons find themselves in possession of these documents, please contact the corporate office for a financial reward. August 10th, 2021. The jumpers always looked so happy as they marched to their death. You could see their faces clearly from the dozens of security cameras on the deck. Satisfied smiles covered their faces as they bounded carelessly toward the edge of the platform. We've installed a higher railing system around the edges, but it only made them work harder to get over the top. Before they jump, their arms extend out as though they expect something to come from the sky and scoop them up like a mother would pick up a small child. After one or two minutes of holding their crucifixion-like pose, they fall forward and sail through the air until they make an impact with the churning water below. Suicides on oil rigs aren't common, but they aren't unheard of either. The rate for oil extraction workers is near twice the percentage of males in the general population. At least, that's what I read when I started researching this job. From what I've seen, it is drastically higher here. During my first month on the rig, I watched two men plummet to their death from the control room. Braxton and Garvin were their names. Happy guys as far as I could tell. Wife, kids, and nice houses to get back to after their rotations. Best job in the world, Braxton had told me the day we met. 
He pointed a finger out toward the endless blue waves that spread as far as we could see. No better view for that matter. It's almost like the ocean sings to you every night, like it never wants you to leave. He never did leave. Twenty days after we met, Earl Braxton and Jimmy Gavin leapt over the side of the rig during the night shift. Their bodies were never recovered. August 28th, 2021. We've lost three more men since I last had a chance to write. Derek Overton had only been on the rig for six days. Young guy, couldn't have been more than 22. It was his first offshore job and he had seemed so excited. He was a hard worker too. You ever hear anything weird when you're working out on the platform? He asked me one day. Sounds like there's someone out in a boat singing. No, I replied. I work down in control and keep an eye on the vital systems. Don't get outside as much as I should. I'm probably just hearing things. Tried to ask a few of the other workers up top, but I guess they're too busy to talk. A few of them told me I should wear earplugs, but I don't know. The sound of the waves is soothing. The singing noise too. I kind of enjoy it. That was two days before he jumped. Our night shift crew wasn't fast enough to stop him. They never are. Doyle Hargrove was an old timer. He worked on even tied rigs for over 30 years. According to the duty roster, he was due to rotate home next week. His psychological evaluation was top notch. No history of mental illness. All of his crew said nothing seemed out of place. If anything, he seemed happier than he had in months. Just the same, Doyle threw himself over the side of the rig during the night shift. The third death wasn't a jumper. One of the motor hands, Alvy Spencer, was found standing near the edge of the platform, arms outstretched, looking toward the sky. Two roughnecks on the night shift saw him and managed to drag him back from the edge before he scaled the railing to fall into the drink. Alvy fought them tooth and nail as they pulled him toward the barracks. A few other men heard the commotion and came running to aid in the rescue. The motor hand punched and kicked everyone around him and scrambled to find a grip on the rig floor as they pulled him toward the bulkhead. The whole time he was just screaming the same thing over and over. Let me go, it's so beautiful, just let me go. Unsure of what to do, the rig manager had them secure Alvy in an empty storage room while he radioed the mainland crew. They informed us they would send a helicopter to retrieve Alvy and take him in for a mental health evaluation. We were all relieved to have finally saved one, but the celebration came too early. When we opened the storage room, Alvy Spencer swung from his belt, secured to a pipe. Poor bastard, thought we'd managed to save one. September 20th, 2021. Shit just keeps getting more and more strange around here. There have been no more jumpers, which is great, but corporate has made some odd changes. Our old rig manager was replaced with some suit from corporate. He doesn't seem to have much experience in the field. Has a strange way about him. Made a lot of changes too. Everyone who works outdoors on the rig has to wear earplugs during their entire shift. No exceptions. It wouldn't be that big of a deal, but it's difficult to call someone over the loudspeakers with a wad of foam in their ears. Men have to work in two-man teams now, regardless of their position. If one goes to the bathroom, the other goes with them. They eat together, shower together. The only time you are away from them is when you go to bed. You even have to fill out a daily observation report about your partner. The questions are weird. You figure it would be a productivity thing, but it isn't like that at all. Has your partner exhibited any odd behavior? Does your partner stare off into the distance frequently? Does your partner seem to hum or sing as they work? Have you noticed your partner spending too much time near the edge of the platform? There are also tons of signs posted everywhere on the rig saying we should report any strange thoughts or compulsions to our supervisor. No telling what kind of weird stuff those poor bastards are hearing from the crew. It's almost an open invitation for bad jokes. I'm not sure what the hell is going on out here, but it may be time for a job change. My rotation is up on November 1st. It can't get here soon enough. October 17th, 2021. Working up on the deck has been a nice change of pace. We've been short on roughnecks lately. 
and I accepted a pay bump to help out with grunt work. Steve, my partner, doesn't follow me around too much, which has been nice. We're both old timers, so it wasn't too hard to work out an agreement to skirt a few of the new corporate rules. Those damn earplugs annoyed me too much, so mostly I just leave them out. None of the young bucks on the crew say anything about it. Most of them have started keeping theirs out too. Not hard to manage. The suits from corporate stay inside in the air conditioning. Gives us a free run of the place. I'm more relaxed than I've been in months. Braxton was right. The ocean does sing to you. Sometimes I close my eyes and it almost sounds like a woman. I can almost see her down below the rig, floating between the white caps. She's beautiful. It's like she's singing just for me. October 21st, 2021. Steve jumped from the platform yesterday. We were doing a security check on the railing system around the edge of the platform. They had been hastily installed as the incidents increased and the material wasn't holding up well against the salty sea spray. Bad news for the maintenance crew. Hey, Steve said to me as I was examining the bolts fastening the railing to the deck. I looked toward him and saw him pointing into the ocean. Look out there. Looks like a damn lady swimming in the water. It's 15 miles to shore and there isn't a boat in sight, Steve. Your eyes are playing tricks on you. No, he stated. Take a look for yourself. She's waving at us. I think I can hear her singing. I stood up and looked in the direction he pointed. At first, I couldn't see anything. Just the rolling blue waves. Then I saw her. Pale skin, dark hair, slender frame. She was bobbing up and down in the water. A long, thin arm waved above her head. She was too far away to make out any details of her face, but I couldn't help but think she would be the most beautiful woman I'd seen if I were a bit closer. A strange thought to have when you see a woman floating miles from the shore, but it haunted my mind. We've got to get someone out there to help, Steve said. Run up to the office and tell the rig manager we need to get out there to her. I ran as quickly as I could to the office and threw the door open like a bull in a china shop. It startled the men inside. Gasping for air, I told them there was a woman in the water and told them to follow me. We charged out of the office in the direction of Steve. By the time we returned, Steve was standing on top of the railing, arms outstretched. We shouted his name and ran toward him but he never turned his head or acknowledged us. Just as we reached the bottom of the railing and began to climb up to retrieve him, he tilted over the edge and began to sail down. As Steve passed in front of my face, I caught a glimpse of his serene smile. October 30th, 2021. The rescue crew never found Steve or the woman we saw in the water. I feel like I'm going mad. The music still fills my ears as I sit here on my bunk. Layers of steel walls and bulkheads can't drown it out. It's maddening, but oddly beautiful. I want it to stop, but I also don't. It would probably sound so much better if I could get a bit closer to it. I wonder if the woman Steve and I saw is the one singing. I wonder if she is as beautiful as I think she is. Maybe she's still down there. She just needs help. I should help her. I'm going to see if I can spot her. I'll just stand by the rail for a little while, just for a minute. Working for a residential property management firm is about as glamorous as it sounds. It's a decent living, but most of the tenants can drive you batshit crazy, especially at Martin Place. About half pay their rent late if they pay it at all. Eviction court takes up most of my time. Whenever I'm not booting out a squatter, I'm doing small repairs in the apartments. No one else in the office would take the place, so I got stuck with it. I can honestly say I never had a tenant I liked there, except for Doug Albertson. He was decent, in the beginning anyway. In the end, He was the most abominable person I'd ever met. Doug moved into apartment six, normal seeming fella, mid forties, no kids, work from home job. 
behavior modification, he said. I meet with people over video chat to help them break their bad habits. Smoking, cursing, nail biting, you name it, and I can put a stop to it. He had his groceries delivered and took only his trash out at night. Nice, but reclusive. The guy never called for any kind of maintenance. The most communication I had with him was the day I showed him the place. You'd see him now and again in the hall, but that was it. The rest of the building was chaos. Non-stop parties, drunks stumbling down the hallway, and druggies passed out on the stairs. Most of these miscreants were guests of Toby Hansen in apartment seven. He raised hell all day. I was walking down the stairs on a cold afternoon when I had one of my rare Doug sightings. He was walking up the steps with his mail. We waved to each other and mumbled hellos as we passed by. Excuse me, Doug called out from the top of the stairs. May I speak with you for a moment? Sure, I replied. What you need, Doug? He smiled uncomfortably and kicked his toe on the ground. You could tell he was uncomfortable. I looked at my watch to give him the silent hurry the hell up signal so we'd move things along. The gentleman in apartment seven keeps late hours, he said very politely. Very noisy. Do you think you could talk to him for me? Sorry, Doug, I responded. I've talked to Toby Hansen about a dozen times, telling him to keep that racket down. Son of a bitch ignores me. Can't evict him for being a turd. Kid pays his rent. Your best bet is to call the cops with a noise complaint. If the boy gets enough fines, maybe he'll shut up. I would rather avoid involving the police, he said dryly. Perhaps I can help him modify his behavior. Thank you for your help. We said goodbye and went about our business. That was the last complaint I ever received about Toby Hansen. Suddenly, he became a model tenant. His rent was always in the Dropbox on time. I figured he must have gotten a job because he was never home when I was in the building. All of his no good friends vanished. The parties came to an end. It didn't fix the other 10 piss poor tenants, but it went a long way toward quieting the place down. Over the next few months, oddly enough, the apartment building started quieting down a great deal. The couple in apartment three stopped their round the clock bickering and yelling sessions. For as long as I could remember, you'd always hear them shouting at each other anytime you were in the building, shattering plates, clothes being thrown out the window, arguments in the hallway. One day, they were just quiet. I'd get a maintenance request every other month or so from them, which I'd take care of while they were at work. Otherwise, not a peep. I popped by the building on the second of the month to check the rent box and was surprised to see Doug again. He lived on the second floor, but I could swear he was coming out of apartment five, Joe Kimbler's place. He was a violent alcoholic with an impressive rap sheet. Didn't seem like Doug's kind of company, but who's to judge? Morning, Doug, I shouted and tossed my hand in the air in his direction. The building was as quiet as a tomb, a welcome, if not unusual change. This may be the most peaceful I've ever heard this place. Doug smiled and waved in return. It's all about behavior modification, sir, he replied as he started up the steps. Your suggestion worked. I spoke with Mr. Hansen as well as the other residents. It seems my skills were able to help them work through some of their issues. Have a good day. You too, Doug. I shouted back to him. He vanished into his apartment. My job had become manageable, enjoyable even. That was until August of this year when half of the rent checks from the building bounced. I called the tenants multiple times, but not a single one of them answered. Probably left three dozen voicemails. Hell, a hundred text messages, emails. Not that anyone checks the damn things anymore. No answer. I was shocked to see Doug's name on the list of bounced checks. After a few days and no returned calls, I headed over to the building and started knocking on doors. No one on the first floor answered. They weren't a likely bunch to maintain regular employment, so I figured a few of them were dodging me. I headed up the stairs and knocked on Doug's door. No answer. I hammered harder calling his name, but still no response. 
Just as I was turning to walk down the stairs into the car, I heard a muffled noise inside. I called his name a few times, but no answer. Just those muffled cries. Reaching into my pocket, I pulled out my key ring and slid the master key into the lock. As I pushed the door inward, an overwhelming smell washed over me. Ammonia and rotting food, maybe. Smelled like a damn kennel. Doug? I shouted. You here? You okay? No answer other than a muffled voice coming from his bedroom. Concerned he may be hurt, I headed for the door and opened it. The stench intensified so badly that my eyes began to water. Suddenly the room was filled with a chorus of muffled moans and sobs. Along the walls of the bedroom were dog cages. Inside each one was one of the building tenants. Their ankles and wrists were tethered together, dirty rags in their mouths, and shock collars around their necks. On a table in the center of the room sat a single sheet of paper. I picked it up and read the brief script. I apologize for the bad check, sir. Some things cannot be avoided. I won't be returning. But as a thank you for the wonderful accommodations, I have completed my behavior modification sessions with your tenants. They shall trouble you no longer. Yours respectfully, Doug Albertson. I arrive in New York City on a bus. Walking through the Port Authority bus terminal, I glance around at the surroundings, walking to find an exit. The terminal is a large sprawl, a mixture of sleek modern architecture and utilitarian design. People rush all around me, surrounded by the muted colors of the terminal, living lives that, from the outside, seem better than mine in every way possible. I only carry one bag, but the most important possession on my person is a small 22 Ruger pistol that I stole from my father's closet. I keep the pistol in the right pocket of my large olive green military jacket. At 18 years old, I know the few people that glance at me see only another young person, a tourist, maybe, or a bum. Back in Iowa, I'd watched movies set in New York City. I'd read articles, watched interviews, and stayed apprised of news reports from the bustling metropolis. When I finally made the decision to come here, spending almost every penny I'd saved on the bus ticket, my only hope was that I could get lost in the streets. I wanted to become just another face in a crowd until I got to my final destination. Now, as I step outside of the terminal and onto 42nd Street, I'm not disappointed. The impersonal nature of this city is unmistakable, and the people walking past me only see an object to dodge so they can be on their way, unimpeded by such an inconvenience as another person in their path. I pull up a map on my phone and orient myself. I see that Central Park is about 17 blocks away, so I start walking. I take a left on 8th Avenue and let my feet carry me, my backpack secured on my shoulders and the gun in my pocket bouncing gently off my hip with every step. As I walk, I think about putting the Ruger's barrel in my mouth, or maybe I'll just put it in my temple. I've heard that it's possible to survive when shooting yourself through the mouth, but the temple is pretty much a sure thing. And with a 22, the bullet should bounce around inside my skull, destroying my brain. I smile at the thought, but it's a forced smile. Deep down I know that, and I realize that I'm grimacing, so I let my face go slack. After a while, I look up from the sidewalk and see trees beyond a roundabout ahead. It must be the park. I make it across 59th Street and find a path into the park. There are plenty of people out on this early spring day. I see a little boy and a little girl playing, chasing each other on the grass and screaming delightedly. Two adults sit on a bench nearby, chatting. They glance up at the kids occasionally. What if a little kid finds my body, I think? It would traumatize them for life. This thought terrifies me, and I stop walking. People weave around me. The image of that little girl stumbling across my dead body fills me with dread. So that's why we're going to the cave. A silky, snake-like version of my inner voice says, that was always the plan. It still is the plan. Go to the ramble, 
find the sealed off cave and put a bullet in my head. I force myself to walk again, trying to ignore the happy screams of the children. I look at the map on my phone, zooming in on Central Park. The ramble isn't too far ahead, so I keep going. I know that the cave I'm looking for was sealed off in the early 20th century, after a few people committed suicide there. Some even call it the Suicide Cave. It was also a place where robberies and sexual harassment were common, but I don't think of those things. I'm here. I made it to New York City and to Central Park. Now I'm going to do what I came here to do. My legs are getting tired as I make it to the Bow Bridge, passing a young couple kissing as I cross it. I put my head down, grumbling at the public display of affection. More walking brings me near the suicide cave, and it takes some wandering around to find the semi-hidden path down. I have to climb over a railing near a boulder and push through some tree branches to uncover the old stone steps. Going down the steps, I see the old brick wall where the cave entrance used to be. The realization that I'm really here brings with it a little ball of excitement. Or is it dread? I duck around a rock overhang and see a little shoreline sandwiched between two big boulders where boats used to be able to park so people could explore the little cave. Hearing a giggle, <laughs> I turn my head to the left, seeing a couple about my age sitting on a little blanket. I've clearly interrupted their private time. I realize I'll have to wait for them to leave before I kill myself. This thought brings both relief and trepidation. I move out of their line of sight, throwing my backpack down against the bricked up cave entrance. I lie down and put my head on my pack to wait for these people to leave. It doesn't take long for my eyelids to grow heavy. What little sleep I managed to get on the bus out here wasn't quality sleep by any means. I don't resist the urge to sleep, instead letting the anxiety of my pending death melt away, at least for a few minutes. Little bugs are falling on my face, squirming around on my cheeks and trying to get under my closed eyelids. I jolt up, rubbing at my face with both hands, feeling little bug bodies fall away. More of them fall into my head and I brush them out of my short hair realizing that they're not bugs at all. It's dirt or grit that's falling on me. I look around, finding that I'm still next to the old bricked up cave in Central Park. It's dark out now, and there doesn't seem to be anyone around. More dirt falls on my head, and I look up to see where it's coming from. It's hard to tell in the dark, but it looks like there's a ragged hole in the brick wall, as if someone has been removing bricks. Suddenly, Darkness pours out of the hole, and it takes me a moment to realize that the darkness is really cockroaches, hundreds of them. I scramble up to my feet, backing away as the cockroaches disperse into the night. Looking harder at the brick wall, I see that there is a hole there. It's at about head height and big enough for a person to fit through easily. I step closer, wondering whether I should pull out my phone and use the flashlight feature. A ghostly white hand emerges from the darkness of the hole, grabbing one of the bricks and pulling it into the hole. What the fuck? I whisper, stepping back. No way this is real. I pull my phone out, holding it at my side, not yet shaking it to make the light turn on. Hello? I say, who's in there? There's no answer. All is silent. The hand doesn't appear again. I step up to the hole, shaking the phone to turn on the light. I shine the light inside the cave. The eyes of a dozen or more people reflect the light of the flashlight. I can tell they're all dead by the pallor of their skin. Most of them are men, but there are a few women there too. Their fatal injuries still shine with moisture, reflecting the light off of tiny irises. I jump back, hitting my head on the rock outcropping behind me and dropping my phone. The light shines straight up, illuminating the hole in the brick wall. I back away, rubbing my head absently as my mind tries to process what I've just seen. Maybe I'm still asleep, still dreaming, but the pain in my head feels so real. A man's head emerges from the hole upside down. I realize as the rest of him moves through the hole, crawling like a spider, that his head is only attached to his body by a thin strip of flesh near his severed spine. 
He stops his spider-like crawling as he reaches the ground, standing up to his full height, his eyes never leaving me. His head seems to shift on its own, keeping his gaze fixed on my face. I notice his old clothes, a dusty brown suit that would have been in style a century ago. I back up toward the lake, my whole body shaking with fright. The back of my foot runs into something that shouldn't be there. I can tell by the feel. It's not a rock, not a branch, but it is organic. I risk a glance behind me and let out a long gasp that turns into a low, desperate scream at the end. There are bodies floating on the lake as far as I can see. The moon shines down on them, allowing me to see them packed together on the surface of the water. Some wear clothes and others are naked. Some look like they belong in this century, while others are clearly from the distant past. But they all have one thing in common. Their eyes are open, heads are turned, and they're all looking at me. The one I hit with my foot, just where the shore meets the water, reaches up and tries to grab me. I back up, immediately feeling impossibly strong hands grip me. I catch a glimpse of my assailant, seeing his nearly severed head staring at me with furious determination. Then he's lifting me off the ground, my struggles doing nothing to hinder him. He brings me back to the hole in the brick wall and shoves me through. Hands reach out as I'm pushed inside, grabbing me and pulling me down. I'm on my back in the cave, surrounded by the dead. They all look down at me, their eyes wide, and I can tell they want something. I just don't know what it is. Their mouths all open at the same time, and a black liquid sludge pours out, coating me. It's freezing cold, immediately soaking through my clothes as I struggle and scream. Their wide eyes all turn black at once and then liquefy as more of the black sludge pours out of their eye sockets. I'm immersed in the liquid now, and I can feel it paralyzing me, squeezing the life from me, stealing my breath. Suddenly, I remember my father's gun in my jacket pocket. I reach through the thickening black sludge with a numb right hand. My fingers feel like sticks, the joints nearly impossible to move as I manage to shove the hand in my jacket pocket. I feel the gun there and manage to get my fingers around it as the sludge reaches my chin. I try to hold my head higher, straining my neck upward, but the dead try to push me back down. Pulling the gun out of my pocket requires all the strength I have left. The sludge reaches my mouth. The taste of it is somehow everything foul I've ever smelled or tasted, and the absence of taste all at once. It forces its way into my mouth, and I can feel it sliding down my throat and into my lungs, erasing everything I am and replacing it with endless pain and darkness. Choking, I pull the gun up out of the tar-like substance, forcing my numb index finger into the trigger guard. The sludge reaches my eyes, and I have to shut them or lose them forever. I pull the trigger, but nothing happens. The safety is still engaged. I feel for the safety catch with my thumb as the liquid comes up to my forehead. I can no longer breathe, and the need for air is nearly all I can think about. I feel the click as the catch moves, and I pull the trigger again. The gun fires, and I feel hands release me. I shift the gun and fire again. More hands release me. I fire again and again and again, emptying the clip within only a few seconds. The hands are no longer holding me down, and I manage to get my heavy legs under me. Emerging from the sludge, I take a deep breath before scrambling through the hole in the brick wall and falling out onto the hard ground outside. I snap my head around, expecting more corpses to attack, but I'm alone. I look down at my body, which is slowly regaining feeling. The sludge moves off of me, slithering back through the hole in the brick wall, leaving me dry but shivering. I grab my phone and my backpack and run back up the stone steps, jumping over the railing at the top. I realize I still have the gun in my hand, so I put it back in my pocket while I run. I find a lighted part of Central Park and sneak into some nearby bushes, suddenly exhausted. I don't know what time it is, but I can still hear the occasional runner or cyclist pass by on the path as I fall asleep. It's light outside when I wake up, Morning joggers and walkers are in the park. A woman looks at me strangely as I stumble out of the bushes, reliving last night's events in my mind. Was it just a nightmare? The product of an overactive imagination belonging to a depressed young man? 
I find my way back to the cave, the morning sunlight giving me the strength to investigate. The hole is no longer there in the brick wall. There are no bodies floating in the lake. Everything looks as it did when I first came down yesterday, minus the young couple. It was just a nightmare, I say, then turn to leave. But I see something strange on the brick wall, where the hole had been. It looks as if the bricks are loose, as though someone broke all the bricks out, but then put them back up without mortar. I push on the bricks with a hand, and they tumble inside the cave. My heart speeds up, but I force myself to look through the hole in the wall. There's nothing in the cave but the fallen bricks and something else, something shiny. I pull my phone out, shining the flashlight into the dark cave. There are shell casings on the floor of the cave, shell casings from a 22 pistol. I pull the gun out of my pocket and eject the clip. It's empty. For the first time in a long time, my smile is genuine. I head back up the stone steps and away from the cave. On my way out of the park, I toss the pistol in a trash bin. You picked the wrong bank, I said to the man pointing a snub-nosed revolver in my face. Shut up! You think I won't blast you? I'll f***ing blast you, buddy, he said. Now get out from that fancy office of yours and come sit with the others. I stood up from my desk, hands up, and looked hard at the man. I could tell, even through the ridiculous pair of pantyhose he had on his head, that his nose was running. A wet spot glistened on the mesh women's wear just under his squashed down nose. The man didn't seem to notice because he never sniffed. He just let it run. There were two other robbers, each with a different handgun. One of the weapons looked like it had last been fired during World War II. All three men wore tattered and stained clothing. Their leader, the guy ushering me out of my office and getting me to sit in front of the teller booths with the other employees, had a bright red flannel shirt on, very subtle. If these men had been professionals, I would have thought that the ratty clothes and even the heavy smell of body odor emanating from them were parts of their disguises. But the fact that they were robbing this bank told me that they weren't pros. Pros would know to stay away from this bank. No, these men were desperate addicts. They were about to get a very rude awakening. Who's the manager? The leader said. I raised my hand. Get up, he said, even though he just made me sit down. I got up. Is there anyone else here? He asked. That depends. You mean employees? I asked. Don't f***ing get smart with me, Mr. Manager. Employees, customers, your f***ing whore of a daughter. Is there anyone else here? I don't have a daughter. The man's eyes shifted behind the pantyhose. His two buddies were fidgeting behind him, knowing that this was getting out of control. I didn't want to push them too far, not yet. I looked around at everyone. No, I don't believe there's anyone else here, unless a customer ran in the back when you fellas came in. Nobody ran in the back, the leader said. Now, take me to the vault. I nodded and turned, walking back behind the teller booths and through a code locked door. The leader followed, gun held just behind my head. When we were alone in front of the vault, I turned around. You can leave now and you won't be hurt. I won't even call the police. But the moment you take the money from the vault, I can no longer guarantee your safety. The f you gonna do, Grandpa? He said, although there was no venom in his voice. Maybe he'd felt the change in the air. I certainly had. This is the ATC Savings and Loan, I said. Do you know what the ATC stands for? Does it matter? The only thing I care about is the cash in the vault. Do you have cash in the vault? Yes, of course, I said. Good, open it, or I'll have one of my friends out there shoot one of the pretty teller ladies. If you think I'm joking, just try me. One more time, try me. Okay, I said, turning back to the vault door. Don't say I didn't warn you. I opened the door and allowed the man in. Then I stood there as he filled a black trash bag with as much cash as would fit without tearing the bag. When he was done, 
He urged me back out the code locked door. Yo, Sammy! He called over the teller booths. Come back and fill your bag. One of the other robbers, this one dressed in a stained gray sweatshirt and torn jeans, hurried back to us. The leader went to take his place on the lobby floor. As they passed, I heard Sammy whisper, Why'd you use my name, man? We talked about this. Just go fill your bag, the leader said. Suddenly, the lights flickered in the bank, creating a strobe-like effect. It was irregular, causing certain corners of the large room to go dark, while others brightened. What the hell is this? The leader yelled, turning back to me, shoving his revolver in my face again. What did you do? Nothing. I did nothing. You're the one that took money out of the vault. I tried to warn you. What is this? A silent alarm or something? Some kind of security system? Sammy asked. You could say it's a security system of sorts, I said. Sammy, stop talking to this guy and go fill your bag, the leader said. Mr. Manager, punch the code in. I shrugged and punched the code in, letting Sammy into the vault room. Apparently, the leader didn't trust me because he put his bag of cash on the floor and stood there next to me, pointing his gun at me from his hip. From where we stood, we could see the third robber out beyond the booths, pacing back and forth on the marble floor, keeping an eye on the other bank employees. The flickering continued, and it was clearly unnerving that third man. Get away from me! The third robber called out suddenly. What is it? The leader asked, stepping away from me. What are they doing? The third robber didn't answer. He just stood there in the middle of the floor, mumbling to himself, looking at nothing. Talk to me, Jason, the leader said. Hearing his name seemed to snap the man out of it. He turned toward the leader and said, He won't leave me alone. What won't leave you alone? He asked. What the hell are you talking about? There's nothing there. Jason spasmed and then went stiff, arms at his side and standing on his tiptoes. What are you doing? Jason's head shook impossibly fast the movement turning his skull into a tan blur, the limp pantyhose legs whipping back and forth over his head. This went on for about three seconds before he stopped suddenly. Jason, the leader asked, fear in his voice. What's wrong with you? Jason didn't answer, not with words, but it became clear soon enough that there was something really wrong with him. His face seemed to stretch out in the middle, his nose and brow and mouth pushing outward at a sharp point. The pantyhose stretched with it until the middle of Jason's face split open, the force of it ripping the pantyhose. The two halves of his face separated like butterfly wings. Blood spewed out as his facial structure ripped apart, revealing another face underneath. This underneath face was not even close to human. Two blood-coated eyes bulged out, their red irises glowing like car cigarette lighters. Instead of a nose, there were two wide slits situated above a mouth crowded with needle-like teeth. It was a scrunched up face, but it seemed to expand as it moved out of Jason's skull, protruding forward, staring at the leader. The leader screamed and raised his gun, firing at the demonic figure three times. None of the shots even came close. Black tentacles shot out of Jason's hands and feet, causing him to drop the gun he'd held in one hand. He launched into the air and stuck to the high ceiling with the slimy black tentacles, those terrible eyes never leaving the leader's face. He scurried along the ceiling toward us, and the leader fired three more times, emptying his gun. Sammy rushed out of the door to the vault room with a half-full bag of cash. Before he could get a word out, he spotted the thing on the ceiling and screamed. He dropped his bag of cash and vaulted over one of the teller booths. He stumbled on the other side but kept his balance as he ran for the doors. He pushed and pulled on each of the four front doors, glancing over his shoulder at each one. Meanwhile, the leader took off, leaving his own bag of cash behind. He joined his friend at the doors, but none of them would open. When they realized that there was no way out, at least not there, they turned around. What had once been Jason scurried along the ceiling toward the two men, who stared up at him in shock. The demon dropped down and onto Sammy, clamping onto the man's face with those needle-like teeth, wrapping his limbs with those black tentacles. The leader backed away slowly, as if afraid a quick movement would bring the demon's attention to him. Sammy screamed as much as he could before the creature ripped off his face with its mouth. 
It then pulled all of Sammy's limbs off at once with its powerful tentacles. The leader ran back into the middle of the lobby, scooping up the gun Jason had dropped during his transformation. He then ran up to the tellers, who had been sitting where they'd been told, watching the terrifying scene play out. He yanked a pretty girl named Selena up from the floor, putting the barrel of Jason's old Ruger pistol to her head. Let me out of here, man, he said to me. Keep that thing away from me. Still standing behind the teller booths, I looked beyond him to see the demon tearing Sammy apart, bit by bit. I don't think you need to worry about that one for a little while, I said, coming around from behind the booths, a small smile on my face. Just let me out, man. I'm not taking any of your money. It's all in those bags back there. It's too late, I said. I gave you ample opportunity to leave, but you didn't. You did this to yourself. Just let me go or I'll kill her, he said. If he had noticed Selena's utter calmness and the blank expression on her face, he didn't show it. I smiled wider. Have you figured out what ATC stands for? Or what makes this bank different from other ones? Just cut this shit, man, he said. I'll kill her. I swear to God I will. That made me smile even wider. Swearing to God will do you no good here, not in this place. This is the Antichrist savings and loan. Not only do we serve a unique clientele, but as you've seen, we have a unique security system. I paused, turning my smile to Selena. And we have very unique employees. The leader's face fell under the ridiculous pantyhose mask and his gaze went from me to Selena. The pretty young woman's head twisted impossibly around to look at the leader, giving him her best welcome to ATC savings and loan smile. But her smile didn't stop. It kept going, stretching up past her temples while leader stood there in horror. His left hand still on her shoulder, right hand still holding the seemingly forgotten gun. Selena's face hinged open where the gruesome smile stopped at her forehead. Her human face flipped up, revealing a spiral of undulating teeth behind it. Since her body was still facing the other way, her arms shot backward, <laughs> grabbing the leader and pulling him into an embrace against her back. He screamed and struggled as that gaping maw of moving teeth settled on his face like a buzzsaw. When she was done with him, she let his headless body fall to the floor, then untwisted her head and popped her arms back into their normal sockets. Great job, everyone, I said. Lots of excitement for one day, but we still have a bank to run. Let's get this cleaned up. The employees got to work cleaning up the messes. I watched with the pride of a man who knows how to run a well-oiled team. Oh, and before I forget, I said, the Dark Lord has graced us with another excellent addition to our team. Let's welcome him with warm wishes of more carnage to come. Everyone paused what they were doing to welcome the demon who had inhabited Jason's body. The demon stopped gorging itself on Sammy's left leg to wave a tentacle in thanks. When we'd first moved in, I wasn't sure what to make of the lights. I thought at first they were passing cars or people parking on the shoulder of a nearby road. Perhaps they were teenagers looking for a place to get high or make out, or worse, hunters trespassing on our land. I even walked out to confront them one night, thinking they had no right to be harassing us like they were. That night when I saw the lights, I started marching out there purposefully, despite the late hour. There were no crickets chirping and nothing was making a sound. Everything was dead quiet as I got closer to that glowing round light at the edge of the property. Then I blinked and it was just gone thinking still that it was just teenagers or drunks who had seen me and turned their lights off. I kept walking out further, the eerie quiet and the moonless night making me uneasy as I approached the tree line. There was no way a car could have disappeared so quickly. And yet when I got to the road, there was nobody there. It was as if the source of the strange light had just disappeared, vanished into thin air. And worse than that, I felt eyes on the back of my neck as I stood out there in the darkness, blind and weaponless, having brought nothing to defend myself. A nearby twig broke underfoot, and I spun around to see the dark shape of something hiding behind a tree, just a few yards away. 
It was shadowy and humanoid, ducking out of sight when I looked. The feeling of dread I was experiencing intensified a thousandfold as soon as I caught sight of it. Something you should know about me is that I love to read old folklore and mythology. Well, immediately this thing I saw reminded me of a description I had read of a mythological creature, a terrifying one. It reminded me of folklore tales I had heard of a creature called the Hide Behind, a being which stalks people in the woods when they're alone and vulnerable. As the name suggests, they hide behind trees and are difficult to spot, no matter which angle you look from. They stalk their prey with practiced efficiency, and most people die without seeing them coming. I tried to shake away that memory, but could not. As I stared at the thing behind the tree, I felt an inhuman entity was looking back at me. I stepped to the side to try and get a better look at it, but the angle I saw of the creature stayed the same. It remained stubbornly hidden behind the tree. Have you ever felt a presence that you recognized immediately was not of our world? Well, silly as that might sound to some people, that's what I felt. Looking at that dark shape hiding behind the tree as it stared back at me, I felt like my heart was going to stop in my chest. My gut was full of concrete as I turned on my heel and ran from it, whatever it was. I was so scared I tripped over my own feet, falling hard to the ground and eating dirt on the shoulder of the road. The thing seemed to sense my weakness and it moved out from its hiding place. It didn't step out. It seemed to glide sideways as if it was floating. It regarded me for an instant longer then started to close in, its features growing only slightly more discernible as it drew closer. I stumbled to my feet. After taking a few precarious steps and nearly tumbling down into the ditch, I managed to sprint across the field and away from the thing. For a while, I was too afraid to glance over my shoulder, worried that if I did, it would be my death. When I finally did look back, I saw it watching me from the tree line its form was blurred and dark, like a picture out of focus. Somehow, I found myself unable to tell my wife about what had happened, or anyone for that matter. It felt as if I couldn't, as if to do so would make the whole thing real. If I didn't mention it to anyone, it seemed like I could pretend it didn't happen, like it was just a dream. A week later, it was another quiet night and my wife and I were sitting out on the front porch, slapping mosquitoes and drinking lemonade. She pointed up towards the stars, and I followed her finger to see a small bluish white orb move across the night sky. I thought it was a plane or a satellite, so far up in the sky that it seemed insignificant, but then it turned and began heading straight towards us. Its trajectory and its growing light caused us both to scream with fear. <laughs> It crashed down toward us like a meteor about to impact the ranch, its size swelling and its light growing more and more powerful. But then, just as it looked as if it was about to slam into us with the force of a small sun, it slowed and seemed to inspect us, hovering just a few yards from us. As the glowing bluish white orb regarded us, I felt as if I was dying inside. My bones ached and pain blossomed in my chest and in my throat. My heart hammered too fast inside my chest. I tried to take a breath, but found myself unable as it drew closer and closer to us, its power impossible to ignore. Hovering in front of us, it stayed where it was for several long moments. The power in the house went out suddenly and it was eerily quiet and dark, except for the light from the orb and its reverberating hum. All I wanted was for it to go away. The feeling of it was so upsetting and so unpleasant, it made me feel queasy and sick and even worse than that in a way I can't describe. It was like a sense of foreboding doom was hanging over me, as if an anvil suspended by an old fraying rope were dangling over me. I blinked my eyes and when I opened them, the orb was lazily floating away from us, going back up into the sky. Then it vanished in a horizontal line which indicated sudden rapid movement. The white line across the black night sky disappeared a moment later, and I finally felt as if I could breathe again. <gasps> what the hell was that thing? My wife had asked, 
sounding just as terrified as I felt. But I had no response. I couldn't bring myself to share about the experience I'd had. If I did, I was worried the creature would come back, as if the mere mention of it would summon it into our midst. When we went back inside the house, all of the phones, laptops, gaming systems, appliances, and anything else electronic in the house was completely inoperable. In an instant, they were transformed into giant, useless paperweights. As the weeks went by, the glowing orbs became a more and more persistent problem. They also began affecting our livelihood. Eventually, I started to realize that this place was cursed. One morning in particular comes to mind, the morning when everything changed and I realized I could no longer stay at Skinwalker Ranch. I stood out in the field in the early morning sun, looking at the dead cow, flies buzzing around its head. A strange hole was sliced through its neck, the edges clean like they had been cut with a scalpel. The missing portion of its jugular had caused it to bleed out and the evidence of that was coagulated all around my feet in a sticky puddle. My wife had named this one avocado. I could tell it was avocado just by looking at it. An egg-shaped black mark on its side with a white circle at the center distinguished it from the others. The yearling would have gone off for slaughter in a month. Its untimely death would put us in the red even worse than we already were, especially since another three deaths had occurred in recent weeks, each time the same unexplainable injuries. The property had been nothing but trouble since we moved in. Nothing had gone right. I looked around the property, trying to see if I could spot one of the orbs. The skies were clear and blue, completely cloudless. No glowing orbs. Not today, at least. Why would anyone want to do this to an innocent animal? I thought, staring at the blank expression on the cow's face. My eye caught movement in the sky to the north and I looked to see something whizzing past like a bullet. It was a round ball of bluish white light, tracing a path across the field, heading for a patch of grass behind some nearby trees. It disappeared a moment later. That was when I realized the cattle were over in that field grazing. The orb was headed straight for them. No longer thinking rationally, only worried about our livelihood being wiped out, I raced across the sun-yellowed grass towards the clearing. Anxious moos could be heard through the trees. As fast as I could run, I felt so slow compared to those things which were terrorizing us. The evil orbs which came from the sky to torment us. The cows were all racing towards me, terrified of the blue orb. One of them crashed into me, knocking me to the ground, and I felt a hoof land just beside my head, which surely would have killed me if it had been a few inches to the side. I stood to see the glowing orb's attention turn to me, Without any distinguishing features, it should have been impossible to tell when the wisp of light was turning, but somehow I could sense that it was looking right at me. And then, an instant later, it was over top of me, inches away. It droned and undulated in the most unpleasant way, like too much bass in the backseat of a car where you have no control over the stereo. Like a drill at the dentist burrowing into a back tooth when you realize there's not enough Novocaine in the world to quench the pain of what you're about to experience. Like the roar of an airplane engine from an inch away, or a case of tonight is bad enough to make you go insane. And yet I couldn't move. I could only lay there, feeling as if my skull were being torn apart by opposite forces too strong to resist. Was this what happened when people spontaneously combusted? Was this alien going to make me explode like an egg in the microwave? Suddenly I heard my wife screaming something behind me. The shotgun blast was deafening, but had no effect on the glowing orb. My wife reloaded and pumped the barrel once more. Then I heard another shot go off. Again, it seemed to do nothing. That was when the orb moved over me, traveling towards my wife instead. It settled its presence around her and I screamed at her to run. She didn't look as if she was able to hear me anymore though. The shotgun dropped from her hand and I watched her eyeballs rolled up, revealing the whites of her eyes and nothing else. She appeared possessed as the blue glow enveloped her and her skin started to cook like meat over the barbecue. No! I screamed, scrambling to my feet and running over toward her. By the time I arrived though, she was nothing but a pile of black ash and cinders in the perfect shape of her form. As I dove into her, trying to rescue her from the light. 
The orb receded back into the sky. As I collided with a column of embers that had been my wife an instant earlier, it exploded into a black-gray cloud of dust, obliterating any evidence of what had just happened and leaving only a scattered pile of ashes. I was left coughing and choking on her remains, covered in black soot. Part of me couldn't believe what had just happened really happened. But when I looked at the ground beside me, I saw the shotgun she had been carrying with her. She had tried to save me, I thought to myself. She'd tried to save me, and it had gotten her killed. After weeping for a while, unable to move or do anything, eventually I stood up, and the ashes poured off of me and continued to cloud the air around me as I walked slowly back towards the farmhouse with my head hanging down. What was I going to do now? My wife was my whole life. Without her, the world seemed empty and hopeless. There was no point to anything anymore. I stumbled past the cows and they watched me with sad eyes. Climbing the porch steps, I opened the front door and stepped inside the house. The smell of delicious food being cooked on the stove greeted me immediately. Onions and garlic, and the sounds of a knife chopping something on the cutting board. I ran into the kitchen, unable to believe my senses. And there she was, my wife, Christine, standing in the kitchen, chopping a bloody red piece of meat. She turned around with the large chef's knife in hand, smiling at me as I came in. Her eyes were the only thing about her that didn't look the same. Otherwise, she was a perfect match for the love of my life. The woman I had just seen turned to ash outside. Her eyes had no color, no irises. They were only pupils and they were all black. Hi, honey, she said, still holding the knife. I'm making your favorite for dinner tonight, beef stew. Gotta use up avocado before she goes bad. She turned around and went back to the large slice of meat on the counter. It looked just like the piece that had gone missing from avocado. How did you know the cow was dead? I didn't tell you yet. You didn't have to tell me, sweetie. We're married. I know everything you know. I know all your deepest, darkest secrets. And pretty soon, you won't have to remember a thing. What does that mean, Christine? I asked, backing away out of the kitchen. But something stopped me. I bumped into the form of someone blocking my path. Spinning around, I saw a grinning, exact replica of me, only with eyes as black as coal and a sharp-toothed smile with canines much longer than mine had ever been. Its teeth were white as if they had never been used. The knife went into my back with little pain at first. I didn't even realize it had happened until I fell down and saw all the blood. The two of them stood over me, watching as I slowly lost consciousness. What's for dinner, sweetie? Numi asked, his voice sounding far off and quiet. Oh, you're gonna love it, honey. It's his favorite, beef stew. Sounds delicious. I boarded the bus in Watertown, New York. It's a little country town that is just a short drive from the Canadian border. I don't know where I am now, but I feel I've been on the Greyhound bus forever. I knew the trip would be a long one, almost four days, including the hours waiting at transfer stations. But I'm getting the feeling that we should have been to the next city by now. I'm heading to Phoenix, where my brother lives, to start over again. I'd been living in Watertown with my girlfriend, but we'd recently broken up. And since I don't have a career yet, I'm only 22. There was nothing keeping me in upstate New York. I can't see anything out the windows of the bus because it's dark outside. And, apparently, it's a new moon. But I haven't even seen any passing cars lately. Granted, I keep falling asleep. So maybe it's the early hours of the morning and we're in between major population centers. My phone has no service. I asked the lady sitting next to me, but her phone doesn't have service either. She looks about as haggard and tired as I feel. When was the last time we stopped? I ask her even though she's clearly trying to sleep. She opens her eyes and looks at me, not hiding her irritation. I don't know, she says. A while ago. She closes her eyes again. I remember the first day and a half of travel, as it was all on the East Coast. 
I had to stay awake because there were so many transfers and I didn't want to sleep through my stop. So by the time I got on a bus that I wouldn't have to get off for a while, I was completely exhausted. This was in Atlanta and I wouldn't have to change buses until Dallas. Finally, I could sleep uninterrupted. But I'm a tall guy, six foot three. So sleeping on a bus is fairly difficult. My knees press against the seat in front of me when I try to stretch out, and my long arms dangle over the armrests, often getting bumped by whoever is next to me. Needless to say, the sleep I got wasn't exactly restful. It was afternoon when I boarded the bus in Atlanta, and I managed to get some sleep shortly after that. I woke up a couple of times, maybe two or three. It's all so hazy now, but it was dark every time I woke up, and it's dark now, really dark. I further anger the woman next to me by trying to climb over her to go to the bathroom. The bus hits a pothole, causing me to fall into her. She glares up at me. Sorry, I say, untangling myself from her and standing up in the aisle. Several sets of sleepy eyes look up at me as I pass. I pick a man that looks friendly enough, stopping next to him. Sir, does your phone have service? He shakes his head without taking out his phone to check. I notice the watch on his wrist and gesture to it. Is that the right time? I ask. Can't be, he says. It says it's 7.03, but that ain't right. It'd be light out. Damn thing must have broken. I nod and thank him for the info before heading back to use the bathroom. When I'm done, I head back to my seat, but stop as I see the driver glancing up at me in the mirror above the windshield. Something in his eyes causes my throat to thicken. I move up to him and lean down. Excuse me, sir, I say, but I'm wondering if you know how long it'll be until Dallas. He lifts his left wrist, looking at his own watch. I glance at the time, 7.08. My brow furrows. How could two different watches malfunction to show the same time? The driver shakes his head slightly before answering. Pretty soon here, he says, sounding unsure. Do you know where we are? I ask. Of course I know where we are, he snaps. What kind of question is that? Get back to your seat now, sir. He doesn't know. He has no idea. I can hear it in his voice. I stand up to leave, my thoughts all jumbling together. I glance out the windshield before I turn around. The bus's headlights illuminate the pavement of a two-lane road and the double yellow stripes down the middle. But the edges of the road are dark. I can see no gravel beyond the asphalt, no grass, trees, or bushes, no guardrail or mile markers. The light from the headlights just kind of stops at the edges of the road. I swallow hard and turn around to head back to my seat, unsure what else I can do. A man in his mid-thirties reaches out from his aisle seat and grabs my arm. What did the driver say? Does he know how long until Dallas? Pretty soon is all he said. He didn't sound sure. I tell the man who lets go of my arm. You asked him if he knows where we are, right? That's why he yelled at you? Yeah, I say. Kind of makes me think he doesn't know where we are, the man says. I nod. He doesn't know where we are a middle-aged woman across the aisle says, having overheard our conversation. She sounds ready to panic, her voice loud even over the engine and air conditioner noise. What the hell are you telling them, kid? The driver calls back. I know where we are. Don't listen to that kid. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Then where are we? The man who grabbed my arm says. We're getting close to Dallas, the driver says. How close? About an hour, no more than an hour. Then why is it still dark outside? The man says. We're supposed to get into Dallas at 11 in the morning, but it's still pitch black outside. I, I, I don't know. The driver says, stuttering, losing his bluster. I haven't seen a single car in over two hours. The middle-aged woman says, almost screaming. Where are all the cars? Nearly the entire bus is awake now. There are more than a dozen conversations going on all of them about our predicament. Some people are scared, while others just shrug it off, thinking that the driver has simply lost track of time. Stop the bus, 
the mid-30s man says, moving me aside as he gets out of his seat. Stop the bus now, driver. I'm not stopping this bus, the driver says. We need to keep going. What if I want to get off, the man says. I want to get off here. Fine, the driver says, slamming on the brakes, nearly sending me to the aisle floor. The man standing in the aisle ahead of me is ready for it, and he braces himself with one hand on his seat, grabbing me to keep me from falling with the other. The bus comes to a stop, and the driver opens the door. He turns to the man. Go ahead, get off. The man steps up to the front of the bus. I follow closely. He gets down to the bottom step, looking out into the perfect darkness. It's unnatural. There's nothing, no light whatsoever. I look down and see the white line that denotes the edge of the road. Beyond that, there's only darkness. The man reaches out of the bus with one hand. I watch as his fingertips disappear, as if into a pool of black paint. A half second after his fingertips touch the darkness, he's yanked from the bus without a sound, gone into all that black. I step back, eyes and mouth wide. Holy God! The bus driver says, shutting the door. Holy God almighty! What the hell was that? A man in a nearby seat says. Where'd he go? Panic seems to pass from one passenger to the next, rippling down the entire bus as it lurches, the driver putting it in gear and hitting the gas. We've got to keep going, I hear him say. I look out the window, thinking for a moment we're not moving at all. There's no frame of reference to tell us we're going anywhere, not out the side windows. I turn back to the front of the bus, taking small comfort in the double yellow lines visible in the middle of the road and the white lines bordering it. My mind tries to shut down, unable to comprehend what's happening to us. I focus on the yellow lines, watching them unspool in the bus's headlights. Maybe they go on forever, I think. Something appears in the road at the edge of the headlight beams in our lane. I barely have time to notice that it's the man, the same man that was pulled out into the darkness not minutes earlier, before the bus smashes into him, shooting blood splatter up onto the windshield. No, 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 no. The bus driver mutters even as the rear wheels bump over the man's body. The image of him standing there in the road, hands out, eyes wide, screaming something, sticks in my mind. Chaos erupts around me. The other passengers screaming and praying and negotiating with their gods. A man shoves past me and lunges at the bus driver, yanking the wheel to the right in some insane attempt to change something, anything. The driver fights with him, but it's too late. The front of the bus veers right. The headlight beam swallowed up by the blackness bordering the road. The front right corner plows into that black wall that isn't a wall. The darkness rushing through the bus to meet us all, enveloping us. I look around at the now silent passengers. Curious eyes look back at me. We're back on the road somehow. For a moment, everything was black, but now we're back on the road. The driver and the crazed man are no longer fighting. They're looking around like the rest of us, wondering what the hell just happened. Headlights appear on the road ahead of us seemingly out of nowhere. Look out! Someone screams. The driver slams on the brakes just before we collide with the oncoming bus. In the moment before the two buses smash into each other, I glance at the people on the opposite bus. I see me standing there near the front of the other bus, almost like I'm looking in a mirror. Our eyes meet across the closing distance, but there's nothing either of us can do. The two identical buses collide. I'm launched through the air, meeting the other me amid the shattering glass of the two windshields, our bones breaking against each other as we're smashed together like two children's toys. Then blackness overtakes me. The house has been there for as long as I can remember, standing tall against the test of time. Sure, it looked beaten up, ancient even, so much so that my friends and I have been fascinated by it. We even spent entire days hanging around inside smoking or drinking beer. The paint had been peeling off at an accelerated pace in the last few years. And when it all came down, I noticed there were scratch marks all over the interior walls. There were also faces scratched on those walls. Some were happy, some were sad, 
Some were angry, and some were evil. Their wretched eyes staring deep into mine made me shiver with unease. The faces were chaotically contorted with either disgust, fear, or anguish that spread throughout the room, filling it with dread. It was a feeling of not belonging, of something out of this world, a plague that came here to haunt the living and twist their minds into dark despair. I stood still, in silence, the first time I saw them just watching and observing. All kinds of scenarios went through my head. Why were they there? Who painted them? And for what reason? Was it all just a joke, meant to play with the minds of those who laid eyes upon this grotesque imagery of hellish creatures? This house always had a bad reputation. The townsfolk warned the kids in town to stay away from it during the night because weird things happened there. But, of course, I had my reservations about that. Most of the time, it's just make-believe with these types of scary stories. The adults like to play games and blow things out of proportion to conceive a silly story. One of these stories is about the name of the house, or rather the name of the street it's located on, Candy Cane Road. The houses in that neighborhood are all new and inhabited by people with good reputations, respected, and well-known in our town. The old townsfolk say that a very long time ago, a few kids in town went trick-or-treating on a Halloween night. Of course, everyone told them not to go to that house after dark. Yet, they did go. They disobeyed what their parents told them. No one ever found the kids. The only thing the search and rescue parties found was a candy cane smashed all over the street and lots of blood that adorned the candy. They looked at the house that stood like a menace in the dark, just watching them, observing them, and studying their every move. The wind shrieked in the hollow darkness, and some people said they could hear the children's cries tearing through the fabric of the night. The candy cane has always been associated with Christmas time, and so many people never understood why this particular type of candy had been found on a Halloween night. I can't imagine what it must have been for their parents, heartbroken, not knowing what happened to their children and how they died that way, empty and alone and without being able to say goodbye. They only buried cold and empty coffins. Maybe those drawings were made by the children before they vanished, or perhaps they were made by whatever or whoever killed them. Maybe it was a ritual murder a sacrifice to old, demented, ravenous gods. I jumped when I felt a hand squeezing my shoulder. Whoa, whoa, easy there, buddy. What's gotten into you? Tommy asked. He has been my best friend since we were little kids. He was the brother that I never had. Nothing, man. Sorry. It's just these drawings. They are hypnotic. Scary little monster faces. Repulsive, don't you think? I asked him beads of sweat coming down my temples. What? What are you talking about? The drawings on the wall, I said, turning to face the now blank wall. They were here just a second ago. The scratches and the monsters, Tommy. Dude, get off your trip. Did you smoke something before we got here? He said, inhaling air and coughing <laughs> after. No, man, I said. My fingers began shaking and my knuckles hurt. It was as if small vices were placed on each knuckle and an invisible force squeezed tighter. I wondered if they would explode and imagined blood and bone jumping all over my face and on the walls. John, snap out of it. Let's drink a beer. Ah, sh I forgot my cigarettes at home. Can you spare one, please? Tommy asked, wiping saliva from the right corner of his mouth. Stop lying, Tom. You rarely have cigarettes. You always ask either me, Kevin, or Joey over there, but they're too ashamed to say anything. So I think it's time to start buying your own, dude. Here, this is the last one, I said, reaching in my jacket side pocket for the pack. I pulled two out, one for him and one for me. He placed it in his mouth. Well, if you're giving me to eat, at least give me a guy 
spoon to eat it with, he said, raising his hands in the air. I let out a sigh and lit a cig. F you, Tommy. We both laughed it off and went to Kevin and Joey. They were already smoking, laughing, and belching from the cheap beer they had already downed. Guys, our boy Johnny over here said he saw monsters on the walls, my best friend said. He burst out in laughter. Joey laughed too. Kevin didn't. Well, I saw them too, Kev said, flicking his cigarette. What's there to laugh about? I didn't, said Joey, letting out the loudest burp I had ever heard. It was demonic. Well, the wall's empty. No paint, no drawings, nothing, Tommy said, puffing his freshly lit cigarette. And scratch marks too, I said, still thinking about the monstrous, contorted, and twisted devilish faces. The sunset was near, a fiery orange hue with a dash of bright pink and wavy yellow light colored the sky above. They intertwined, delivering an otherworldly spectacle. It was such a formidable sight. Top that with the light summer breeze and the rustling of leaves. And there it was, a perfect picture painted by Mother Nature herself. That was on the outside, lively and beautiful, a view that made up for a thousand words. Yet, inside the house, the silence was all too pressing. It was morbid even, and it felt like we were on the precipice of seeing things we were not supposed to see. It felt like being in a tomb. All right, let's head out. It's going to be night soon. We are not supposed to stay here after nightfall, said Kevin. We were heading out to the main entrance when it started happening. The scratches and the faces appeared again. It looked like spirits were just drawing them. Holy f***ing sh Joey said, frozen in place like a statue. What the f***? The drawing got faster and louder. The scratching noises were unbearable, and we all covered our ears. What the hell is going on? I screamed, and before we all knew it, it got dark outside. Pitch black, a blanket of darkness sprinkled with tiny, shiny white dots. Hey, 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 hey. A choir of otherworldly voices called for us. We all turned and saw four children, just about our age, three boys and one girl. Their clothes were tattered and torn, and they looked to be in the worst shape of their lives. Each of them was standing in front of each of us. Then they all placed one finger against their lips, as if instructing us to stay silent. Don't move, don't speak. Try to breathe as little as possible. He can't see you, he can only hear you. It won't be long now, one of them said. His neck was swollen and bruised. Another boy had his neck cut open from side to side, yet he was still alive. The girl was white as a sheet, and her eyes were gray and sad. When she spoke, I could hear her choking faintly, like she had water in her throat. The last boy had blood coming out from his temple, and it became thick as it stopped running. Then I remembered what the townsfolk said. I remembered why it was called Candy Cane Road. I remembered everything. The story, the missing children. It was true after all. Everything was true. I was all choking up, trying so hard not to shed tears. The kids came even closer to us. Here, this will hide you from him, the girl said. Then she gently touched the bleeding temple of the other boy. She rubbed the blood against each of our foreheads, and I felt the heavy liquid sticking to the center. I looked at her, and she saw me. It's okay, don't cry, it's okay. He can't even smell you if you wear this. He doesn't like dead flesh and blood. He likes it young and fresh, that evil bastard. I was too terrified to talk. I tried, I really did, but I was choking up so bad before I could even say a single the boy with the slit throat came forward. Please, I'm begging you, do not look at him. Just close your eyes when you hear the scream, okay? He said, whispering as if he had no vocal cords left. There is something that we need to ask you if you can help us. We need to rest. We've been here for so long and we need to go home. He pointed up to the sky. You need to get someone to burn the house down. 
A priest or someone holy. He needs to soak it in gasoline and strike the match. <coughs> Burn it to the ground, said the boy with the bruised neck, coughing heavily at the end. The boy with the bloody temple patted him on the back. It's okay, it's okay. Then he turned back to us. The owner of the house is the one who's coming here right now. He sensed something was moving inside, and he's coming back in a few moments. He was so evil in his lifetime, and continued to be the same even in death. You'll be okay, I promise, but you need to help us, please. We need to be buried so we can rest. I'm at the bottom of the lake behind the woods, <laughs> the girl with gray eyes said as she coughed up mud. I'm under the big oak tree in the woods. The boy with the swollen, bruised neck said faintly. The rope is there too. I'm under the big concrete block east of the house. He made me hold the knife after I died. The boy with the slit throat said, covering the wound. And I'm under the house. Please get me out, please. He put the knife in my pocket, he said, touching his temple. It's cold and lonely there. The wave of revelations hit me so hard and I didn't know what having a heart attack felt like, but I thought I was about to have one. Then a ruthless scream filled the night. It was haunting, devilish, and evil. Steps came towards us from the woods frantically. No matter what you hear, do not open your eyes and do not move, they all said together. We closed our eyes and waited. The steps became louder and the man got closer. I heard him bursting in through the back door, and he just <laughs> laughed. There you are! He screamed like a madman. My heart stopped. I thought this was the end. If he had seen us, then it was too late to run. Then I heard the sound of someone or something cutting flesh. Then the sound of someone choking. The girl screamed, then a big splash followed. Then I heard screams again as she came back to the surface. Then her screams were underwater then silence. Then I heard a whoosh through the air and the violent sound of metal against bone. The bone cracked and I could feel bile rising in the back of my throat. In the end, another choking sound. The cries for help and pleadings for the man to stop were in vain. And then a popping sound like a can had been opened. Got you, you bastards! The man shouted. Then silence again. We stood there a few more minutes. Then opened our eyes. Nothing. It was like nothing had happened. Then we turned around. The scratching and monster faces on the walls had vanished too. I think the monsters represented the way they had seen the man. I was glad that we didn't get to see him. But those sounds will forever be tattooed in the back of my mind. I still wake up screaming in the middle of the night. I think the children chose to sacrifice themselves again and again whenever someone was in the house at night. It was the greatest act of bravery I had ever witnessed in my life. The following day, the search parties found their remains and the kids got a proper burial. They had found them all and they were all exactly as they said they would be. After the funeral finished, Father Barnes went to the house and soaked it in gasoline. Then he started praying for a few minutes. Finally, he set it ablaze. The fire was howling as if someone's dirty and rotten soul was burning, and its last embers were carried away by the wind. Now, there was nothing but a pile of ash left. The last house on Candy Cane Road was gone. The jack-o'-lantern hits the parked car with a loud thud. I wince looking up at the dark house, sure that lights will come on any second. Johnny, who everyone calls Jolly, laughs cruelly at the mess he's made. The hit dented the car door. Come on, Jolly, I whisper. Let's just go home. Jolly ignores me. He's not really Jolly, not in the truest sense of the word. He's only happy when he's causing pain or discomfort to others. I know this better than anyone. For reasons I'll never understand, my mom fell in love with his dad. Now we're stepbrothers. Hooray. I walk away from the house. There's a path of destroyed pumpkins behind us, along with smashed eggs on front doors, toilet paper snagged in trees, 
and vandalized Halloween decorations. Where are you going, dipshit? Jolly calls out, running to catch up with me. Home, I say. I don't care if I get in trouble for leaving your side. I'll just tell them what you've been out here doing this whole time. Jolly grabs me by the cape and yanks me back. I'm wearing a Thor costume. I should have known better than to wear a costume with a cape. It just makes things easier for Jolly. You tell anyone anything? I'll curb stomp you, you little sh**. His breath smells of half-digested candy and chewing tobacco. I don't know what a curb stomp is, but it doesn't sound good. At 16, Jolly is four years older than me and a lot bigger. He's wearing black clothes and carrying a black backpack. Fine, I say, yanking my cape away from him. I won't tell. Let's just go home. Not yet, he says. I want to hit the Delgado house first. Teach those fucking assholes a lesson. And you're my alibi. You know what that means? It means you're going to lie and say I was with you at the movies all night. Halloween double feature. At least we're getting close to home. The Delgados live just one block over. Jolly has been feuding with their two sons for as long as I can remember. They're nice kids. At least, they've always been nice to me. It's probably why Jolly hates them. He likes to smash out any kindness. I guess he wants everyone to be as miserable as he is. He's now out of toilet paper and eggs, so we don't make many stops on the way. Although he does smash nearly every pumpkin he sees, I'd like to smash him one of these days. We walk up to the Delgado house, which is a nice two-story white house with dark blue trim. It has a big oak tree in the front yard. Halloween decorations hang from the massive branches. There are two lines of jack-o'-lanterns along the walkway leading up to the house. Surprisingly, Jolly ignores these. Well, what do we have here? He says, walking up to the porch and snagging a huge pumpkin. It's no jack-o'-lantern. It hasn't been carved, but it has something painted on the front in red letters. Do not smash. Jolly laughs his cruel laugh again as he chucks the pumpkin against the concrete walkway. It cracks, but doesn't break apart. But Jolly hasn't noticed. He's been picking up the glowing jack-o'-lanterns and smashing them. I stand back, watching for cars on the road or for lights coming on in any of the houses. When I turn my head back towards Jolly's frenzy, I see the cracked pumpkin move. At first, I think he must have bumped into it but he's nowhere near it. Besides, it's still moving. The dark crack widens and the pumpkin breaks apart, revealing a mess of pumpkin guts. But the guts are moving now too. A small, bumpy orange arm with black claws on the four stubby fingers emerges from the mess, followed by another arm. Then a head comes out, shaking like a dog trying to get dry, throwing off slimy pumpkin guts. The head looks like a small pumpkin, but it has eyes and a mouth that glow with poison green light. The rest of its body emerges as the creature crawls free of the wreckage. It moves on all fours, its legs shorter than its arms, but thicker. The whole thing looks like it could be made out of pumpkin parts, but it moves with the fluidity of a cat. Its glowing eyes sweep over me, its jack-o'-lantern mouth stuck in an evil grin. j jolly I stutter. He pays no mind. The creature looks over at him. He's just finishing with the jack-o'-lanterns, turning his attention toward the decorations hanging from the oak tree. Jolly! I shout. What the hell is it? There's someone coming. Look! I say, pointing toward the creature, which is stalking slowly toward him. Jolly sees it and laughs. (laughs) What the hell is this? A cat dressed up for Halloween? He takes two steps toward it and tries to kick the creature but he grabs onto his leg. Jolly screams. What the f***? He says, jumping around and kicking his foot. The creature's claws must be sinking into his flesh through his black pants. The thing scrambles up his leg and moves up under his sweatshirt, all while Jolly beats at it and screams. I don't see what the thing does, but I can guess as blood spews out from under the hem of his sweatshirt. Suddenly, the bulge in his sweatshirt goes flat. The energy has gone out of Jolly. He coughs up blood and clutches his stomach area. His eyes are dull with immense pain. 
He stumbles around while I watch, speechless. Then he slumps against the oak tree's trunk and stops moving. I knew one day Jolly would go too far. I knew he would come across someone who wouldn't take his crap lying down. But I could have never imagined this. Movement from the Delgado house catches my eye. I look up to one of the second floor windows to see the two teenage brothers looking out. They both wave at me. I wave back. Then I turn and head for home, thinking about that creature, curled up and sleeping in Jolly's chest cavity. I doubt it will be there in the morning. It's just one of those things, the magic of Halloween. I know just what I'll tell my mom and my stepdad when I get home. I'll tell them that Jolly ditched me, so I went to the movies, a Halloween double feature. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and smash that like button to get notified every time I upload a new video. You can also check out some more of my animated horror stories right here.